Section 25 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 2. Discovery. On the 9th of March, 1500, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, a Portuguese nobleman of illustrious birth, but not yet distinguished by any notable feats in war or seamanship, sailed from Lisbon for the East Indies. This expedition was sent out to continue the work begun by Vasco da Gama in the first all-sea voyage to India. It was an advance guard for the larger armament that two years later founded the Portuguese empire on the coasts of India. Vasco da Gama himself wrote Cabral's sailing orders. The latter was instructed, after passing the Cape Verde Islands in 14 degrees south, to sail directly south, as long as the wind was favorable. If forced to change his course, he was ordered to keep on the starboard tack, even though it led him southwest. When he reached the latitude of the Cape of Good Hope, 34 degrees south, he was to bear away to the east. These sailing instructions have been the subject of much discussion. Many believe that their sole purpose was to enable Cabral to avoid the Guinea calms, so annoying to sailing ships near the African coasts. Others contend that da Gama had seen signs of land to the west on his own voyage, and that its discovery was a real, though secondary, object of the expedition. In any event, the Brazilian coast is too near the natural route around Africa to have escaped encounter, and would infallibly have shortly been seen by someone else. Forty-two days after leaving Lisbon, Cabral's fleet saw unmistakable signs of land, being then in latitude 17 degrees south and longitude 36 degrees west. From Cape Verde Islands, just off the western points of Africa, he had made 2,300 miles and had come 500 miles to the west. The next day a mountain was sighted, which he called Pascoal, because it was Easter week. This mountain is in the southern part of the state of Bahia, about 400 miles northeast of Rio, and on a coast that to this day is sparsely inhabited and rarely visited. The following day the whole fleet came to an anchor a mile and a half from the shore, and just north of the dangerous Abroyos reefs. This was the 23rd of April, old style, which corresponds with the 3rd of May in the Gregorian calendar. The date is a national holiday in Brazil, and the anniversary for the annual convening of Congress. Because no quadrupeds or large rivers were seen, Cabral thought he had discovered an island, and named it the Island of the True Cross. The name has not survived except in poetry. He stopped ten days on the coast, took formal possession, and sent expeditions on shore which entered into communication with the Indians, who were seen in considerable numbers it is characteristic that the first question asked of the indians was if they knew what gold and silver were they were peaceable and friendly and the old chronicle describes them as of dark reddish complexion with good features and muscular well-shaped bodies they wore no clothes their lower lips and cheeks were perforated to carry great ornaments of white bone and their hair was elaborately dressed and adorned with feathers these were fair specimens of the tupi guaranis the largest of the four great families into which the brazilian aborigines have been classified the others are the caribs the arawaks and the botacudos there are also traces of tribes which inhabited the country remote centuries ago in caves in minas Gerais, skeletons have been found remarkably like those of the earliest europeans the theory is that those indians came from europe by land in that remote geological epoch when scandinavia was joined to greenland later came mongoloids probably by way of the bering strait who appear largely to have exterminated their european predecessors and to have been the ancestors of the modern indians when america was discovered the four great families were spread in scattering and widely differing tribes over the whole of brazil and the adjacent countries their state of culture varied from that of the most squalid tribes of botacudos who had not even reached the stone age lived in brush shelters slept in the ashes of their fires practised promiscuous marriage and had no idea of religion except a fear of malignant spirits up to arawaks who were cleanly had a well-defined tribal organization and built marvellous canoes 
or Tupis, who cultivated the soil, built fair houses, used rude machinery for making mandioc flour, spun cotton, wove cloth, and were good potters. But the civilization of the best of them was stationary. No Brazilian tribe ever got beyond the condition where the struggle to obtain food was its sole preoccupation. No civilization like that of Mexico, Peru, or Yucatan ever existed. Disaggregation, failure, and obliteration were the rule. Organically unfitted to cope with their surroundings, they never devised a method of getting a good and permanent food supply. Defective nutrition sapped their powers to resist strains. Their muscular appearance was not accompanied by corresponding endurance. Their European taskmasters could never understand why they died from the effects of exertion to which a white man would easily have been equal. The vast majority had no regular agriculture and lived on the spontaneous products of the forests and the streams. Land game is not abundant in the tropics, and they had developed only few good food plants. What they did procure was spoiled by bad preparation. Such a people had no chance of successfully resisting the Portuguese invaders, and their only hope of survival was in contact and admixture with the more vigorous white and black races. The Tupi Guaranis occupied one fourth of Brazil, all of Paraguay and Uruguay, and much of Bolivia and the Argentine, and it is probable that the original seeds of this family were in the central tablelands or in Paraguay. All Tupi Indians spoke dialects of one language, which the Jesuit missionaries soon reduced to grammatical and literary form, and which became a lingua franca that was understood from the plate to the Amazon. Back of the coast, Tupis were the Botacudos, the most degraded and intractable of Brazilian savages, remnants of whom still survive in their original seats in Espiritu Santo, Minas, and São Paulo. The Caribs, with whom students of the history of the Caribbean Sea are familiar, originated in the plains of the Goyas and Mato Grosso, and emigrated as far north as the Antilles. The Arawaks were most numerous in Guyana and on the lower Amazon, but were also spread over central Brazil. The Brazilian Indians did not survive the white man's coming to as large an extent as in Spanish America. The pure Indian is found in Brazil only in regions where the white man has not thought it worth while to take possession, and the proportion of Indian blood is much smaller than in surrounding countries. In many localities, evidences of Indian descent are so rare as to be remarkable. Cabral's voyage was the real discovery of Brazil, if we consider historical and political consequences. It was the first reported to Europe and the Portuguese crown immediately made formal claim to the territory. But, as a matter of fact, land which today is part of Brazil territory had been seen by Europeans before Cabral landed. In January 1500, Vincente Yanez Pinzon, who had commanded the Niña on the first voyage of Columbus, saw land in the neighborhood of Cape Sao Roque. Bound westward, he bore away to the west and north, following the prevailing winds and currents as far as the Orange Cape, the present extreme northern limits of Brazil. He was therefore the discoverer of the great estuary which forms the mouth of the Amazon. He named it the Freshwater Sea, because the great river freshens the open ocean far out of sight of land, but he did not ascend nor even see the river proper. It is also claimed, on good evidence, that six months before Pinzon, Another Spanish navigator, Alonso de Ojeda, accompanied by Amerigo Vespucci, had made the South American coast not far from Cape San Roque, and that a month later still another, Diego de Lepe, did the same. None of these Spanish voyages produced any results. They were not reported until after the news of Cabral's discovery had been solemnly promulgated to the courts of Europe, and were soon forgotten. The honor of making Brazil known to Europe belongs to Cabral just as certainly as that of discovering America does to Columbus. The Spanish voyages are interesting to antiquarians, but neither they nor the Norwegian voyages of the 11th century were followed up or produced any permanent results. The news reached Portugal in the fall of 1500, and no time was lost in sending out a small fleet to ascertain definitely the extent, value, and resources of the region. 
the Portuguese hoped to find a wealthy and civilized population like that of India, rich and unwarlike nations, such as the Spaniards, did encounter a few years later in Peru and Mexico. The exploring expedition was under the command of Amerigo Vespucci, the greatest technical navigator of the age. He shaped his course so as to keep to the windward and south of the redoubtable promontory of San Roque, which the clumsy ships of that day could not weather in the teeth of the trade winds and the equatorial current, and, turning to the south, made a systematic examination of the coast nearly as far as the river plate, employing five months in the task. In naming the rivers, capes, and harbors, he saved his inventive faculty and gratified the popular religious sentiment by calling each one by the name of the saint on whose anniversary it was reached. Most of these names have survived. For example, the San Francisco, the largest river between the Amazon and the Plate, is so called because Vespucci reached it on October the 1st, 1501, which date is sacred to St. Francis in the Roman calendar. Rio de Janeiro is so named because he saw the great bay, whose entrance is narrower than many rivers, on the New Year's Day, 1501. He coasted along for 2,000 miles, looking eagerly for gold, silver, spices, and civilized inhabitants. He was disappointed. The only thing found which seemed to have an immediate market value was Brazil wood, a dye wood that had been used in Europe for centuries and was in great demand. Its color was a bright red, hence its name, which means wood the color of fire. It was found in such abundance that the world's supply has since been drawn from this coast, and among sailors and merchants the country soon became known as the country of Brazil wood. The name almost immediately supplanted Santa Cruz. Vespucci saw that the country was fertile and the climate pleasant. This was not enough to satisfy his greedy employers. A government whose coffers were beginning to overflow with the profits of the Indian spice trade and the African mines was not inclined to pay much attention to a region without the precious metals and inhabited only by naked savages. The reports of the abundance of Brazil wood, however, induced private adventurers to go and cut that valuable commodity. The government declared it a Portuguese monopoly but the high price of the article made the trade so enormously profitable that ships of other nationalities, especially French, could not be excluded. The coast soon became well known, but the Portuguese government did not extend its explorations to the south. It was left to the Spaniards to find the passage into the Pacific Ocean and to explore the tributaries of the plate. The southern extension of the continent became and remains Spanish. No exact records exist of the earliest Portuguese explorations of the northern coast from Cape São Roque to the mouth of the Amazon. We only know that some Portuguese ships navigated those waters, and that Spain never seriously disputed Portugal's title to that region. For thirty years Brazil remained unsettled, although the fleets going to the East Indies often stopped in its admirable harbours to refit and take water. Private adventurers came for Brazil wood, and the French poached more and more frequently. Soon the latter began to establish little factories, to which they returned year after year, and got on good terms with the aborigines. It became evident that Portugal must establish fortified, self-sustaining posts if she expected to retain the territory. End of section 25《セクション26 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 3. Description. Cabral's discovery bequeathed to the Portuguese race one of the largest, most productive, and valuable political divisions of the globe. The area is 3,150,000 square miles larger than the United States without Alaska, and surpassed only by the British, Russian, Chinese, and American empires. From north to south it extends 2,600 miles, and east to west 2,700. Lying across the equator, and traversed by no very high mountain ranges, its climate is more uniform than any other equally large inhabited region. 
but its extent is so immense that there are very considerable variations. Compact in form, with a continuous sea coast, unsurpassable harbours, and a great extension of navigable rivers, water communication between the different parts is easy, and the danger of dismemberment by external attack a minimum. Occupying the central portion of South America, it touches all the other countries of the continent except Chile, uniting them geographically, and to a large extent controlling land communication among them. It is nearer Europe and Africa than any other South American country, and is also on the direct route between the North Atlantic and both coasts of South America. Situated in latitudes where evaporation and precipitation are largest, where the trade winds unfailingly bring moisture from the Atlantic, and on the eastern and windward slope of the narrowest of the continents, Brazil has the steadiest and most uniformly distributed rainfall of any large part of the globe. The exuberance of life in Brazil must be seen to be realized. The early voyagers related the wonder and admiration which they felt. Amerigo Vespucci said that if paradise did exist on this planet, it could not be far from Brazilian coast. Agassi believed that the future center of the civilization of the world would be in the Amazon Valley. The plants useful for food and in industry, commerce and medicine are innumerable. Nowhere except in Ceylon does the palm flourish so. There are more plants indigenous to Brazil than to any other country, and many species, like coffee, transplanted there, have doubled in productiveness. Indian corn and mandioc were already cultivated by the Indians when Cabral landed, and both upland and lowland rice grew wild. The soil lends itself kindly to any kind of culture, and in most cases two crops may be reaped annually. In a word, the subsoil, the soil, the atmosphere, the forests, and the waters of Brazil are teeming with life and full of potential wealth too much so, perhaps, for the most wholesome development of the human race. The most extensive and the least developed part of Brazil is the Amazon Valley. The Brazilian portion of the Amazon Basin comprises 45% of the whole territory of the Republic. The northern and southeastern borders slope up to the surrounding mountains, but the rest is an early level plain, little elevated above the sea. The plains are covered with dense forests, much of the country is frequently flooded, and communication is only possible by the streams. In their neighborhood, the climate is in many localities unhealthful, and is everywhere tropical and rainy. Back from the rivers is an unexplored and unknown wilderness. The Amazon, with its tributaries, forms the greatest of all navigable fluvial systems. 10,700 miles are already known to be suitable for navigation by steamboats, and 4,800 more for smaller boats. It is in the narrow coast plain of the Atlantic, and in the high regions lying to the east and south of the Great Central Depression, that the Brazilian people live. The main orographic feature of the non-Amazonian Brazil is the great mountain system which extends uninterruptedly from the northern coast through the whole country. The continental uplift corresponds to the Andes on the west coast, just as the Appalachians do to the Rockies in North America. Its relative importance is many times greater on account of its great width, and because a broad plateau nearly connects it with the Andes between the headwaters of the Amazon and Plate River systems. The joint result is that two-thirds of Brazil is high enough to have a moderate and healthful climate, but the cataracts in the rivers and the steep escarpments of the mountains make it difficult of access. The promontory of South America, which reaches out to the northeast, looking in a direct line to the western extremity of Africa, is a region of gentle slopes, of wide, sparsely wooded plateaus, and of brush-covered hills. At long intervals, the interior is subject to severe droughts. The soil is fertile, as a rule, and the rainfall generally sufficient for cereal crops. Nearing the sea, precipitation increases and cotton and sugar thrive. The mountain ranges rarely exceed 3,000 feet in height, and lie far back from the coast, from which the country slopes up gradually. 
This region was the first in Brazil to contain a large population, and the Dutch fought hard for it during the 17th century. In its area of 30,000 square miles, seven of the Brazilian states are included, Maranhão, Piauí, Ceará, Rio Grande do Norte, Paraíba, Pernambuco, and Alagoas. The promontory of Sao Roque, where the coast turns from an east and west direction to a north and south, marks a commercial division. Sailing vessels found it difficult to round this cape from the north, and consequently the commercial relations of Maranhão, Piauí, and Ceará have been rather with the Amazon than southern Brazil. South of Sao Roque, the region is most easily accessible from Europe, and is on the direct line of communication between both sides of the North Atlantic and the coasts to the south. The region drained by the Tocantins and Araguaia very nearly corresponds with the state of Goyas. It is the western slope of the Brazilian Cordillera and differs radically from the Amazonian plain, which it adjoins. As one ascends the Tocantins and Araguaia from their mouths in the Amazon estuary, the altitude rapidly rises, and navigation is quickly interrupted by cataracts. In the south, the level rises to over 4,000 feet, and the climate shows a considerable range of temperature, with the thermometer sometimes falling below freezing in the higher mountains. Though the area is 350,000 square miles, the population hardly reaches a quarter of a million, and has not been increasing rapidly since the exhaustion of the alluvial gold deposits. Roughly speaking, it may be described as a region well adapted to cattle and agriculture, and composed of high, open, rolling plateaus, traversed by low mountain ranges and well-wooded river valleys. The next natural division comprises the oval depression lying between the great central watershed and the high range, which runs straight north from Rio within a few hundred miles of the coast. This is the San Francisco Valley. Politically and commercially connected is the adjacent coast plain. Valley and plain are divided into the four states of Minas, Bahia, Sergipe, and Espiritu Santo, with 430,000 square miles and 6 million inhabitants. In the coast plain, the rainfall is greater than farther north, and the soil is very fertile, producing not only cotton, sugar, and tobacco, but coffee, maize, and mandioc. The slopes are more abrupt, and the mountains begin closer to the sea. The interior is a great plateau, traversed by high mountain ranges and the tributaries of the San Francisco River. Most of this plateau is included in the great state of Minas, the most populous member of the Brazilian Union, which is agriculturally self-sufficient and one of the greatest mineral regions of the world. The rainfall is abundant, the climate is healthful and bracing, the birth rate is large, and the region is admirably adapted to the white races. Its general character is a rolling plateau, three to four thousand feet above the ocean, forming extensive treeless plains, which are interspersed with wooded mountain chains, river valleys, and extensive tracts of brushland. The European who visits the San Francisco Valley is astonished to find a country where the climate is temperate and the soil fitted to the production of all sorts of food crops, including the cereals, and where nevertheless proximity to the equator makes practicable a multiplicity of crops in a single year. The coast plain, which forms the greatest part of Bahia, Sergipe, and Espiritu Santo, is fertile, but the climate is enervating to Europeans, and the proportion of black blood there is the largest in Brazil. About the twentieth degree the mountains approach close to the coast, and from Victoria south to the thirtieth degree the Atlantic border of Brazil is steep and mountainous, often rising directly from the sea to a height of 2,600 feet. It is a coast of splendid harbors and magnificent scenery. The drainage is mostly inland into the plate system, and water falling within a dozen miles of the ocean flows 2,500 miles before reaching the sea. To this rule there is but one important exception, the Paraíba River, the basin of which is practically coterminous with the state of Rio de Janeiro and the federal district. This state is commercially and politically very important, although its area is small, 
The surface is very mountainous, and the soil mostly inferior to that of the divisions to the north and south. However, it is still an immense producer of coffee and sugar. Its geographical situation and great harbour have made it the most thickly settled part of the country. The rainfall is very large, especially on the mountains nearest to sea, which are covered with magnificent forests. The coast plains is warm, though not unhealthful, save in the vicinity of the infected city of Rio, and in the higher regions the climate is delightful and temperature almost European. The northern boundary is the Mantiqueira range, which divides the Paraíba basin from the valleys of the Paraná and São Francisco. This range is the highest in Brazil, and its culminating peak, Itatiaia, is 10,000 feet high, though it is only 70 miles from the sea. Slightly lower ranges lie between the Mantiqueira and the ocean, and of these the highest is Pedro da Su, 7,365 feet, which overlooks Rio Harbor, only 20 miles away. The Brazilian portion of the Great Paraná Valley presents a remarkable uniformity of general characteristics. Bordering the sea is a range of mountains, or rather the abrupt escarpment of the plateau, some 3,000 feet high. From its summit the surface slopes gently to the west, draining into the Paraná by a hundred streams, many of which are navigable in their middle courses. This great plateau, with its area of about 250,000 square miles, is mostly treeless towards the north, but in the south is covered with pine forests. It lies in the temperate zone, and snow sometimes falls on the higher peaks and chapadas of Sao Paulo. The soil is remarkably fertile, and this is the coffee region par excellence of the world. A coffee tree in Sao Paulo produces two to four times as much as in other parts of the globe. Food crops grow well, and the country might be economically independent of the rest of the world. The contour of the country is favorable to railroad building, and the region is easily penetrable. From their settlements on the seaward border of this plateau, the Paulistas of the 17th century roamed over the whole interior of South America, enslaving the Indians and driving out the Spanish Jesuits. The rainfall diminishes towards the interior, and there is an ill-defined limit where it ceases to be sufficient for coffee. The coffee district is also limited by the lowering of average temperature with increasing latitude. The three states of Sao Paulo, Paraná, and Santa Catarina contain most of the region under description, but southwestern Minas and extreme southern Goyas also belong to it. The great plateau gradually dies away to the south, ending with a low escarpment across the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Physically and geographically, this state is different from the rest of Brazil. Most of its area is drained to the Uruguay River, and its natural relations and affinities are with the republic of that name. Rio Grande's 95,000 square miles contain over a million inhabitants, and the open, rolling plains, nowhere much elevated above the sea, are excellently adapted to cattle. The northern portion is higher, more broken, and more wooded than the southern, and agriculture has made greater progress. The climate is distinctly that of the temperate zone, hot in summer, cold in winter, and subject to sudden variations on account of the winds which sweep up from the vast Argentine pampas. The inhabitants are big, vigorous and hardy, and great riders. All the products of the temperate zone, including the cereals, flourish, and this part of Brazil seems destined to great things in the near future. From Bolivia around to Uruguay sweeps in a large semicircle, convex to the north, a plateau that nearly unites the Andes with the eastern Cordillera, and forms the watershed between the Amazon and the Plate. Its eastern horn has already been described as forming the states of Sao Paulo, Paraná, and Santa Catarina. Its western and central portions form the great interior state of Mato Grosso. Here the headwaters of the Madeira, Tapajos, and Xingu, tributaries of the Amazon, intertwine with those of the Paraguay and Paraná. The narrow depression which the upper Paraguay forms across it is the only portion that has yet been described. The rest of the 410,000 square miles of Mato Grosso is abandoned to Indians and wild beasts. 
Only enough is known of these solitudes to prove that in the centre of the continent exists a well watered, fertile, and healthful region, capable of sustaining an immense population, but which is shut off from development by lack of means of communication. The northwestern part could be reached from the Amazon if the falls of the Madeira could be overcome, a route which would also open up a great and now inaccessible portion of Bolivia. End of section 26section twenty seven of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Piotr Natter. part four brazil chapter five early colonization the permanent settlement in brazil was begun by deserters and mutineers set on shore from ships on their way to india or to cut brazil wood in 1509, a certain Diego Alvarez, nicknamed by the Indians Caramuru, or Man of Lightning, landed at Bahia and escaped being eaten by frightening the Indians with his musket. He married a chief's daughter, and when a real colony was established years later, he and his numerous half-breed descendants proved of great use to his compatriots. Two years later, John Ramalho did much the same near Santos, hundreds of miles to the south. The story of the last of the three authentic degradados is even more romantic. His name was Alexo Garcia, and with three companions he landed about 1526 in the present state of Santa Catarina. Collecting an army of Indians, he led them on a conquering and gold-hunting expedition over the coast range, across the great plateau, into the valley of the Paraguay, and even penetrated ten years before Pizarro into territory tributary to the Incas of Peru. He finally perished in the center of the continent, but when, years afterwards, the Spaniards penetrated the valley of the Parana, they found that the Indians already knew of white men and firearms. As early as 1516, the Portuguese government offered to give farming utensils free to settlers in Brazil, and it is probable that shortly afterwards some sugar was planted. The first serious and official effort to cultivate sugar was made in 1526. Christovan Jacques founded a factory on the island of Itamarica, a few miles north of Pernambuco. It was shortly destroyed by the French Brazilwood hunters, and the settlers fled to the side of Pernambuco and renewed the effort pending the arrival of reinforcements. Seekers of Brazil wood hailing from Honfleur and Dieppe were swarming along the coast. The value of the region for sugar raising began to be appreciated. When the news came of the failure of the Spanish expedition which Cabot had led to the plate, the Portuguese government determined to fit out a considerable expedition composed of colonists and families as well as soldiers and adventurers. Seduced by the cry, quote, We are going to the silver plate, end quote, 400 persons enlisted. The five vessels were commanded by Martim Afonso da Souza, a great general and navigator who had already proved his capacity and who later went to the very top in the East Indian Wars. He was instructed to expel all intruders and establish a permanent fortified colony. Early in 1531 he reached the coast near Pernambuco, captured three French ships laden with Brazil wood, and sent two caravels north to explore the coast beyond Cape San Roque, while he himself sailed south with the idea of founding a colony on the plate. But after passing Santa Catarina, he was unfortunate in losing his largest ship with most of his provisions, and deemed it safer to return towards the north. At San Vicente, now a little town near the great coffee port of Santos, he dropped anchor, and there, January 1532, founded the first Portuguese colony in Brazil. Near this point lived the solitary Portuguese, John Ramalho, surrounded by his half-breed descendants, and he gave his countrymen a glad reception. He soon showed them the way up the mountains to the high plateau, which begins only a few miles from the sea. Another settlement was founded on these fertile plains near the site of the present-day city of Sao Paulo. In the west of Brazil, the settlements were established at a striking distance from the coast, but in Sao Paulo, the colonists could more easily spread over the open plains of the interior than along the mountainous coast. On top of their plateau, they were cut off from ready communication with the mother country, 
they struck out for themselves, and their development was something like that of the British in North America. They were the pioneers of Brazil, corresponding closely in character and habits, in the virtues of daring, hospitality, and self-confidence, and in the vices of cruelty, rudeness, and ignorance, with the pioneers of the Mississippi Valley. The Paulistas were all profoundly influenced by their intimate association with the Indian tribes. In the early days, intermarriages were frequent, but the continual reinforcement of the European element and the inferiority in capacity of reproduction which the Indian has shown in Brazil make the traces of that intermixture hard to discover at the present time. The Paulistas and their descendants in the interior states are taller, slenderer, darker, and more active and graceful than the modern Portuguese. Their hands and feet are smaller, their movements more nervous, their manners more self-confident. The successful founding of a considerable colony in Brazil aroused interest at home, and many countries solicited the crown for grants. It was decided to partition the whole coast into feudal fiefs, each proprietor undertaking the expenses of colonization and being given virtually sovereign powers in return for a tax on the expected production. Each of these capitancies measured fifty leagues along the coast and extended indefinitely into the interior. In 1534, twelve such fiefs were created, covering the whole coast from the mouth of the Amazon to the island of Santa Catarina these being the points where the Tordesillas line met the seaboard. Six of these proprietors succeeded in establishing permanent colonies. Martí Mafonso's settlement has already been described. In 1536, his brother, Pero López, established Santo Amaro within a few miles of São Vicente. Naturally, its history soon became confounded with that of the larger settlement. Duarte Coelho founded Pernambuco in 1535, and in it was soon absorbed Itamarica, the second of the two colonies founded by Pero López in 1536. The other three permanent settlements were Victoria, the nucleus of the present-day state of Espiritu Santo, Porto Seguro, and Ilios. No one of them prospered, and their territories are still among the most backwards part of the Brazilian coast. The donatory of the territory which included the Bay of Bahia started a town, but it was destroyed by Indians. The other five captaincies were not taken hold of seriously by their proprietors. The four nuclei for the settlement of Brazil were Sao Paulo, Pernambuco, and the later colonies of Bahia and Rio de Janeiro. Martí Mafonso wrecked little of his fief or its revenues, and left his paulistas to work out their own destiny. Pernambuco was on the track of every ship which came to South America. The neighboring interior was level and easily accessible from the coast. The soil and climate were suitable for sugar, and from the beginning relations with the mother country were intimate and continuous. Its proprietor, Duarte Coelho, determined to devote himself to his colony, and he personally headed a numerous and carefully selected colonizing expedition. He spent the rest of his life there, and died twenty years later, surrounded by a large and prosperous colony, which was already a self-supporting state, with all the elements of permanence. A good businessman, and liberal for that age, he granted land on easy terms. Its possession was secure, contributions were moderate, and he resolutely defended himself and his grantees from the exactions of the crown. The Portuguese occupation of Brazil was induced solely by commercial considerations. Explorers and emigrants went out to make their fortunes, not to escape religious or political tyranny. When the first voyagers were disappointed in not finding gold mines, they turned their attention to Brazil wood. Soon the suitability of the territory for sugar was discovered. The European demand for this luxury was increasing and the Portuguese had become familiar with its culture in Africa. Cain was taken from Madeira and the Cape Verdes to Brazil before 1525, and there is a record of exportation at least as early as 1526. Here was found the basis for the real colonization. From the very start the industry prospered in Pernambuco, and Brazil became the main source of the world's supply. Near Pernambuco little trouble was experienced with the Indians. Many of the tribes were allies of the Portuguese, 
Though the fierce Aymores fought the settlers and once reduced the infant colony to the verge of destruction. Although the law of Portugal forbade the enslavement of Indians except as a punishment for crime, they were reduced to bondage on a large scale in Pernambuco, and the Paulistas never paid any attention to this prohibition. By the middle of the 16th century, Brazil contained one rapidly expanding colony of sugar planters, Pernambuco, which gave sure promise of wealth if not attacked from without. A half dozen moribund settlements on the thousand miles of coast to the south and an isolated but vigorous and self-sufficing group in Sao Paulo, whose inhabitants produced little for export, but who were reducing the aborigines to slavery in an expanding circle. In the last there was a considerable proportion of Indian blood, and in the first a large number of Negroes. The small captaincies were little more than resorts for pirates and contraband traders in Brazil wood. The settlers were powerless to prevent the French expeditions, which yearly became more numerous. Serious apprehensions were felt that the French would occupy the coast and make Brazil a basis for attacks on Portugal's African and Indian empires. The best blood of the Portuguese nation was being drained away in exhausting wars and expeditions to India and Africa. Absolute government was sapping civic vitality. The extravagances of court and nobles were impoverishing the country. However, enough vitality remained before the terrific destruction of Portuguese power and pride at Alcacer Quibir in 1580 to secure such a firm establishment of the Portuguese race on the whole coast of Brazil that it never has been dislodged and only once seriously threatened. This result was largely due to the founding of a strong military and naval post at Bahia, around which grew up a prosperous colony, and under whose protection Pernambuco spread out over the northeast coast. Sao Paulo developed uninterruptedly, and Rio Bay was saved from the French. The first proprietary settlement in Bahia Bay had been destroyed by the Indians, but this magnificent and central harbour was manifestly the most convenient point whence to send assistance to the other settlements and guard the whole coast. In 1548, the king determined to build a fortress and city there. Thomas da Sousa, the illegitimate scion of a great house, was chosen the first governor-general. He sailed in April 1549 with six vessels and accompanied by 320 officials and a number of colonists. The new capital commanded the entrance to a magnificent inland sea which offered splendid facilities for the establishment of a flourishing state. Bahia Bay is nearly a hundred miles in circumference. Its shores are fertile and penetrated by rivers. Each plantation has its own wharves. Within a few months a town of a hundred houses had been built, surrounded by a wall and defended by batteries. A cathedral, a custom house, a Jesuit college and a governor's residence were under way. Thomas da Souza was instructed to strike at the root of the difficulties that were supposed to have prevented the success of the proprietary capitances. He was the direct representative of the king and had supreme supervisory power. Other officers, however, were associated with him who were independently responsible in judicial, financial and naval matters. He was closely bound by instructions covering every detail that could be foreseen, and these instructions clearly show the centralizing and jealous spirit of Portuguese institutions and ideas. Few Portuguese of that age were able to rising to an appreciation of the economical advantages of freedom. The liberal concessions to the original proprietors, free trade with the mother country, the right of communication with foreign countries, and judicial and administrative independence availed nothing. Neither colonists, proprietors, nor the central government could understand or apply them. Brazil was subjected to a systematic and continually more rigorous exploitation by the home government, and to the irresponsible and uncontrolled military despotism of little satraps. In Bahia, as in Pernambuco, the sugar industry prospered from the beginnings. Bahia is close to Africa, and navigation across is safe and easy. The importation of blacks began immediately, and the port continued to be the greatest entrepot and distributing point for the trade during three centuries. 
Bahia's population is more largely black than that of any other city in Brazil, and the pure African type is frequently seen on its streets. The local cuisine includes many dishes of African origin, and the local dialect many African words. Certain African dialects are spoken to this day, and a few Mahomedan Negroes there still perform the rites of the Koran in the most absolute secrecy. The municipal government of the town, though under the overshadowing power of the governor, showed some vitality and independence. The fertile island of Itaparica, just opposite the city, had been granted to the mother of a minister. Though the donation was repeatedly confirmed by the king himself, she and her heirs were never able to put their agents in possession. The municipal council successfully insisted that the original royal instructions to the governor required all grantees to occupy their estates in person. End of section 27section twenty eight of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Piotr Natter. part four brazil chapter five the jesuits one of john the third's strongest reason for undertaking a more extensive colonization of brazil was the pious conviction that it was his christian duty to promote the dissemination of the true religion in dominions which he owed to the gift of the holy father he was the first and most steadfast friend of the jesuits then just organized and san francisco xavier the apostle of the east indies was sent out to one hemisphere while the conversion of the brazilian aborigines was determined upon in the other with thomas da souza sailed an able jesuit manuel nobrega accompanied by several other fathers they began a carefully planned campaign to convert the indians and incidentally to exploit them in the interests of the order it is impossible not to admire the courage shrewdness and devotion of the jesuits they went out alone among the savage tribes living with them learning their languages preaching to them captivating their imagination by the pomp of religious paraphernalia and processions baptizing them and exhorting them to abandon cannibalism and polygamy tireless and fearless they plunged into an interior hitherto unpenetrated by white men the reports they made to their superiors frequently afford the best information that is yet extant as to the customs of the indians and the resources of the regions they explored the indians were easily induced to conform to the externals of the christian cult wherever the jesuits penetrated the aborigines soon adopted christianity but to hold the indians to christianity the fathers were obliged to fix them to the soil as soon as a tribe was converted a rude church building was erected and the jesuit installed who remained to teach agriculture and the arts as well as the rituals and morals his moral and intellectual superiority made him perforce an absolute ruler in miniature thus that strange theocracy came into being which starting on the brazilian coast spread over most of the central america in the early part of the seventeenth century the theocratic seemed likely to become the dominant form of government south of the amazon and east of the indies the jesuit wanted the indian to himself and fought against the interference or enslavement by the lay portuguese the colonists wanted the indians to work on their plantations to incorporate them as slaves or in some analogous capacity with the white man's industrial and civil organization the home government stood by the jesuits but the colonists constantly evaded restrictions and steadily fought the priests the encouragement of the negro slave trade was an attempt at a compromise intended to induce the colonists to leave the indians alone by furnishing another supply of labor primarily at least the jesuit purpose was altruistic although the material advantages and the fascination of exercising authority were soon potent motives the jesuits gave the south american indian the greatest measure of peace and justice he ever enjoyed but they reduced him to blind obedience and made him a tenant and a servant though virtually a slave he was however little exposed to infection from the vices and diseases of civilization he was not put at tasks too hard for him and under jesuit rule he prospered 
On the other hand, if this system had prevailed, there would have been little white immigration, the Indian race would have remained in possession of the country, and real civilization would never have gained a foothold. Immediately after the founding of Bahia, Nobrega sent members of the order to the other colonies. He himself visited Pernambuco, where the stout old proprietor met him with effective opposition. Duarte did not welcome a clergy responsible solely to a foreign corporation, and over which he could have no control. In Bahia and the South, the Jesuits, however, prospered amazingly. In Sao Paulo, they laboured hard, spread widely, converted a large number of Indians, and perfected their system, but it was there they came most sharply in conflict with the spirit of individualism, and there they suffered their first and most crushing overthrow. Thomas da Souza laboured diligently during the four years of his administration, fortifying posts, driving away contraband traders, dismissing incompetent officials, and even building jails and straightening streets where the local authorities had neglected them. He visited all the captaincies south of Bahia and entered Rio Bay, then the principal rendezvous for the French privateers and traders. He appreciated its strategic and commercial importance, and was only prevented by lack of means from establishing a strong post there. In Sao Paulo he prohibited the flourishing trade which had grown with the Spaniards in Paraguay in Buenos Aires. Duarte da Costa, his successor, was accompanied by a large reinforcement of Jesuits. Among them was Ancheta, one of the most notable men in the history of the order, whose genius, devotion, and pertinacious courage laid the foundations of Jesuit power so deeply in South America that its effects remain to this day. This remarkable man was born in Tenerife, the son of a banished nobleman who had married a native of the island. Educated at home, from his infancy he showed marvellous talents. At fourteen his father, not daring to risk his son's life in Spain, sent him to the Portuguese university at Coimbra. His career was so brilliant, the reputation he acquired for profound and ready intelligence, his eloquence, and his pure and elevated ideals so remarkable, that he attracted the attention of Simon Rodriguez, John III's great Jesuit minister, who, like all the leaders of the order, was on the watch for talented young men. The ardent youth was easily convinced that no career was so glorious as that of a missionary, and when only twenty years old he solicited and obtained permission to go to Brazil. Nobrega, the provincial, selected him to go to Sao Paulo to establish a school to train neophytes and proselytes into evangelists. His own letter to Nobrega best tells what a life he found and what sort of man he was. Quote, Here we are, sometimes more than twenty of us, together in a light hut of mud and wicker, roofed with straw, fourteen paces long and ten wide. This is at once the school, the infirmary, dormitory, refectory, kitchen, and storeroom. Yet we covet not the more spacious dwellings which our brethren have in other parts. Our Lord Jesus Christ was in a far straighter place when it was his pleasure to be born among beasts in a manger, and in a still straighter when he deigned to die upon the cross. End quote. They herded together to keep warm, for in winter it is cold on the Sao Paulo plateau. They had no food except the mandioc flour, fish, and game which the Indians gave them. To the little college came Creoles and half-breeds and learned Latin, Portuguese, Spanish, and Tupi. Ancheta was indefatigable. Within a year he had acquired a complete mastery of the Indian tongue and had devised a grammar for it. He wrote his own textbooks and employed his great poetical talents in composing hymns and verses to be chanted to the pupils, recounting the stories of holy scriptures. He visited the most savage tribes in person and acquired a marvellous moral supremacy over them. When the Tamoyos attacked the Portuguese and the destruction of all the southern settlements seemed inevitable, he fearlessly went to the Indian camps and persuaded the chiefs to consent to a truce while he remained among them three years as a hostage to guarantee its faithful performance by his countrymen. The savages regarded him as more than human, and tradition tells of the miracles he performed. 
It is related that during these three years of solitary captivity he composed, without the aid of pen or paper, his Latin hymn to the Virgin, celebrated as one of the masterpieces of ecclesiastical poetry. He and his companions did not disdain to labour with their hands. They used the spade and trowel, made their own shoes, taught the Indians agriculture, introduced new plants from Europe, practised medicine, and studied the botany, topography, and geology of the country. The villages of converted Indians under their government and protection rapidly spread over the Sao Paulo plains, and they were refuges for Indians flying from slavery on the plantations. The colonists pursued their fugitive slaves, and soon were at open war with the Jesuits. In the course of this conflict, the original half-breed settlement on the plateau was destroyed, and the lay Portuguese came near being wiped out. Peace was temporarily patched up, but the Paulistas soon turned the tables and compelled the Jesuits to devote themselves to their educational institutions in the towns, or to withdraw farther and farther into the wilderness. End of section 28「Section 28 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 6. French Occupation of Rio. During Duarte's administration, troubles with the Indians broke out along the whole coast. In Bahia itself, the new governor had disobeyed the orders of the home government to protect the Indians. He joined with the colonists in exploiting them. A formidable Indian conspiracy was formed, and the settlements on both sides of the city were simultaneously attacked. Many farms and villages were sacked, but soon the Indians were finally and crushingly defeated. The coast towns of Sao Paulo were menaced by a great confederation of tribes who used war canoes and had learned to overcome their terror of firearms. At Espiritu Santo, the Indian slaves rose en masse, killed most of the Portuguese, and destroyed the sugar plantations. A more serious danger was the settlement of the French at Rio de Janeiro. They had formed friendly relations with the Indians, and the name of Frenchmen was sufficient to ensure good treatment from most of the tribes, while that of Portuguese was a signal for its bearer to be killed and devoured. This was the epoch of the religious wars in France, and the traders to Brazil came mostly from the Huguenot ports. Admiral Coligny conceived the idea of establishing a Huguenot settlement in South America, and Rio was chosen as the most available site. In 1555 a considerable expedition was sent under the command of Nicolas Villegagnon, a celebrated adventurer who had distinguished himself in escorting Mary Queen of Scots from France to Scotland. He fortified the island in Rio Harbor, that still bears his name, a barren rock which commanded the entrance and was safe from attacks by land. The French kept on good terms with the neighboring Indians and remained unmolested by the Portuguese for four years. But Villegagnon was not faithful to his employers, though most of his party were Protestants, and Huguenot leaders had furnished the money for the expedition. He quarrelled with the Huguenots and finally gave up the command and returned to France in the Guise interest. Coligny's project of establishing a new and protestant France in South America lost its very good chance of success. It is interesting to conjecture what would have been the history of Brazil if Villegagnon had stuck to the Huguenot side. In all probability, reinforcements would have been sent, and San Bartolomeu's Day, fourteen years later, might have been followed by a great emigration like that which went to New England during the Lot persecution. Rio, and perhaps the whole of South Brazil, would have become a French possession or a French-speaking state. Not until 1558 was a strong and able Portuguese governor selected, and vigorous measures taken to expel the French. The new governor was Mem de Sa, a nobleman of the highest sort, a soldier, a scholar, and an experienced administrator. His name will always be associated with the establishment of the Portuguese power in Brazil, on a footing firm and broad enough to enable it to withstand the Dutch attacks and the lean years of Spanish domination. 
Upon his arrival he took measures to quiet the Indian slavery question by reducing the import duties on black slaves, and by aiding each planter to acquire as many negroes as he needed to work his plantation. When his ships and armament arrived, he proceeded to the south. He found that the French, though weak in numbers, could count on Indian allies. As he himself writes to the court, quote, The French do not treat the natives as we do. They are very liberal to them, observing strict justice, so that the commander is feared by his countrymen and beloved by the Indians. Measures have been taken to instruct the latter in the use of arms, and as the aborigines are very numerous, the French may soon make themselves very strong. End quote. He harassed the French and destroyed their fortifications, but could not completely dislodge them, and returned to Bahia with his work only half accomplished. Porto Seguro and Ilios were attacked by the ferocious Aymores, and with difficulty saved from total destruction. In the south, another great Tamoyo confederation had been formed with the deliberate purpose of rooting the Paulistas out of the country, and putting a stop once and for all to their slave-hunting. When all seemed lost, Ancheta intervened and succeeded in fixing up a peace. The Tamoyos were cajoled into becoming allies of the Portuguese in a final attempt to expel the French from Rio. Memdasa's nephew appeared with a considerable fleet, and after a desultory campaign of a year, the French were obliged to retire. France did nothing to prevent or recover this inestimable loss, and Memdasa immediately laid out and fortified a city on a site which today is the business centre of the capital of Brazil. From the time of its founding, Rio was the most important place in southern Brazil, and the key to the whole region, but its great prosperity dates from a hundred and fifty years later, when gold was discovered in Minas Gerais. Memdasa continued to rule Brazil until his death in 1572. The work of centralization went on apace. Fiscal and administrative officers were multiplied, and taxes and restrictions imposed at will. The Lisbon government laid the foundations of that restrictive system which finally confined Brazil to communication with the mother country. Nevertheless, most of the settlements grew rapidly. Sugar planting, cattle raising, and general agriculture flourished. The Indians were expelled or reduced to impotence within striking distance of the centres of population. At Memdesa's death, the civilized population numbered about 60,000, of whom 20,000 were white. The provinces of Pernambuco and Bahia had each 25,000 inhabitants, Rio had some 2,000, and São Paulo perhaps five, the remainder being divided between the smaller settlements, Paraíba, Rio Real, Ilhéus, Porto Seguro, and Espiritu Santo. Except in São Paulo, most of the inhabitants were engaged in sugar raising, the hundred and twenty plantations produced annually forty five thousand tons of sugar while portuguese goods to the value of a million dollars a year were imported a sugar fazenda or plantation constituted a little independent village where the owner lived surrounded by his slaves in their cabins his shops and stables mills and mandioc fields the grantees had paid no purchase price for the land and held it on condition of paying a tenth of the product and a tenth of that tenth a tax which survives to the present time only it is now called an export duty of eleven per cent land was not otherwise taxed and to this day direct taxes on farm property are almost unknown though imposts of every other conceivable kind have been multiplied the tracts granted were large the owner could hold them unused without expense. The most powerful incentive to sale and division of land did not therefore exist. Brazil became and remains a country of large rural proprietorship. Landowners are reluctant to sell or divide their estates. Taxes on transfers are excessive, and land is not freely bought and sold. Consequently, the rural population is widely scattered. Grants extend far beyond the limits of actual settlement, there are few small farmers, and very little careful culture. Brazil is a country of staple crops and non-diversified agriculture. A fail in sugar or coffee produces a disproportionate disturbance in financial conditions, and land not suitable to the staple crop of a region is left to lie idle.
Immigration has been retarded because land has been hard to obtain except by special government concession, and because private owners do not care to sell their land to settlers. Except in restricted cases, the rural immigration, Negro and South European, has been for the purpose of furnishing labor for the large proprietors, and not to form a land-owning and permanently established population. The Jesuit travelers describe the Brazilian people in 1584 as pleasure-loving and extravagant. In the sugar provinces, fortunes were very unequal. In Pernambuco alone, more than a hundred planters had incomes of $10,000 a year. Their capital, Olinda, now the northern suburb of the city of Pernambuco, was the largest town in Brazil, and the one where there was most luxurious living and the most polite society. In general, the people were spendthrifts, and notwithstanding large incomes, were heavily in debt. Great sums were spent on fates, religious processions, fairs, and dinners. The simple Jesuit fathers were shocked to see such velvets and silks, such luxurious beds of crimson damask, such extravagance in the trappings of the saddle horses. Carriages were unknown, and instead litters and sedan chairs were used, and these remained in common use in Bahia until very recent times. From Pernambuco and Bahia, communication with the mother country was constant and easy. Sao Paulo, however, differed radically from the sugar districts. Wheat, barley, and European fruits grew on the Sao Paulo plateau, but there was little export to Portugal, and imported clothes were scarce and dear. The Paulistas were constantly on horseback and wore the old Portuguese costume of cloak and close-fitting doublet long after it had been disused at home. Bahia and Pernambuco were fairly well-built towns, though unfortunately in the Portuguese style of architecture, whose solid walls, few windows, and contiguous houses make it ill-adapted to a tropical climate. In spite of its unsuitability, it was universally adopted, and even yet largely prevails in Brazil. End of section 29。section 30 of the South American Republics, volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 7. Expansion. In 1581, Philip II of Spain succeeded in establishing himself on the throne of Portugal as the successor of the Rash Sebastian, dead fighting the Moors at Alcacer Kebir. The decadent and demoralized Portuguese nation made hardly the semblance of a struggle for its independence. The very ease with which Philip obtained the kingdom left him no pretext for depriving it of administrative independence. Native Portuguese continued to hold office in the colonies and to enjoy a monopoly of Brazilian commerce. Internally, therefore, the change did not much affect Brazil. But in foreign relations the effect was profound. Brazil became a part of well-nigh universal monarchy, and one of the battlefields of the struggle which had begun between Spain and the Protestant powers. All South America was now under the same monarch. Boundary questions between Portuguese and Spanish America apparently ceased to have any importance. The enormous extension of Brazil towards the interior, over territory formerly conceded to be Spanish, occurred during the sixty years of Spanish domination. The Spanish monarch did not have time to spend on Brazilian matters, and the colonists were less interfered with from Lisbon and Madrid than might have been expected. Portuguese historians have much exaggerated the evil effects of the English, Dutch, and French half-filibustering, half-trading descents on the coast, which occurred during this period. The pillage of a few towns was more than compensated by the commerce that sprang up. Much Brazilian sugar escaped paying the heavy export duties. Settlement extended rapidly over new territory, and the importation of Negroes continued. As early as 1575, a settlement had been made in Sergipe, but the great expansion over northern Brazil began under the rule of Philip's first governor-general. In 1583, he sent troops to take possession of the important port of Paraíba, where some French traders had obtained a foothold that prevented the inhabitants of Pernambuco from spreading north beyond Itamarica. 
The Spanish mercenaries were at first successful, but they could not stifle the serious Indian war which broke out. The Pernambucanos had better success, because they knew how to take advantage of the dissensions among the savages. Fortifying a town at Paraiba, they permanently established their sugar plantations in its neighborhood, and then these indefatigable and land-hungry creoles pushed on farther to the north. In 1579, Jeronimo de Albuquerque, the greatest of the Brazilian colonial generals, attacked and defeated the powerful Pitagoares Indians, and established the colony of Natal, the nucleus of the present state of Rio Grande do Norte. This brought the Pernambucanos to Cape Sauroque, to the south they had spread as far as the San Francisco River, there meeting the Bayanos, who, by 1589, had taken possession of the present state of Sergipe. North of San Roque, the Portuguese had so far had done nothing except make some desultory voyages of observation, though they claimed the coast to and beyond the mouth of the Amazon. The donatories of the captaincies in that region had not succeeded in establishing any settlement, in 1541, Orellana, one of those recklessly heroic Spaniards who had helped Pizarro conquer the empire of the Incas, was a member of an expedition which crossed the Andes near Quito and descended into the forested plains, looking for another Peru, the fabled El Dorado. They finally found themselves on a great river flowing to the east, and since their provisions were exhausted, boats were built, and Orellana was sent on ahead to try to find supplies he could not find enough to feed the main body and decided to float on down the river well knowing it must finally bring him to the ocean after a voyage of more than three thousand miles he came to the great estuary of the amazon and thence made his way to spain no important results followed this wonderful discovery orellana himself shortly returned to the mouth of the river but he could not find his way up the labyrinth of waters to reach the plains from the Pacific or Caribbean settlements is nearly impracticable, and the Amazon Valley remained unsettled. Meanwhile, the seed planted by old Duarte Coelho germinated and grew into a vigorous tree, whose branches were spreading out over all North Brazil. The 17th century had hardly begun, when the hardy Pernambucanos invaded the country lying north and west of São Roque, hunting indian slaves and good places for cattle and sugar raising in sixteen o three pero coelho an adventurous brazilian then living at paraiba made a settlement far to the northwest of natal on the coast of ceara and penetrated eight hundred miles from pernambuco unreasonable aggressions against the indians brought on temporary reverses but the pernambucanos persevered and the jesuits also established missions by 1610 the region was pretty well under white control, the Indians being incorporated to a greater extent than was usual in the settlements farther south. The next forward movement was precipitated by a formidable French attempt to colonize Maranhão. Daniel de la Rivardière, a Huguenot nobleman, conceived the idea of carrying out on the north coast Coligny's plan of a French Protestant colony, in 1612 he landed on the island of Maranhão with a large and well-appointed expedition. Geronimo de Albuquerque fortunately happened to be on the north coast when news came of this alarming intrusion. Sending his ships on to ascertain the truth of the report, he hastened overland to Pernambuco to get a force together. With 300 whites and 200 Indians he started to expel the French. An assault on a front defended with artillery was out of the question, so in his turn he fortified himself, cut off the French from access to the sea, and ambushed their foraging expeditions. In such a game, his men, inured to the climate, had an immense advantage. Forced to assault Albuquerque's position, the French were repulsed. They begged for a truce and went home at the end of a year. Albuquerque took possession of the French town, and in 1616 secured all the rest of the northern coast to Portugal by founding Pará, just to the south of the mouth of the Amazon. Several settlements were made along the coast east of Pará, and also west in the estuary itself. The Indians proved docile, and were easily incorporated to so great an extent that the Indian element is more predominant in Pará than in any other state on the Brazilian littoral. On the island and around the Bay of Maranhão, a prosperous colony grew up, 
certain enterprising business men made a contract with the Government and started a regular propaganda for immigrants, and induced a large number to come from the Azores. The state thus founded was one of the most prosperous in Brazil, and was especially celebrated for the politeness and cultivation of its inhabitants. Some of the greatest names in Portuguese literature are those of Maranhenses. It is commonly said that the best Portuguese is spoken in Maranhão, and not in Lisbon, Rio, or Porto. Just as the English of Dublin, Aberdeen, or Boston is considered better than that of London or New York, and the Spanish of Lima and Bogotá better than that of Madrid, Barcelona, or Buenos Aires. Meanwhile, population and wealth had been increasing satisfactorily in the older provinces south of Cape Sao Roque. By 1626, Pernambuco and Bahia had grown to be the towns of something like 10,000 inhabitants, and the people of the respective provinces numbered about a 100,000. Ilieos, Porto Seguro, and Espiritu Santo had made no progress, but Rio had become a city of 6,000, while the shores of her bay and the adjacent coast were now fairly settled. Rio and Santos really performed the function of ports for the foreign commerce of Paraguay and the Argentine, because the Spanish laws did not permit these colonies to have ports of their own. Campos was now settled, and its sugar industry was prospering. On the Sao Paulo plains, the Paulistas had spread to the northeast, to the headwaters of the Paraiba and borders of the present state of Rio, and northwest down the navigable Tiete, along which they found an easy track for their expeditions in search of slaves. The Jesuits had long since been unable to control or check the Paulistas, and had abandoned the missions near the coast. In the remote interior, along the Paraná and its great tributaries, the defeated priests, thought that they would be safe, and about the end of the 16th century they entered that region by way of Paraguay. The Paulistas wrecked little of the government, especially now that the king was Spanish, and advancing the claim that Spanish Jesuits had established missions on Portuguese territory, they proceeded to wipe out the new missions. It seems incredible that their little bands could have penetrated such distances and accomplished such results but it is on record that they tracked nearly to the Andes and practically exterminated the aboriginal population of half Brazil. The Jesuits tell us that between 1614 and 1639, 400 Paulistas with 2,000 Indian allies captured and killed 300,000 natives. In 1632, they utterly destroyed the great Jesuit settlements on the upper Paraná, though this involved an expedition of 1,500 miles, much of which is to this day rarely penetrable. One of their expeditions was like an ambulating village, women, children, and domestic animals accompanying it. They sometimes were obliged to stop, sow a crop, and wait for it to mature, before they could proceed. For the time being, these predatory paulistas almost reverted to the nomadic stage. Naturally, no complete record of these expeditions survives. Their members were not literate men, and it is only when they fought the Jesuits, or when they discovered minerals, that a record of their routes had been preserved. We know that before 1632 they had traversed all of southern Brazil and Paraguay, and even eastern Argentina and Uruguay. Incursions to the north and west followed shortly. There is an authentic record of an expedition reaching Goyas as early as 1647, and it is probable that by that time they had penetrated the central plateau which stretches across to the Andes, had seen the headwaters of the southern tributaries of the Amazon, and had followed the eastern mountain chain almost to the northern ocean. The Paulistas secured to their country and their race more than a million square miles of fertile and salubrious territory. End of section 30section thirty one of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part four brazil chapter eight the dutch conquest by the end of the sixteenth century holland was practically independent and the quote, beggars of the sea end quote, were carrying her arms and trade all over the world Numerous private companies of Dutch merchants made war against Spain on their own account, 
and great fortunes were made in the capture of Spanish fleets and in trade with Spanish and Portuguese colonies. The Dutch East India Company, within a few years, possessed itself of the better part of the Portuguese Empire in the Indian Ocean, and the West India Company was organized to do the same in South America. Incorporated in 1621, it included various smaller companies already engaged in trade and privateering, and was an immense corporation which finally owned more than 800 ships and sent to Brazil alone more than 70,000 troops. Although protected, subsidized, and conceded a monopoly by the Dutch government, it always remained essentially a company for private profit. The company's primary object was to capture the Spanish treasure fleets. Its secondary object was to conquer the possession of Spain and Portugal in South America. Brazil furnished the best base for the operations that were intended to make the South Atlantic a Dutch lake. Bahia and Pernambuco were near Europe, had good harbors, lay on the direct route to the Plate and the Pacific, and from them Africa could be conveniently attacked. The sugar trade was a large thing in itself, and the daring Dutch traders believed that the Portuguese colonists might welcome a deliverance from Spanish domination. Spain's power was a rotten shell, and the impulse lying deep in the national spirit pushed the Dutch on to aggression. The peoples of Western Europe had finally felt all the stimulating influences of the Renaissance, of the Lutheran and Jesuit reformations, and of the era of discovery. It was the epoch of the Thirty Years' War, of the League of Avignon, and of that confused fighting caused by more vigorous peoples grasping for a share of the spoils of the New World. In 1623, news came of the equipping by the West India Company of an expedition whose destination was manifestly to be Bahia. The Spanish government took no measures for defence. The local authorities half-heartedly began to fortify the city, but there were no troops except militia to man the works, and when the Dutch fleet hove in sight, a panic ensued. The governor was captured, but many of the inhabitants fled into the back country, and a guerrilla warfare was kept up which shut up the Dutch inside the fortifications. They made use of their time in improving the defences, and soon made Bahia the best fortress in South America. The news of the capture created consternation in Lisbon. Great exertions were made by the Portuguese merchants, as well as by the Spanish government, and the most formidable armament which up to that day had crossed the equator was prepared. It was composed of 52 ships and of 12,000 men, the latter being mercenaries gathered from every country in Europe. The Dutch commander had not yet been reinforced, and made little resistance when such an overwhelming force arrived in Bahia Harbor. He surrendered with the honors of war, and the Spanish fleet retired. In a few weeks another Dutch fleet appeared, bringing provisions and reinforcements. It was too late, however, and the Dutch did not venture to attack an enemy whom they themselves had furnished with such excellent reinforcements. The Dutch, driven from the land, remained undisputed masters of the sea, and the Spanish and Portuguese could no longer trade except in convoys. In 1627, the celebrated Piet Hain, the Dutch Sir Francis Drake, sailed boldly into Bahia Harbour, and despising the fire of the forty guns of the forts, captured twenty-six ships within pistol shot of the shore cannon. He ran his own ship right in between the two best Portuguese men of war. The fort did not dare to fire for fear of wounding their own men. The Portuguese flagship was sunk, and the rest surrendered in terror. Among the spoils were three thousand hogsheads of sugar, which Piet Hain sent home at his leisure, while he ravaged the shores of the bay. The following year he fell in with the Mexican treasure fleet and captured it boldly. This was the greatest capture ever made at sea. The West India Company declared a dividend of 50% after paying the expenses of the unsuccessful Bahia expedition and resumed its plans of conquest with more vigor than ever. After careful consideration, Pernambuco was selected as a more vulnerable point of attack than Bahia. The fortifications were feeble, and there were numerous Jewish merchants in the city whose friendship could be counted on. Once more, the Spanish government did nothing to avert the threatened blow, and in February 1630, a Dutch fleet of 50 sail with 7,000 men arrived in front of Pernambuco. 
three thousand men were landed to the north of the town and easily defeated the militia which tried to prevent their taking the place from the rear the inhabitants fled to the interior and after a creditable resistance the forts fell the property captured was estimated at nearly ten million dollars in the meantime albuquerque the brazilian commander had retired to a defensible ranch commanding the road between recife and olinda and whence communication could be kept up with the sea by way of cape st augustine this ranch is celebrated in brazilian tradition as the quote, areal de bom jesus end quote. the brazilians rallied and from this vantage ground began to harass the dutch the promises of commercial religious and political tolerance had produced little effect on the more ardent spirits the indians remained faithful to the portuguese and with the negroes did good service in the guerrilla warfare for the first two years the dutch could accomplish little except to improve the fortifications around the town and the brazilians acquired a confidence in their own ability to make head against regular troops which later stood them in good stead in sixteen thirty one a fleet of twenty ships appeared from spain but the dutch admiral sailed boldly out and gave them battle the net results to the spaniards were the landing of only a thousand men who after some difficulty joined the militia at bom jesus but the seeds of discontent were germinated among the brazilians on closer contact the heretics proved to be human the planters wanted peace and an opportunity to sell their sugar the indians negroes and other adventurous spirits composing the guerrilla bands robbed both friend and foe the soldiers were tired of serving without pay a half-breed named calabar a man of remarkable bravery cunning and skill in woodcraft deserted to the dutch and gave them valuable assistance reinforcements came from holland and under calabar's guidance the dutch learned the value of ambuscading and made sudden expeditions which took the important settlements by surprise in sixteen thirty three two special representatives of the company came with instructions to prosecute the war vigorously and to endeavour to conciliate the brazilians the latter's resistance weakened many of albuquerque's volunteers deserted the dutch expeditions up and down the coast were successful the island of itamarica rio grande do norte paraiba and the settlements in alagoas were successively reduced resistance was soon confined to the country just back of pernambuco itself and in sixteen thirty five the last posts which held out bom jesus and san augustin surrendered the whole coast from the san francisco river north to cape san roque was in the hands of the dutch there was nothing for it but submission or emigration many laid down their arms but albuquerque and his faithful lieutenants the negro diaz and the indian camarrao reluctantly took their way towards baya the only place of refuge the brazilian historians claim that ten thousand pernambucanos men women and children accompanied albuquerque preferring to leave their homes property and friends rather than accept the foreign and heretic yoke a sweet bit of revenge awaited them on their journey encountering and overpowering a small dutch garrison at porto calvo they took its members prisoners and among them found the traitor calabar him they hanged while the dutchmen were let go unharmed when albuquerque reached the san francisco he was replaced by a spaniard rojas who had brought reinforcements of seventy hundred spanish troops the new commander gave battle to the hollanders but in the first action was utterly defeated and lost his own life for the next two years pernambuco was ravaged by the most frightful burnings and massacres the spanish mercenaries and the bands of negroes and indians scoured the interior and the dutch retaliated with the same methods the prosperous colony was fast being depopulated and its industries ruined it became manifest that a policy at once vigorous and conciliatory was necessary and the company determined to send out a governor-general with viceregal powers the merchants of the directory chose count john morris of nassau zegen a scion of the reigning house and a descendant of william the silent a more fortunate selection could not have been made though only thirty-two years old count morris had already proved himself a brave and skilful soldier he was a man of culture a thorough son of the renaissance 
a lover of the arts, and, like most of his house, religiously tolerant and liberal to an extent extraordinary for that bitter age. He was one of those few spirits, in advance of their time, to whom Catholic and Protestant, Jew and Gentile were the same, to whose instincts religious and commercial intolerance was repugnant. He arrived in 1637, and his keen eye at once saw that the two obstacles to pacification were the military raids which the new Spanish commander Bagnoli was directing from his position near the San Francisco, and the fear of the Pernambuco sugar planters that Dutch dominion meant their forcible conversion to Calvinism. The Dutch troops were now well equipped and seasoned for warfare in the tropical woods, and their officers had learned how to exercise their trade under these difficult circumstances with all the coolness, shrewdness, and steadiness of their race. Commanded by Morris, they easily inflicted a crushing defeat upon the motley crew Bagnoli had been able to gather. The whole country north of the San Francisco fell into Maurice's hands, and he crossed that river and destroyed the Brazilian base of supplies in Sergipe. The next year he was ordered by the Directory to attack Bahia with insufficient forces, and was compelled to retire after a forty days' siege. Two years later, however, his fleet defeated and nearly destroyed the largest naval force Spain had sent out since the Invincible Armada. Of the 6,000 soldiers on board who had been expected to drive him from Brazil, only 1,000 were landed, away north of Cape San Roque, whence they barely managed to reach Bahia after a march of over a thousand miles through the wilderness, suffering the most frightful hardships. Maurice followed up this victory by occupying Sergipe in 1640 and Maranao in 1641. Serra had fallen into his hands in 1637. The whole of Brazil from the third to the twelfth degree of latitude, a solid body of territory containing more than two-thirds of the population and developed resources, was apparently irretrievably lost to the Portuguese. They only retained Bahia and the isolated settlements in Pará and in the southern provinces. In internal administration, Morris was equally vigorous. He suppressed the exactions of Dutch soldiers and functionaries, and established law, order, and justice. Agriculture, industry, and commerce flourished as never before. He found Recife a miserable port village, and left it a city of two thousand houses. He does not seem to have made any especial exertions to secure Dutch immigration. The Brazilians were not displaced as landed proprietors, and most of the plantations confiscated from the persistently rebellious were resold to Brazilians who accepted the Dutch rule. He permitted to Romanists and Jews the free and public exercise of their faith. Many Jews came to Pernambuco, and with their characteristic capacity soon became prominent and useful in the commercial life of the colony. The courts were so organized as to secure representation for Brazilians. He summoned a sort of legislature of the principal colonists, the first representative assembly on South American soil, and put into effect the measures it proposed. Local administration was entrusted to Brazilians, and his aim was evidently to make the colony self-governing. But this positivist of the 17th century, this genial pagan who had caught the essential spirit of the Renaissance and had the courage to put it into practice centuries before it became dominant even in the realm of thought, was too far in advance of his time. His countrymen could not understand him or his ideas, and the Portuguese colonists were equally incapable of appreciating what he was trying to do for them. His edifice scattered like a card house the moment he left. To all appearances, every vestige of his work was swept away. It is only a memory and an example, a wave that dashed far up the beach at the beginning of the flood tide, leaving a mark that long served only to show how far the water had once come. It remained for the nineteenth century and another nation of shopmen to put into practice, on a scale large enough to convince the world, the great principle of non-interference by the central government with the religious beliefs and the local self-government of colonies. The moneyed aristocrats of the West India Company distrusted Morris as a member of a reigning family which was maintained in power by its popularity with the masses. The directory wanted immediate profits, not an empire established on a broad and sure foundation. 
in their hearts they preferred a steward and book keeper to a prince and a statesman. The Calvinist clergy bitterly complained of the liberties conceded their Catholic competitors for tithes, and succeeded in imposing on Morris the execution of the prohibition against religious processions, then as now so near to the Brazilian heart. Spies were sent out to report on him, and he was continually hampered. Among the Brazilians he was equally misunderstood, while personally so popular that no one of their chroniclers had a word of dispraise for him, they could not forget that he was of a different race and religion, and he did not succeed in converting them to his ideas. His best personal friends were among those most influential, after his departure, in stirring up the exclusive Brazilian feeling. Morris was not a man to be easily daunted. For seven years he remained in office, fighting the directory, the Calvinist ministers, the corrupt officials, trying to reconcile the jealousies between Dutchmen and Brazilians, and to create a homogeneous community. But after the power of the Nassau family began to decline, with the rise of the Witt oligarchy, the directory determined to be rid of him. In 1644 he made a vigorous demand for more troops, and when it was refused, sent in a Bismarckian resignation, which, to his surprise, was immediately accepted, with many polite protestations of thanks for his services. End of section 31section thirty two of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Piotr Natter. part four brazil chapter nine expulsion of the dutch four years before maurice's retirement portugal broke loose from spain and that part of brazil which had escaped conquest by the dutch promptly threw off the spanish yoke in Europe, Holland and the new Portugal were naturally in alliance, but the former was not magnanimous enough to stop her aggressions in Brazil, and the latter was too weak to resent them. Among the Brazilians, dissatisfaction began to brew as soon as Morris left. The prohibition of religious processions, the severe financial crisis among planters who were unable to pay off the heavy mortgages which they had given when they purchased confiscated plantations, the low price of sugar and the impulse to national feeling given by the news of the success of the mother country in achieving independence all cooperated the opportunity brought forth the men the head of the rebellion was john fernandez vieira who is the great creator of the brazilian nationality a native of madeira he ran away as a boy to seek his fortune in brazil engaged at first in menial employments his honesty and capacity soon enabled him to strike out for himself as a sugar planter. When the Dutch attacked Pernambuco in 1630, he took up arms and only surrendered when Bom Jesus fell. Convinced that further resistance was useless, he returned to his business, and within ten years was the richest man in the colony. Though a devoted Catholic and a patriotic Portuguese, he was one of Maurice's most trusted advisers. When the prince departed, John Fernandez thenceforth devoted his life to the expulsion of the Dutch. The first revolt occurred in Maranhão, where the small Dutch garrison had to abandon that captaincy as early as 1644. In Pernambuco, John Fernandez organized a formidable conspiracy, and letters were dispatched to the new Portuguese king asking his aid. John IV did not dare to comply openly, for such action might have involved him in a war with the States General, but the Governor-General at Bahia was as unscrupulous as he was patriotic, and secretly afforded the conspirators every facility in his power. The celebrated chiefs of the guerrilla fighting of 1630 to 1635, Vidal, Camarrao, and Diaz, were only too anxious to have another chance, and gathered their bands in the wilderness. Arms were obtained from Bahia, and in 1645 the insurrection broke out. The first move was to have been the massacre of the principal Hollanders, but the plot was discovered, and the conspirators fled for their lives to the interior. At a place called Tabocas, John Fernandez gathered a motley crew of a few hundred together. Only three hundred of his followers had muskets, but they were protected by marshy ground in front, and the hill was surrounded by almost impenetrable cane-breaks. 
There, on the 3rd August, the Dutch troops, to the number of a thousand, found and attacked the Brazilians. The bulk of the population was standing aloof, his camp was full of mutiny. Nevertheless, John Fernandez stood firm. The Dutch charged confidently, but they could not use their firearms to advantage, and the Brazilians showed the traditional valour of their race in the use of pike and sword. The Dutch were not able to dislodge the rebels, and after losing 370 men they retreated to Pernambuco, leaving the insurgents with all the moral prestige of victory. The whole province rose. The troops, which had come from Bahia ostensibly to aid the Dutch in pacifying the province, went over en masse to the patriots. The Dutch garrisons in the outlying towns were everywhere attacked and everywhere retreated. A few grudgingly paid mercenaries were not the material with which to defend such an empire. Within a few months the Dutch were expelled from the interior and shut themselves up in the fortified seaports waiting for reinforcements. The Indians and guerillas spread fire and destruction through Itamarica, Paraiba, Rio Grande do Norte, and Ceará. In spite of this sudden success, the position of the patriots was very critical. Without the aid of regular troops, they could hardly hope to make head against the Dutch so soon as the latter received adequate reinforcements. The news of the insurrection aroused great indignation in Holland. The house of the Portuguese ambassador was surrounded by an infuriated mob, and his government had to disavow the rebellion. Willing as John the Fourth might be to help the Brazilians, he dare not. By the middle of 1646, an able commander, von Schopke, arrived from Holland with a fine army. At first, John Fernandez and the militia did not dare meet him in the field. The provincials hovered about the Dutch columns, cutting off detachments and burning sugar plantations in the line of march. John Fernandez set the example by ordering the destruction of his own property. In 1647, Barreto de Menenses, an able professional soldier, arrived in Brazil bearing a secret commission from the Portuguese king. The bickering and despairing provincials made no difficulty about recognizing it and Barreto at once began uniting the scattered militia bands and the few regulars who had clandestinely come up from Bahia. A few miles south of Pernambuco, the low hills encroach on the coast plain, leaving only a narrow pass between themselves and the marshes. Shopke made a sortie along the coast road with the largest part of his force, about 4,000 men, and there, at the hills of Guararapes, found the Patriot Army, numbering 2,200. Encamped across the level ground, they barred his way, with the evident intention of giving him battle, and there, on the 18th of August, 1648, was fought out the question whether Brazil should be Dutch or Portuguese. The defeat of the Patriots would have meant the hopeless collapse of the rebellion and the giving up by poor little Portugal of the last vestige of her claim to Brazil. Success meant that they might prolong the war for years and finally tire out Holland, or give the Portuguese government a chance to do something by negotiation. The battle began with the Dutch taking possession of the higher ground whence their artillery inflicted some damage, but when they charged down the hill, attempting to outflank and surround the Brazilians, there ensued a confused and desperate struggle with cold steel. The regulars proved no match for these farmers who were fighting for their homes and religion. The Dutch battalions broke and fled up the hill, followed by the Brazilians. Then the Dutch reserve came into action and the battle rolled back to the low ground, where the result was decided face to face and man to man. Some of the braver of the Dutch imprudently went through the Brazilian lines into the marshes, where they suffered terrible slaughter at the hands of the reserve. More than a thousand Hollanders perished, with seventy-four officers. Thirty-three standards remained in the hands of the Brazilians, and the remnants of the Dutch army fled to the shelter of the walls of Pernambuco. The cowardice shown by many of his troops is the only excuse offered by the Dutch general for this shameful defeat suffered at the hands of a militia inferior not only in equipment and artillery but in numbers and advantage of position the descendants of the victors at guararapes have never forgotten that it was a brazilian and not the portuguese triumph 
the Brazilians proved to their own satisfaction that their resources were sufficient to defend their institutions, and it has been well said that on that day the Brazilian nation was born. The parsimonious merchants, whose money was invested in the company, made a half-hearted effort to retrieve this unexpected reverse, but reinforcements were sent out so grudgingly that a similar sortie next year was even more overwhelmingly defeated at the very same place. Even then the Brazilian hopes of ultimate success would have been small if at this very juncture the world power of Holland had not received its first great check by the breaking out of the war with Oliver Cromwell. With English fleets sweeping the North Sea and Blake's cannon thundering at the Texel, the States-General had no forces to spare on faraway Brazil. The Patriots kept the Dutch shut up in Pernambuco and were undisputed masters of the rest of the province. So long as communication by sea remained open, the Dutch, however, could maintain themselves indefinitely. Reinforcements might come at any time from Holland, and the negotiations by Portugal were uncertain, and might indeed lead to Brazil's being exchanged for an advantage elsewhere. John Fernandez steadfastly maintained the siege, urging his followers not to lay down their arms so long as a Dutchman remained in Brazil. The pusillanimous Portuguese king did not dare help the Pernambucanos, and neither was he honest enough to abide by the treaties he had made with Holland, giving up the claim to North Brazil. Matters remained in this anomalous position until 1654, when John Fernandez, by a single audacious stroke, cut through the tangle made by complicated and timid European diplomacy. In the fall of 1653, the annual Bahia fleet sailed from the Tagus, convoyed by powerful men of war. The Dutch had no naval force on the South American coast able to cope with it. When the Portuguese fleet hove in sight of Pernambuco, the Brazilian commanders, from their fortified besieging camp just to the south of the city, entered into communication with the admiral. John Fernandez begged the latter to lend him some cannon for a few days, and meanwhile to blockade the port. The patriot leader saw that the isolated garrison of mercenaries would have no heart to hold out for long. The Portuguese admiral refused, saying, truly enough, that he had no instructions to aid the insurgent Brazilians, and that he did not care to risk his head by precipitating a war between Portugal and Holland. Fernandez answered that with or without his aid the assault would be made, and the admiral yielded to his natural feelings and lent the Brazilians some big guns. John Fernandez planted them where they commanded an outlying fort he knew to be vital to the city's defences. Shopke was compelled to retire within the central city. The Brazilians made successful night assaults on several positions and drew their lines closer and closer until the place was untenable. On the 26th of January, 1655, the Dutch general signed a capitulation, surrendering not only Pernambuco, but all the other places held by the Dutch in Brazil. His 1,200 troops were given safe passage home, and all resident Hollanders were allowed three months to settle their affairs before leaving. Thus ended the Dutch dominion in Brazil. Four provinces, three cities, eight towns, 14 fortified places, and 300 leagues of coast were definitely restored to the Portuguese crown. A gigantic commercial speculation had failed before the obstinate resistance of a few farmers animated by a love of country and religion. Twenty-five years of bloody warfare or sulky acquiescence in alien rule had welded the Portuguese colonists along the Brazilian coast into a nation. Directly from the Dutch they had learned little or nothing. Rather were the trades which have ever since been the cause of Brazil's industrial backwardness intensified. The characteristics of the leaders in the Pernambuco War of Independence epitomize the races of Brazil. Vidal is the type of a high-class Brazilian, generous, jealous, spendthrift, proud, intelligent, quick at expedients, and not too scrupulous in his use of them. Camarrao, the Indian, perished before the final victory as if to show symbolically that his race had not the stamina to hold out in competition with white or black. Diaz represents the Negro, unsurpassable in fidelity and personal courage, and needing only leadership to show transcendent military qualities. 
John Fernandez was a curious mixture of the medieval and modern. His wealth did not make him cautious where his country was concerned. He had been honoured with the intimate confidence of those whom he fought. He was grave, silent, reserved, strongest when others were most discouraged. No feeling of vanity ever interfered with his purposes. If another man could do a piece of work better than he, he stepped aside. When success was in sight, he imperturbably let showier men have the glory. Religious faith and feudal loyalty were the mainsprings of his nature. Nevertheless, in war he was cautious, indefatigable, and calculating. In crises he struck like a sledgehammer, though he could wait patiently and uncomplainingly for an opportunity. His was not a pride that disdains artifices. He conspired secretly and subtly, and with all his apparent moderation of character he blindly and unreasoningly hated everything Protestant and non-Portuguese. On the hill at Tabocas his battle cry was, quote, Portuguese, at the heretics, God is with us, end quote. When the Dutch made their last desperate charge, and it seemed as if all was up with his band of insurgents, he refused to flee, but stood beside the crucifix, calling on the Virgin and the saints, and exhorting his companions to die rather than yield to the unbelievers. When the Dutch gave back, he fell on his knees and intoned a hymn. With every new victory gained, he vowed a church to the Virgin. When desperate over the hesitation of the admiral in the last scene of the war, his final argument, made in all sincerity, was that failure to expel the Dutch meant exposing thousands of Catholics to the temptation of denying their faith by a renewal of the heretic rule, and that for himself, rather than share the responsibility for the murder of thousands of souls, he would lead his Brazilians to certain death. Relentless to his enemies, to his friends and dependents he was kindness itself. It is related that a Portuguese landed with hardly clothes enough to cover him, and seeking a protector was directed to Fernandez. The latter was mounting his horse to go on a journey. To the man's offer of allegiance and appeal for help he answered, quote, I am going to my house ten miles away, and have no leisure now to relieve you, but follow me thither on foot. If you are too weak to walk, Take this horse I am on. If you are faithful, you shall have support as long as my means hold out. If they fail, and there should be nothing else to eat, I will cut off a leg, and we will eat it together. End quote. This was said with so grave a face and severe a manner that the poor Portuguese thought he meant to repulse him. But on inquiry, he found that Fernandez rarely smiled, and that literally all that he had was at the service of his adherents. End of section 32「Chapter 10. The Seventeenth Century. In 1621, the northern provinces, Sara, Maranhão, and Pará, had been separated from the rest of Brazil and erected into an independent government called the State of Maranhão. In Sara, the cattle industry flourished. Around the beautiful Bay of Maranhão, the Azorians multiplied their colonies. Cotton, mandioc, and sugar were grown in large quantities. The cotton manufacture soon became an important industry, but the mysterious Amazon, whose entrance was guarded by the town of Pará, seemed most attractive of all. No civilized man had penetrated its length since Orellana's adventurous voyage of a century before. In 1638, Jacome Raimundo, an able Brazilian, temporarily acting as governor of Pará, determined to explore the great river. The expedition which he sent out found its way up the windings of the multitudinous channels, and after eight months reached the first Spanish settlement in the east of Ecuador. The Spanish authorities at Lima and Quito saw no particular value in a route through a territory in which no gold or silver had been discovered, and which, by the Spanish policy, could not be used for commerce. But when, two years later, Portugal regained her independence, the expedition turned out to have been of vast importance. 
the portuguese had found the practicable route into the great river valley they controlled the mouth of the stream and though the whole territory lay west of the tordesillas line spain never asserted any effective claim to it meanwhile the conquest of the great interior plateaus to the south was rapidly proceeding the wars with the dutch rather stimulated than retarded it for so long as the dutch commanded the sea the widely separated provinces were obliged to communicate by land and the indian routes became better known to brazilians settlers driven from the sugar plantations on the coast took up cattle raising in the interior of the northern provinces in the extreme south as early as sixteen thirty five the paulistas had rooted out the jesuit settlements from the whole region of the parana to the north they traversed the san francisco valley and the plateau of goyas manuel correa explored the latter region in sixteen forty seven and in sixteen seventy one another paulista domingo george penetrated with a force of subject indians into the great treeless plains which extend beyond the mountain ranges bounding the san francisco valley on the north these plains are now the state of piaui at about the same time the cattle raisers who had established themselves on the lower san francisco in bahia crossed over into the same territory of piaui within a short time the indians were reduced to submission and the cattle ranges were extended over the plains of piaui southern sahara and the adjacent provinces this great conquest completed the junction of southern and central brazil with maranhão and pará long lines of land communication were established and over them travel was more frequent than would seem likely piaui and sahara soon produced an enormous surplus of cattle whose export into other provinces brought about a revolution in the alimentation of the coast brazilians the indians along the northeast coast were gradually incorporated destroyed or pushed back though it was not until sixteen ninety nine that they were finally subdued in rio grande do norte from this time dates the astonishing development of the population of sahara who during this century have furnished nearly all the labor for the gathering of rubber in the south settlements multiplied up and down the coast from rio until nearly the whole of the present state was occupied rio and sao paulo flourished with the profits of the clandestine trade with the spanish colonies the paulistas continued to spread in every direction by sixteen fifty four they had occupied the headwaters of the paraiba and west as far as soracaba during the period just following the expulsion of the dutch the portuguese government was not able to enforce its policy of commercial exclusivism treaties with holland and england gave the citizens of those countries a right to trade with brazil and the colonists kept up their commerce with the spanish possessions municipal charters were freely granted to brazilian towns and the existing franchises reformed according to the most liberal model in portugal that of porto brazilians were relieved of the absurd feudal distinctions which exempted nobles alone from liability to torture and regulated the clothes a man might wear the extraordinary rapidity of brazil's increase in population and territory during the middle of the seventeenth century was largely due to comparative freedom from vexatious restrictions and exactions commercial and governmental by the end of the century there were three quarters of a million people in brazil a fivefold increase in seventy years in spite of the fact that the most populous provinces had been the scene of war for twenty-four years of that time but the portuguese government lost little time in returning to the old restrictive conditions since the loss of the indies brazil was portugal's principal source of wealth and aristocracy and court made the most of the unhappy colony navigation companies were chartered and given a monopoly of all commerce export and import the jesuits renewed their efforts to gain control of the indians in sao paulo they had no chance of success but in the north the celebrated padre antonio vieira one of the greatest geniuses that portugal has ever produced was given a free hand he nearly smothered the whites of maranhão and pará with a ring of missions and his successors established settlements on the amazon which finally spread so as to communicate with the spanish missions in peru bolivia and paraguay the brazilians of maranhão and pará did not object to the occupation of the valley of the amazon but they bitterly resented the jesuit encroachments in their own neighborhood in sixteen eighty four 
a rebellion finally broke out in Marañao under the leadership of Manuel Beckman. He paid the forfeit with his life, but his work had warned the Portuguese authorities that they must not push their favours to the Jesuits too far. During the long Dutch war, many Pernambucan Negroes had fled into the interior, where they had established themselves in independent communities and refused to recognize white supremacy. They fortified their villages with palisades, obtained wives by raids on the plantations, elected chiefs, devised rude forms of administering justice, and adopted a religion which was a mixture of the nature worship of their African ancestors and the outward forms of Christianity. In spite of numerous efforts to destroy them, these strange republics lasted fifty years. It was not until 1697 that a Paulista chief, Domingos Jorge, who was employed after the regulars had failed, succeeded in shutting the Negroes up in their great palisade at Palmares. Seven thousand men took part in the assault, and of the ten thousand Negroes who defended it, none were spared. This was the only serious attempt at revolt on the part of the blacks which ever occurred in Brazil, except for a few easily suppressed insurrections which mostly occurred in Bahia among the recent arrivals, the negroes remained in abject submission until nearly the end of the nineteenth century. The comparative mildness of the Brazilian treatment of negroes, the practice of voluntary manumission, and the fact that no impenetrable race barrier existed all contributed to make slavery a less fearful thing in brazil than in north america both spain and portugal claimed the coast between santos and the river plate until the treaty of tordesillas but neither nation had made any serious attempt to take possession up to the end of the seventeenth century as a matter of fact the tordesillas line passed near the southern boundary of the brazilian state of sao paulo but the portuguese maps pushed all Brazil eight degrees to the east, and Portugal claimed that the line passed near the point where the Paraná and Uruguay unite to form the plate. The Paulistas had made this claim effective over much of the disputed territory. For a century after the foundation of Buenos Aires, the Spaniards failed to occupy the north margin of the plate, and in 1680 the Portuguese forestalled them by founding a colony and fort called Colonia, directly opposite Buenos Aires. The Spanish governor promptly resented this piece of audacity and captured the place, but was compelled to restore it immediately by orders from Madrid. Louis XIV, who was then arbiter of Europe, had no mind to allow a war to be precipitated over a so insignificant a matter as a post in an uninhabited part of South America. However, the question of right to the territory was left open for future determination. Colonia at that time was chiefly valued as an entrepot for clandestine trade with the Spanish provinces, but to its existence can be traced Brazilian possession of the great states of Paraná, Santa Catarina, and Rio Grande do Sul, and even Brazil's dominance in the upper Paraná Valley, a dominance which would have been lost had Spain insisted upon the true Tordesillas line. End of section 33「the Paulistas, who scoured the interior in their slave hunts, occasionally came across indications of gold, and rumors constantly reached the coast. But for a long time the Paulistas failed, either through ignorance or design, to give sufficiently exact information. After 1670 the rumors became so circumstantial that no doubt was felt that the mountain ranges around the headwaters of San Francisco River were gold-bearing. Stimulated by government promises of liberal treatment, the Paulistas undertook the hunt in earnest. About 1680 they found the rich gold washings of Sabará, where today is one of the great mines of the world, the Morro Veio. This is 300 miles directly north of Rio. In 1693, Antonio Arzao, a Paulista, 
penetrated west from this region to the sea coast of victoria bringing with him native gold in large nuggets these were sent to portugal and created intense excitement the paulistas followed up these first discoveries by soon finding half a dozen other fields all of them yielding gold in abundance to the crudest processes a rush started that threatened to depopulate the sea coast and even portugal itself the find was the greatest gold discovery which had been made in the history of the world up to that time the one province of minas gerais produced seven million five hundred thousand ounces within the first fifty years and its total product to the present time has been twenty five million ounces the paulista discoverers of the mines soon became involved in quarrels with the swarms of adventurers who poured in from portugal the government at first did not establish any regular control over the mining region and disputes arose between the old and newcomers as to the proprietorship of the claims anarchy and civil war ensued but the foreign element nicknamed the emboabas came out on top with a strong man nunez viana at the head of the affairs he became the virtual ruler of the region and the portuguese authorities at rio seeing their prerequisites endangered tried to get rid of him by force they were unsuccessful but finally managed to seduce his followers and secure a recognition of their own paramount authority by solemn promises to concede the reasonable demands of the miners these promises were not kept though he had been induced to surrender on assurances that his life would be spared was assassinated the mining laws at first liberal were narrowed until exploration was discouraged and production oppressed for years the authorities tried to collect a fixed amount for each slave employed a provision which discouraged searches for new deposits then the system of requiring all gold to be taken to government melting houses was enforced export in dust or nuggets was forbidden and no gold was allowed in circulation except that which bore the government stamp showing it had paid the king's fifth this involved the searching of every traveller's pockets and the posting of detachments of soldiers at every crossroads so oppressive and inconvenient was this that finally the chief miners and municipal authorities agreed to be responsible for a lump sum yearly the war of the emboabas ended in seventeen o nine but troubles broke out in the mining regions from time to time down to the end of the colonial period these struggles for local self-government for the right to exist were not confined to minas in various forms and at various times they were repeated in most of the provinces and a strong belief in local autonomy never died out though for long periods it was apparently crushed out of existence simultaneously with the overthrow of the semi-independent government of minas which had been set up by the emboabas a civil war broke out in the old province of pernambuco this was a struggle of the oligarchy of native brazilian sugar planters against the rigorous and corrupt rule of the royal governors and against the encroachments of the newly arrived portuguese then as now foreigners conducted the trade of brazil the brazilian aristocrats remained on their plantations disdaining the small economies and anxieties of commerce the portuguese were the peddlers shopkeepers money-lenders for the community as well as the officials of the government in both capacities they pressed hard on the extravagant brazilians olinda the old capital was the headquarters of the latter recife three miles south was the port and chiefly inhabited by native portuguese it had outrun olinda during the dutch occupation but was legally only an administrative dependency of the older and smaller town in seventeen o nine the portuguese government made recife a separate town a step which was bitterly resented by the brazilians and especially by the close corporation of native families who controlled the olinda municipal government hostilities broke out between them and the governor two thousand pernambucanos invaded recife the troops deserted and the governor fled for his life while the royal charter to recife was torn to bits by the mob the heads of the insurrection met to determine what form of government should be adopted bernardo vieira the best soldier in the colony proposed that a republic should be founded on the plan of venice probably the first time a republic was ever advocated on american soil 
the proposition met with much favour but the conservatives shrank from so radical a departure the bishop was made acting governor but his hand proved not firm enough to control the divergent interests and ambitions the portuguese mascates they were called revolted in their turn and drove him from recife the pernambucanos besieged the place but the loss of the seaport was a heavy blow the olinda oligarchy was not able to secure the cooperation of the smaller municipalities and civil war spread throughout the province when a new governor appeared with a commission from the king he had little difficulty by promises of fair treatment in inducing all parties to lay down their arms no sooner however was he safely in power then he imprisoned and banished the chiefs of the revolt especially selecting those who had favoured an independent republic all three great revolts beckmans in maranao that of the emboabas in minas and the olinda rebellion in seventeen ten followed substantially the same course local feeling was strong enough to sweep all before it for a time but lack of capacity for organization intestine quarrels want of persistency soon enabled the portuguese officials to re-establish themselves more firmly than ever meanwhile portugal had become involved in the war of the spanish succession colonia was again captured by the spanish of buenos aires and though it was restored at the end of the war its trade was never so prosperous afterwards in the upper amazon spanish jesuits had come down from quito but the portuguese expelled them thereby confirming portugal's title as far as the foothills of the andes the spaniards of the eighteenth century no more than the peruvians and bolivians of the nineteenth were able to cope with the difficulties of transit from the pacific side of the mountains portugal's effective possession reached to the seventeenth meridian from greenwich sixteen hundred miles west of the tordesillas line rio was the only important brazilian port which had escaped attack by hostile fleet during the preceding century and the discovery of the gold mines gave a tremendous impetus to its prosperity and wealth the only gateway to the mining territory its population of over twelve thousand was soon one of the richest and busiest in all america the opportunity was too tempting to be neglected by the french price hunters a daring frenchman named duclerc appeared before the city in seventeen ten but seeing that he had not ships strong enough to force the entrance landed with a thousand marines forty miles down the coast they met with no resistance in their march through the woods and arrived back of the city without loss thence they proceeded coolly to charge into the narrow streets in the face of the artillery fire from the hilltop forts that surround the city the audacious enterprise was very nearly successful the portuguese regulars offered no effective resistance and the main body of the french penetrated to the very centre of the city there they were checked by a little party of students who had climbed into the governor's palace and were firing out of the windows the french finally took the palace by assault but meanwhile the city had risen before them their scattered detachments were massacred in detail and the main body in the palace had to surrender at discretion the portuguese sullied their victory by acts of medieval cruelty killing most of the prisoners the victims did not long remain unavenged as soon as the news reached france admiral du gaitouin one of the ablest seamen his nation had produced volunteered to lead an expedition to rio wealthy merchants of san malo supplied the money and in june seventeen eleven he sailed with seven line of battleships six frigates and four smaller vessels manned by five thousand picked men secretly as the expedition had been dispatched the portuguese had received warning the garrison had been reinforced and the narrow-mouthed harbour and hill-commanded city were defended by three forts and eleven batteries besides four ships of the line and four frigates favoured by a foggy morning he ran boldly in suffering little loss of the portuguese men-of-war not one escaped fort villegagnon was blown up by the mismanagement of its garrison the portuguese became demoralized Toulon put a battery on an unoccupied island within cannon shot of the city and disembarked troops to the left of the town where a range of hills made it easy to dominate the low ground 
The poor governor knew no better tactics than to let the French enter the streets and then overpower them in fighting from house to house. But Toulon was too old a soldier to be caught like his fellow countrymen the year before. He coolly advanced his batteries and soon had the town commanded on three sides. It was only a question of getting his cannon into position when he could batter the place at his leisure. Panic extended from the citizens to the soldiers, and a week after the French had entered the harbour, the governor fled ignominiously to the interior, and the French took possession unopposed. Revenge and plunder had been the object of the expedition. It would have been very difficult for the French to have remained in permanent possession of the city, and the conquest of the interior, with its large population and mountainous character, was not to be thought of. The city was admitted to ransom on giving up the surviving prisoners of the Duclair expedition. Duguay Trouin sailed triumphantly back to France with a treasure which netted the Norman merchants who had fitted him out 92% on their investment, in spite of the wrecking of the biggest ship on the homeward voyage. End of section 34「Section 35 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 12. The 18th Century. Montevideo was founded in 1726, and became the nucleus of the Spanish settlements which have grown into the mother country of Uruguay. Except Colonia, the only Portuguese settlements south of the 25th degree were the towns of Santa Catarina Island, the unimportant village of Laguna on the coast plains, and the scattered ranches of a few adventurous Paulistas on the plateau. The founding of Montevideo drew the serious attention of the Rio government to the valuable country between the Plate and Santa Catarina. The Paulistas had thoroughly explored the plains and found them swarming with cattle. The chief obstacle to the foundation of a military post as a nucleus for the settlement of Rio Grande and eastern Uruguay was the lack of a harbour on that sandy coast. When the next European war broke out, in 1735, the Spaniards again besieged Colonia and established forts and settlements along the Uruguayan coast, from Montevideo to the present Brazilian border. In 1737, the Portuguese authorities sent an expedition to take Montevideo, which failed. On the way back, the Portuguese built a little fort at the only entrance, which gives access to the great series of lagoons which run parallel to the coast for 250 miles north of the southern Brazilian frontier. This is the site of the present city of Rio Grande do Sul. A few years later, a considerable number of settlers from the Azores Islands were introduced, who engaged in agriculture along the fertile borders of the Great Duck Lagoon. In 1750, Spain and Portugal made an attempt to reach an amicable and rational agreement about their South American boundaries. Up to that time, Spain had stubbornly claimed the territory as far north and south as Santos, and Portugal was even more unreasonable in asserting her exclusive right to the coast as far south and west as the mouth of the Uruguay. The Treaty of 1750 virtually recognized the Usipacidetis, Portugal agreed to give up Colonia, and the boundary to her possessions and those of Spain was drawn between the Spanish settlements in Uruguay and the Portuguese settlements in Rio Grande. The seven Jesuit missions in the interior, 200 miles to the south, were abandoned by the Spanish government. Spain deliberately ceded these tens of thousands of peaceful and prosperous civilized Indians, and even agreed that her troops should assist the Portuguese in the cruel dispossession. The Indians fought desperately and unavailingly. But this iniquitous provision of the treaty was the only part of it which was ever carried into effect. Spanish public opinion protested. The boundary commissions could not agree. Portugal put off the surrender of Colonia on one pretext or another. And in 1761 the treaty fell to the ground and all the questions were left open. That year Spain and Portugal became embroiled on opposite sides in the Seven Years' War and the Spaniards from Buenos Aires invaded the disputed territory in overwhelming force. Colonia was taken, and in 1763 the Spanish government led his army against the Portuguese settlements in Rio Grande. The fortified town of Rio Grande fell. The superior Argentine cavalry drove the Rio Grandenses back to the coast, and the Portuguese territory was reduced to the northeast quarter of the state. 
the flourishing farms of the Azorian settlers were laid waste, and from this invasion dates the adoption by the Rio Grandenses of pastoral habits. The Treaty of Paris put an end to the war in Europe. The Spaniards ceased their advance, they restored Colonia once more, but retained their conquests in southern Rio Grande. The Rio Grandenses made good use of the breathing spell. They cared little whether there was peace or war in Europe, and four years later made a desperate effort to recapture their old capital and regain their farms in the south. Disavowed by their government, they still kept on fighting. Soon they made a regular business of raiding the territory occupied by the Spaniards. The beef they found on the plains was their food. They were always in the saddle, and soon became the finest of irregular cavalry and partisan fighters. The Spaniards retaliated by invading northern Rio Grande, but never succeeded in routing the Rio Grandenses from their last strongholds. In 1775 the Brazilians were reinforced from São Paulo and Rio, and took the aggressive, and the following year recaptured the city of Rio Grande. The Spanish government took prompt steps to avenge this loss. A great fleet was sent out, Santa Catarina was captured, an army of 4,000 men was on the march up from Montevideo to sweep the Portuguese out of all southern Brazil once and for all. But in this crisis, European politics again saved Brazil from dismemberment. France and Spain were forming a coalition against England in the War of American Independence. Spain wished to have their hands free and to isolate England. The Spanish fleet and army were at the gates of Rio Grande, where the Treaty of San Ildefonso was signed in 1777. The Portuguese definitely relinquished Colonia. Uruguay and the seven missions remained Spanish, but most of the southern Rio Grande, which the Portuguese had lost in 1763, as well as Santa Catarina, was restored to them. The thirty-four years of peace which followed in Rio Grande were employed in steady growth. A craze for cattle-raising set in, and the plains were divided up into great estancias, which were distributed among the governor's favorites, or those who had distinguished themselves during the war. Substantially, the entire population engaged in the cattle business. The Rio Grandenses and their cattle multiplied so rapidly that they spread out over the western part of the state, which was still Spanish, and to the south. In 1780, the curing of beef by drying and salting was introduced, which permitted its shipment and afforded a stable market. After the great gold discoveries in Minas, during the late years of the 17th and early years of the 18th centuries, the prospectors ranged north from Sabara along the great Backbone Mountains, finding washings at many places in North Minas and Bahia. By 1740, the fields in Bahia were producing 50 to 100,000 ounces a year. As early as 1718, an expedition had penetrated 1,500 miles to the west and discovered good placers on the plateau where the headwaters of the Madeira and the Paraguay intertwine. This was the beginning of Cuyaba and the state of Mato Grosso. In ten years, a million five hundred thousand ounces were taken out from these diggings. A little later, still other fields were discovered further west on the Madeira watershed. The miners at the gold camp of Tijuca in North Minas had noticed some curious little shining stones in the bottom of their pans and thought them so pretty that they used them for counters in games. Soon a wandering friar who had been in India recognized them as diamonds. This occurred in 1729, and the field thus opened up supplied the world with diamonds until the discovery of Kimberley. In the years from 1730 to 1770, five million carats were taken from the original Diamantina district, and the deposits are still second in productiveness only to those of South Africa. The diamond region was at once declared crown property, and a deadline drawn around it, which none except officials were allowed to cross. In 1716, an exploring expedition ascended the Madeira, and in the years following, the Tocantins, the Araguaya, the Rio Negro, and the principal tributaries of the upper Amazon were navigated. The Jesuit settlements in the Amazon Valley continued to flourish. While the interior and the south were expanding rapidly, the coast provinces were relatively declining. The growing competition of the West Indies reduced the price of sugar. 
During the seventeenth century Brazil had furnished the bulk of European sugar consumption, selling her product at non competitive prices, but the growth of the English and Dutch colonial empires brought into the field competitors who possessed as good a climate and soil, and enjoyed the inestimable advantage of better government. Portugal's vicious and narrow-minded colonial system was not changed until Brazil's competitors had so far passed her that she has never since been able to make up lost ground. The wealth from mines and taxes that Brazil poured into the Portuguese treasury was squandered by the dissipated bigot John V. When he died in 1750, he left Portugal in a bad way and though Brazil had managed to grow in spite of mismanagement, the outlook was discouraging. The Spaniards were threatening the new settlements in the south, Sao Paulo had been depopulated by the migration to the mines, Bahias and Pernambuco's sugar and tobacco industries were decadent, in Ceará and Piauí the golden days of the cattle business had passed, Maranhão and Pará had stopped short in their development, and their spread into the interior had been cut off by the Jesuits. Contemporary documents prove the horrible corruption. From ministers of state down to the humblest subordinate, every official had his share in the pickings. The farmers of the revenues openly paid bribes and might exact what they pleased from the taxpayers. All trade except that with Portugal was forbidden, and this was hampered in a hundred ways. Salt, wine, soap, rum, tobacco, olive oil, and hides were monopolies. All legal transactions were burdened with heavy fees. Slaves paid so much ahead. Every river or a road was the occasion for a new toll. The exercise of professions and trades was forbidden, except on the payment of heavy fees. Anything that could compete with Portugal was prohibited altogether. Taxation shut off industrial enterprise at its very sources and many of the worst features of the system then put in vogue have never been discontinued. The governors and military commanders interfered constantly with the administration of justice in favor of their friends and favorites. They accepted bribes for allowing contraband trade and permitting the immigration of foreigners. They misappropriated the funds of widows and orphans. They ignored the franchises of municipalities. They imposed unauthorized taxes. They forced loans from suitors having claims before them, they obliged free men to work without pay, they forcibly took wives away from their husbands, they impressed the young men for the wars on the Spanish border, required every able-bodied man to serve in the militia, and commonly practiced arbitrary imprisonment. How even one of the best of them interfered to regulate private affairs can best be shown by his own words. Quote, I promoted the good of the people by forcibly compelling them to plant maize and poles, and threatening to take away their lands altogether if they did not cultivate them diligently. I required the militia colonels to make exact reports about this matter, and thus brought about a great increase in the production of food crops and sugar. I called the militia together for exercise on Sundays and holidays, days which otherwise the people would have spent in idleness and pleasure. Many have complained, but I have never given their complaints the slightest attention, having always followed the system of taking no notice whatever of the people's murmurs. End quote. He describes the Brazilians as vain, but indolent and easily subdued, robust and supporting labor well, but inclined to an inaction, from which only extreme poverty or the command of their superiors could rouse them. They had no education, for the only schools were a few Jesuit seminaries, and no printing press existed. They were licentious, had no aristocracy, were unaccustomed to social subordination, and would obey no authority except the military. Underneath the surface fermented a deep disgust. Even in the seaports the very name of government was hated, and in the interior the people withdrew themselves as much as possible from contact or participation with it. A dull hatred of Portugal and Portuguese spread all classes of natives. In much of the country, the only law was the patriarchal influence of the heads of the landed families, who often exercised power of life and death. Instances are on record where fathers ordered their sons to kill their own sisters when the latter had dishonored the family name. 
With the death of John V in 1750, the great Marquis of Pombal became Prime Minister. The enormous energy and activity of this remarkable man revolutionized the administration of Portugal and Brazil. Official corruption was severely punished, order replaced confusion, agricultural, industry and commerce were protected and encouraged. In spite of the threatened exhaustion of the placers, mining flourished. Maranhão and Pará took a new start. The worst monopolies were abolished. The price of sugar rose with the great colonial wars and the adoption of reasonable regulations. Wealth and revenues increased apace, and peace and security were self-guarded. When Pombal fell, after 27 years in power, Brazil's population had risen to two millions, Rio was a city of 50,000, and the capital had been transferred there. Bahia had 40,000, Minas contained 400,000 people. The yield of gold was 400,000 carats yearly, and the diamond production 150,000 carats. And finally, Santa Catarina and Rio Grande had been saved from the Spaniards and settled. Pombal made short work of the Jesuits. In 1755 he took away their rights over their Indians, and four years later issued an order for their immediate and unconditional expulsion and the confiscation of their property. Pombal had no favorites. He spared no individuals and no classes in his work of ruthlessly concentrating all power in the crown. But he built a Frankenstein, of which he himself was the helpless victim the moment his old master died. Unwittingly he prepared the way for the triumph of the ideas of the French Revolution both in Portugal and Brazil, and his most beneficent measures were the most fatal to the permanence of his despotic system. Commercial prosperity gave the Brazilian people resources. The impartial administration of law gave them some conception of civic pride and independence. The encouragement of education, small as it was, helped start the intellectual movement which spread over the wilds of Brazil and liberal principle then fermenting in Europe. Immediately upon his fall in 1777, the Portuguese government reverted to most of the old abuses, but the economic impulse did not at once die out. Pombal had not only expelled the Jesuits, but had taken effective measures against enslaving the Indians. The latter separated themselves from the whites, and miscegenation largely decreased. On the other hand, the importation of Negro slaves had been continued on a large scale throughout the 18th century, and the proportion of blacks in the mining and sugar districts had increased. Intermixture with Negroes was stimulated by the seclusion of the white women. The young men often took mistresses from among the slaves, and these unions sometimes subsisted after legitimate marriage. The system of double menages, however, decreased as manners became more liberal, and opportunities for social intercourse between the sexes increased. The more energetic Brazilians acquired the rudiments of learning in the Jesuit schools, and a few fortunate youths were sent to the university at Coimbra in Portugal. In the early decades of the 18th century, societies for the discussion of literacy and scientific questions were established in Rio and Bahia. In the centers of population, little groups of scholars began to gather who surreptitiously obtained the writings of French and English political philosophers. Suddenly, in the latter half of the century, a dazzling literacy outburst occurred. Its seat was not in Rio, the political, nor Bahia, the ecclesiastical capital, nor yet in Pernambuco, the cradle of the nationality, but in Ouro Preto, the chief place of the mining province of Minas, twenty days' journey on muleback from the coast, and among a rude and unlettered population. Within a few years appeared six of the foremost poets of the Portuguese language. The lyrics, Gonzaga, Claudio, Silva Alvanegro, and Alvarengo Peixoto, and the epics, Basilio de Gama and Santa Rita Durao, he who writes the songs of a people rather records their history than influences it. The writings of the Minas lyric poets are the best documents extant on the character of the Brazilians of the colonial period. They clearly reveal that culture was only at its beginnings, that patriotism and national pride were indefinite and shadowy, that religion was neither dogmatic nor absorbing that polite society had not come into being, and that the intellectual element entered little into the relations of the sexes. 
The independence of the United States suggested to a few Brazilians the possibility of freeing their country from Portugal. In 1785 a dozen Brazilian students at Coimbra formed a club for this purpose, and one of them wrote to Thomas Jefferson, then minister to France, asking American aid. Jefferson was interested, but answered that nothing could be done until the Brazilians themselves had risen in arms. A like impulse was working in the minds of the poets and their friends at Ouro Preto. A childlike conspiracy was formed whose object was to found a republic with San John del Rey as capital and Ouro Preto as the seat of a university. A few practical men listened to the plans of the conspirators, probably with a view of turning a disturbance to account in preventing the government from putting into effect an obnoxious gold tax then being threatened. Among those led into the inner circle was a young sergeant named Tiradentes. He undertook the task of fomenting an uprising among the troops, but before anything practical had been done, the whole thing had been given away to the authorities. The conspirators were arrested and taken to Rio, where the frightened governor instituted a formal and elaborate trial, and took a fearful vengeance upon the helpless boys and poets. Poor Tiradentes, being without powerful connections, was hanged and quartered. His memory is now revered in Brazil as that of the first martyr to independence and the precursor of the Republic. The gentle Claudio hanged himself in prison after having been tortured into a confession implicating his friends. Gonzaga and Alvarengo, with several others, were banished to Africa. Republican and separatist ideas had, however, made no headway among the Brazilian masses. Brazil's independence was to come by the force of circumstances, and not by any deliberate national effort, and for a republic she was destined to wait a century more. End of section 35Section 36 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 13. The Portuguese Court in Rio. The political development of colonial Brazil may be divided into three epochs. First, there was the confusion of early colonization, the unsuccessful attempt to establish a system of feudal captaincies, the struggle against the Indians, French, and Jesuits, and the search for a solid economic foundation for the new Commonwealth. On the whole, this era contained the promise of the ultimate development of a freer governmental system than that of Portugal. Next followed the Spanish dynasty and the wars against the Dutch. Control of Brazil by the home government was weakened, and the colonists learned their own military power. The years following the expulsion of the Dutch, 1655 to 1700, were the brightest politically in Brazil's colonial history. The municipalities, governed by local oligarchies of landowners, exercised functions not contemplated by the Portuguese code. Though the military governors were continually encroaching, and the system was imperfect, it was in essence thoroughly local. Its fundamental defect was the want of cooperation between the towns. The third period began with the consolidation of Portugal's international position in the closing years of the 17th century. Once secure from foreign attacks, she renewed the exploitation of Brazil with redoubled eagerness. The discovery of the mines made the plunder enormous. At first there were resistance, and even formidable rebellions, like Beckmans in Maranhão, of the Mascates in Pernambuco, or of the Emboabas in Minas. But the civic vitality of the people was not great enough to sustain any continuous and effective opposition. Early in the 18th century, the municipalities were already at the mercy of the military governors, and Brazil was governed partly by petty despots and partly by numerous feeble local bodies who were without cohesion or power to resist interference. Brazil would have remained a dependency of Portugal during an indefinite period had it not been for a series of events which arose in Europe out of the French Revolution. By 1807 England was the only power which still defied Napoleon. Portugal had been Great Britain's ally for a century, but Napoleon found it necessary to have command of Lisbon and Porto in order to enforce his Berlin and Milan decrees he peremptorily commanded Portugal to give up her English alliance. 
The pusillanimous John, who had been Prince Regent since the insanity of his mother in 1792, hesitated and shuffled, seeking to put off the Emperor with negotiations and evasions and a show of hostility to England. A single dispatch indicating his double dealing was enough for Napoleon, who promptly made an agreement with Spain for the division of Portugal, and ordered Ginot to march on Lisbon. The people were ready to make a desperate resistance, but their king was in two minds each day, and the army had been withdrawn from the frontier to bid the British fleet a hypocritical defiance. John shed tears over his unhappy country, but prepared to save his own person by a flight to Rio. Ginot had passed the frontier and was advancing on Lisbon by forced marches. The Prince Regent and his court huddled their movable property on board the men of war lying in the Tagus. Fifteen thousand persons, including most of the nobility, and fifty million of property and treasure were embarked. Ginot's advance guard arrived at the mouth of the river on the 27th of November, 1807, in time to see the fleet just outside and bearing south under British convoy. Six weeks later, the exiles caught sight of the coast of Brazil destined thereafter to be the principal seat of the Portuguese race. The Prince Regent disembarked at Bahia, where the people received him with enthusiastic demonstrations of loyalty and tried desperately hard to induce him to make their city his capital. He adhered to the original plan, and on the 7th of March, 1808, arrived at Rio, where he was received with equal cordiality. No conditions were imposed on the helpless fugitives. The first acts of the Prince Regent proved that the removal would be of inestimable advantage to Brazil. He promulgated a decree opening the five great ports to the commerce of all friendly nations. The system of seclusion and monopolies fell to the ground at a single blow. Other decrees removed the prohibitions on manufacturing and on trades. Foreigners were allowed to come to Brazil either for travel or residence and were guaranteed personal and property rights. A national bank was established, commercial corporations were given franchises, a printing press was set up, military and naval schools and a medical college were founded. Foreigners were encouraged to immigrate, and that improvement in art, industries, civilization and manners began, which can only result from the daily contact of different types of humanity. For the first time Brazil was opened to scientific investigation, and scholars, engineers and artists were imported to aid in making its resources known. The commercial nations lost no time in trying to get a foothold in this virgin market. They sent their consuls and seamen, and within a few months importations, principally from Great Britain, far exceeded any possible demand. The Prince Regent found his South American empire divided into eighteen provinces. These constitute the present states of the Brazilian Union, the only changes having been the separation of Alagoas from Pernambuco and of Paraná from São Paulo, besides the erection of the city of Rio into a neutral district. Of the three millions of people, one-third were Negro slaves, and the free Negroes and mulattoes numbered as many more. The proportion of whites in the whole country was not more than a fourth, and in the larger coast cities, in the sugar districts, and in the mining regions, it descended to a seventh and even a tenth. Civilized Indians were most numerous in Pará and Amazonas, and whites predominated most in the extreme south and in the stock-raising interior. In the century since, the whites have increased to forty per cent, and the negroes have fallen to less than twenty-five, in spite of the large slave importation in the first half of the nineteenth century. Sugar was still the great staple. Exports of gold and precious stones had fallen with the exhaustion of the best placers laid in the preceding century. Tobacco was largely produced, especially in Bahia, and Maranhão and Para were centers of a flourishing cotton trade. Rice, indigo, and pepper were exported on a considerable scale, and the production of coffee had been carried from Para to Rio and was rapidly increasing. The people of the interior were mostly clothed in coarse cottons manufactured at home. Probably nine-tenths went barefoot and lived in rude houses without ornamentation and conveniences. The slave system and the large landed estates, the want of diversification of industry, the general apathy, 
the ease of maintaining one's self in the mild climate all these causes cooperated to lessen consuming power and to diminish brazil's value as a market for imported merchandise great estates many of them owned by religious corporations were the rule only the best parts of these estates were cultivated enclosures were almost unknown and the farm buildings were dilapidated though next to sugar the chief wealth cattle were neglected breeds were not kept up and the making of butter was so little understood that it was worth a dollar a pound the proprietors of the sugar ranches left everything to their slaves ploughs were unknown lumber was sawed by hand water power was rarely used for any purpose though so abundant the only schools were a few in the towns artificial light was practically unused the cities were dilapidated and their filthy streets were full of stagnant water horsemen rode on the sidewalks in the centre of rio itself freight was brought from the interior on muleback over narrow trails and hardly any roads for wheeled vehicles existed the mountains and heavily forested coast regions were extremely difficult to penetrate but in the sparsely forested interior the old indian trails furnished facilities for constant communication which was astonishingly rapid considering the circumstances the people were very hospitable to receive a guest was an honor each ranch had special quarters for travelers and the only pay the stranger could offer was to tell the news outside the ports no foreigner had ever been seen and the first englishman who visited São paulo in eighteen o nine was as much of a curiosity as an eskimo would be to-day during john's stay in rio brazil was little involved in foreign difficulties in eighteen o eight an expedition was sent from para which took possession of cayenne but the place was restored to the french in eighteen fifteen in the south the breaking out of the argentine revolution in eighteen ten was a temptation for the prince regent to increase brazil's territory after the expulsion of the spaniards by the populace of buenos aires the spanish forces in montevideo held that place against the patriots for four years john sent an army into uruguay in eighteen eleven nominally to help the spaniards but he had to withdraw it because of spanish pressure after the surrender of montevideo by the spaniards a civil war broke out amongst the patriots of uruguay and the adjacent argentine provinces the warring factions trespassed on the territory of their brazilian neighbors john determined to seize the coveted north bank of the plate for himself in eighteen fifteen the celebrated guerrilla chief artigas invaded the seven missions which had been seized in eighteen o one and throughout that year and the next the rio grandenses fought desperately to expel him finally artigas was decisively defeated and the portuguese army marched down the coast and entered montevideo without opposition they were welcomed by the factions opposed to artigas but the buenos aires government protested and artigas kept up a resistance in the interior until he was overthrown by rival argentine chieftains from eighteen seventeen to eighteen twenty one uruguay remained in the military occupation of brazilian troops and in the latter year it was formally annexed under the title of the cisplatine province brazil had had to assume the burdens as well as reap the advantages of being an independent nation the whole extravagant government with its swarm of hangers-on who had bankrupted both nations together was now saddled on brazil alone john advisers regarded liberal principles as dangerous to civil order and considered all french and north americans as firebrands whose presence in brazil might start the flame of revolution the united states minister was treated as if he were a jacobin agent and american ships were searched for napoleon's spies however the removal of the court to rio had set forces in motion which ultimately transformed brazil free ports were open doors for ideas and education as well as merchandise free manufacturing and immigration diversified industry and spread energetic habits the influx of so many educated portuguese and the introduction of the printing press stimulated a desire for instruction among the brazilians ambition for employment in the public service the road to which under the portuguese system has always lain through the gates of a university cooperated a considerable educated class began to be formed though the intellectual movement never extended into the body of the people through the former class the nation found the means of expression 
a spirit of inquiry and unrest was roused but the movement was intellectual rather than instinctive theoretical rather than practical from the top down and directed more toward the revolutionizing the central government than developing local administration the first outbreak on brazilian soil against absolutism was the pernambuco revolution of eighteen seventeen five lodges of freemasons existed in the city the priests themselves were most earnest preachers of political freedom merchants and sugar planters wanted lower taxes the prosperity of the sugar trade had made the people self-confident a conspiracy was formed which had the sympathy of many of the clergy and influential citizens an attempt to arrest the principal agitators resulted in a riot the troops were mostly brazilian and rose in favor of their compatriots and the populace joined them the governor fled leaving the public departments and the treasury containing a million dollars in the hands of the revolutionists the movement became at once frankly separatists and republican a committee of public safety was named the portuguese flags were torn down a temporary constitution proclaimed a printing press set up to publish a liberal newspaper messengers were dispatched to the interior and to the neighboring provinces to announce the overthrow of despotism and to invite cooperation but they met with no enthusiastic reception fear of the aggressive jacobinism of the city of pernambuco cooled the slave owners and conservatives and the dignitaries on the revolutionary committee were shocked by the impetuosity of their radical colleagues the insurgents had not had time to provide themselves with arms, and the Portuguese fleet from Bahia quickly blockaded the port. When the royal troops came up, they found the interior of the province in civil war, and the radicals were soon backed into the city, where a short siege compelled them to capitulate. The more aggressive leaders were shot by court-martial, and a military government was set up. Hundreds of prisoners were carried off to Bahia where they remained until the great reaction of eighteen twenty one end of section thirty six section thirty seven of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part four brazil chapter fourteen independence in eighteen twenty the standard of revolt was raised in cadiz against the spanish bourbons who with the aid of the holy alliance had re-established absolutism after the fall of napoleon the feeble ferdinand was compelled to accept a liberal constitution when the news reached lisbon the regency acting there for king john was panic-stricken communication with spain was forbidden and word sent off post haste to john to urge his immediate return to portugal or at least the sending of his eldest son as the only means of pacifying the deep dissatisfaction felt because of the absence of the court and government in porto always the centre of liberal movements a formidable conspiracy was formed which included the leading citizens and the officers of the garrison and in august eighteen twenty the royal authority was overthrown after scarcely a show of resistance and a provisional junta installed the movement spread over the northern provinces and thence to lisbon where a junta assumed power in december after some confusion it was agreed temporarily to adopt the spanish constitution to summon the cortes and to retain the braganza dynasty as constitutional monarchs the news of the rising in porto spread like wildfire through the portuguese possessions beyond sea madeira and the azores immediately installed revolutionary juntas and some of the brazilian provinces could not wait until the assembling of the cortes before establishing free governments among native brazilians and immigrated portuguese among soldiers and citizens alike the enthusiasm for a constitution was well nigh universal in para pernambuco and rio grande do sul the royal governors were dispossessed by the united soldiers and people and the spanish constitution proclaimed as the law of the land rio however lay quiet and it was not until february eighteen twenty one that the Bahia garrison deposed the governor and installed a provisional junta which protesting allegiance to the house of braganza proclaimed the spanish constitution nominated deputies to the cortes and promised to adopt whatever definite constitution might be framed by that body the action of Bahia was decisive throughout the interior it met with approval 
that John could hope for no support from Brazil in case he decided to make a struggle against the Portuguese revolutionists was evident. Reluctantly he issued a proclamation announcing his intention to send Don Pedro, his eldest son, to treat with the Cortes, and he promised to adopt such parts of the new constitution as might be found expedient for Brazil. To such delay, native Brazilians and the Portuguese born were alike opposed. In Rio, the troops and people arose, demanding an unconditional promise to ratify any constitution the Cortes might adopt. On the 26th of February, a great crowd assembled in the streets, and while the cowardly king skulked in his suburban palace, the Prince Pedro addressed the people, swearing in his father's name and his own to accept unreservedly the expected constitution. The multitude insisted on marching out to the king's palace to show their enthusiastic gratitude. Trembling with fear, John was forced to get into his carriage, and the miserable man was frightened out of his wits when the crowd took the horses out to drag him with their own hands. He fainted away, and, when he recovered his senses, sat snivelling, protesting between his sobs his willingness to agree to anything, and sure that he was going to suffer the fate of Louis the Sixteenth. Thereafter, Don Pedro, though only twenty-two years old, was the principal figure in Brazil. He resembled his passionate, unrestrained, and unscrupulous mother, rather than his vacillating, pusillanimous father. He had grown up, neglected, and uncontrolled in the midst of his parents' quarrelling and the confusion of the removal to Brazil, receiving no education except that of a soldier, and hardly able to write his native tongue correctly. He was handsome, brave, willful, arrogant, loved riding and driving, was eager and shameless in the pursuit of pleasure. His manners were frank and attractive, and he was active-minded, quick to absorb new impressions, enterprising, strong-willed, loved popularity, and intensely enjoyed being the principal dramatic figure in any crisis. His personal courage was unquestionable, and he was prompt of decision in the face of dangers and difficulties. While capable of warm friendships and with strong impulses of devotion and gratitude, he lacked real faithfulness. Between him and his father little love and no sympathy existed. Prior to the events of 1821 he had not been admitted to the councils in state affairs, and his closest friends were among the young Portuguese officers, who, like most of their class, sympathized with the constitutional movement. Pedro was a Freemason, and the liberal opinions advocated in the lodges greatly influenced him. To Pedro, therefore, young, ardent, popular, holding progressive notions, both Brazilians and Portuguese liberals naturally turned. Seeing the role of leader and ruler of Brazil ready to his hand, Pedro favored the departure of his father for Portugal. A meeting of the Rio electors, held on the 25th of April, to elect members to the Cortes, suddenly changed into a tumult, and demanded that the king ascend to the Spanish constitution before his departure. He had no choice but to yield, though probably neither he nor the popular leaders had ever read the document. The demonstrations continuing, Pedro became uneasy lest his father's journey should be delayed, and marched his troops into the square and cleared the people out at the point of the bayonet. This audacious move was followed by general stupefaction, and the king quietly escaped, leaving Pedro as regent. As his vessel weighed anchor, he said to his son, quote, I fear Brazil before long will separate herself from Portugal. If so, rather than allow the crown to fall to some adventurer, place it on thy own head. End quote. The grasping policy of the Portuguese members of the Cortes furnished the impulse that drove the Brazilians into union and independence. The Cortes met in Lisbon, and although most of the Brazilian delegates had not arrived, immediately undertook to pass measures touching the most important interests of the younger kingdom. In December 1821, news reached Brazil that decrees had been enacted requiring the prince to leave Brazil, abolishing the appeal courts at Rio, creating governors who were to supersede the juntas and be independent of local control, and sending garrisons to the principal cities. Tremendous popular excitement followed. The coupling of the order for Pedro's retirement with the provisions for the enslavement and disintegration of Brazil 
made the provinces realize that he was the only centre around which they could rally for effective resistance a cry rose up from the whole country praying pedro not to abandon them the address sent by the provisional junta of sao paulo was penned by the hand of jose bonifacio de andrada and may well be called the brazilian declaration of independence Quote, how dare these portuguese deputies without waiting for the brazilian members to promulgate laws which affect the dearest interests of this realm how dare they dismember brazil into isolated parts possessing no common centre of strength and union how dare they deprive your royal highness of the regency with which your august father our monarch had invested you how dare they deprive brazil of the tribunals instituted for the interpretation and modification of laws for the general administration of ecclesiastical affairs of finance commerce and so many institutions of public unity to whom are the unhappy people hereafter to address themselves for redress touching their business and judicial interests jose bonifacio whose voice and example more than any other man's gave expression and direction to the aspiration for independence belonged to the english parliamentary school which was dominant then in liberal thought the elevation of the young and progressive prince to an independent throne seemed an easy method of establishing constitutional government as well of securing brazil's autonomy pedro did not hesitate long in acceding to the wish of the brazilians on the ninth of january eighteen twenty two he formally announced that he would remain in brazil thus defying the portuguese cortes the word independence had not yet been employed and there was a very general hope that the portuguese would listen to reason when the brazilian deputies arrived in lisbon the only active resistance to pedro in brazil came from the portuguese soldiers some of whom revolted and went so far as to march under arms to a point commanding the city of rio but their nerve failed them in face of the imminent concourse of citizens who were preparing to fight pedro threw himself unreservedly into the hands of the patriots jose bonifacio was made prime minister and measures taken to re-establish the control of the central over the provincial governments but the ruling groups in various cities were not very ready to surrender their authority pedro called a council but representatives from only four provinces responded bahia and pernambuco were held in check by portuguese garrisons and other provinces hesitated before committing themselves meanwhile the portuguese majority in the cortes paid no attention to the warnings of the brazilian members but ruthlessly pushed forward the measures for the commercial and political subjection of brazil most of the brazilian members withdrew while a squadron was sent to rio to escort the prince back to portugal on may the thirteenth eighteen twenty two he assumed the title of quote, perpetual defender and protector of brazil end quote, and from this to a formal declaration of independence was only a step in june he notified the cortes that brazil must have her own legislative body and on his own responsibility issued writs for a constituent assembly the cortes responded by reinforcing the bahia garrison and the bahianos retaliated by attacking the portuguese troops the pernambucanos expelled their garrison and sent promises of adhesion to the prince on the seventh of september pedro was in sao paulo and there received dispatches telling of still more violent measures taken by the cortes accompanied by letters from jose bonifacio urging that the opportunity they had so often planned for together had at last arrived pedro reflected by the moment and then dramatically drawing his sword cried independence or death end quote. everything had been carefully timed and his entrance into rio a few days later wearing a cockade with the new device was greeted with enthusiasm on the twelfth of october he was solemnly crowned constitutional emperor of brazil announcing that he would accept the constitution to be drawn up by the approaching constituent assembly prompt and efficient measures for the expulsion of the portuguese garrison from bahia maranhão para and montevideo were taken the militia came forward enthusiastically the regular forces were rapidly increased 
Lord Cochrane, the celebrated free lance English admiral, was placed in command of a fair-sized fleet which sailed at once for Bahia, and defeating the ships which remained faithful to the Portuguese cause, established a blockade that soon enabled the land forces besieging the city to reduce the place. At Maranhão, Cochrane's success was still easier. Pará also fell without resistance at the summons of one of his captains, and the news of these successes was followed by that of the surrender of the garrison at Montevideo. Within less than a year from the declaration of independence, not a hostile Portuguese soldier remained on Brazilian soil. End of section 37《Section 38 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 15. Reign of Pedro I. Independence was the result of a plan carefully arranged by José Bonifacio and his Brazilian associates. Pedro had declared himself emperor in an access of dramatic enthusiasm. He wanted the glory of founding a great empire, and he loved to think of his name as that of the first legitimate monarch who was really self-abnegating enough to establish a constitutional government of his own free will. The role of a Washington, with the added glory of unselfishly resigning absolute power, appealed to his boyish vanity. But the cold fit came on when he undertook to perform his promises. His loud protestations of constitutionalism turned out to be mere windy mouthings. Though his reign largely assisted in maintaining Brazil's territorial unity, it cut off the promise of local self-government and helped bring on twenty years of bloody revolts. He was not exactly a hypocrite. He loved to hear sonorous periods about liberty rolling out of his mouth, but he had no idea of what they really meant. José Bonifacio and his brothers remained at the head of affairs when independence was declared, but, ardent and successful as the older Andrada had been in that moment, he proved no statesman, and had not the strength to oppose his willful young master. Almost immediately the Andradas engaged in bitter quarrels with the other leaders of the independence party, and summarily banished the five ablest advocates of a liberal constitution. They used their power to revenge themselves on their personal enemies, their secret police was worse than anything John had maintained, and they forcibly suppressed the newspapers which dared criticize their acts. Pedro's authority was accepted slowly outside of Rio. The ties binding the northern provinces to him were especially feeble. A constituent assembly had been summoned, but great difficulty was experienced in securing a full representation. Pernambuco and the neighboring provinces hesitated long before consenting to have anything to do with it, and Pará, Maranhão, and Piauí were never represented. It finally met in May 1823 with only 50 out of the 100 members in their seats. The emperor opened the session with an arrogant and dictatorial speech. Quote, I promise to adopt and defend the constitution which you may frame if it should be worthy of Brazil and myself. We need a constitution that will be an insurmountable barrier against any invasion of the imperial prerogatives. End quote. Such language excited an unexpected protest even among the members of this humble and inexperienced assembly. Though a majority were magistrates, they were not without a sense of the dignity of their functions as legislators and were eager for liberty, a liberty interpreted according to their own undigested theories. The Andradas bitterly attacked those who dared protest against the emperor's language, and a majority was only obtained for the government program by the lavish distribution of decorations. Pedro soon tired of the Andradas and their fiercely anti-Portuguese policy, and summarily dismissed them. The disgraced ministers passed at once into the most virulent opposition, and they inflamed popular prejudice against the resident Portuguese, and aroused fears that the emperor was plotting a reunion of Brazil with Portugal. As the session went on, the assembly showed a more independent spirit, and Pedro became more and more irritated. The Brazilian newspapers insulted his Portuguese officers, 
and the Assembly took the part of the former. In November matters reached a crisis. Pedro drew up his troops in front of the Assembly's meeting-house and demanded immediate satisfaction to the insulted officers and the expulsion of the Andradas. The answer was a brave refusal, but against his cannon nothing availed. He sent up an order for an instant and unconditional dissolution, and arresting the Andradas and other liberals as they came out of the building, deported them on board ship without the formality of charge or trial. Pedro ordered a paper constitution to be drawn up by his ministers. In form it was liberal, but he had no serious intention of putting it in force. Even in Rio the people ignored the invitation to give their formal adhesion to this delusive document. A show of acceptance was sought to be obtained from the provinces by going through the form of submitting it to the municipal councils. These councils were then close corporations, largely self-elective and dominated by the bureaucratic caste, but even so, north of Bahia, they paid no attention to the emperor's communication, and in the south some members had to be imprisoned before their consent could be extorted. The emperor swore to the constitution, and it was gravely promulgated as the nation's fundamental law, but no congress was summoned, as a matter of fact the government continued a pure despotism wherever the emperor's power extended. The press, which had sprung into existence during the agitation for independence, and which, after having been throttled by the Andradas, had partly revived during the session of the Constituent Assembly, was now definitely suppressed. Taxes were levied on the sole authority of the monarch. Laws were put into force without other sanction than his will. Citizens were arbitrarily banished, and military tribunals condemned civilians to death in time of peace. We can never know the extent of the shock felt by the liberals on hearing of the forcible dissolution of the Constituent Assembly. In Pernambuco it was one of the stimulating causes of a rebellion. In that city the press had not been suppressed, and the spirit of 1817 was still alive. A strong separatist feeling existed, and when the junta resigned, the popular choice made Carvalho Paez, who had been engaged in the former rebellion, governor. The emperor set up his own man, but authorities and people refused to recognize him. An open breach followed, and Pedro, with his usual vigor, undertook to establish his dominion over the hitherto aloof north. In July 1824, the Pernambucanos threw down the gauntlet by proclaiming the quote, Confederation of the Equator. End quote. This was intended to be a federal republic after the model of the union between the provinces of Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. The adhesion of Pernambuco, Paraiba, Rio Grande do Norte, and Ceará could be counted upon, and that of Maranhão, Pará, and Bahia was hoped for. Bahia, however, remained apathetic, and that city furnished Pedro a convenient base for his operations. He sent Admiral Cochrane to blockade and bombard Pernambuco, while an army marched up the coast. Factional civil war had broken out in the interior of the revolted provinces, and the imperial forces were joined by Carvalho's local enemies. The patriots fought desperately, but were overwhelmed before they could provide themselves with arms or organize their resistance. The city had to surrender on the 17th of September, though fighting was kept up for a long time in the interior. Cochrane sailed north, reducing the ports one by one, and by the end of the year the serious resistance was at an end. The victorious emperor punished the patriots with ruthless severity, sending many of the leaders to the scaffold and establishing military tribunals, which inaugurated a reign of terror. An Englishman named Ratcliffe was brought to Rio and hanged, not so much for his part in the insurrection as because he had once offended Pedro's mother in Portugal. Quote, she offered a reward for his head, end quote, said the emperor as he signed the death warrant, Quote, but now she shall have it for nothing. End quote. In the spring of 1825, it seemed as if Pedro was certain to establish himself at the head of a military despotism, extending from the Amazon to the plate. Before the Pernambuco insurrection, his revenue and recruits had been drawn solely from Rio and the adjacent provinces. 
now his fleet and disciplined army recruited by impressment and concentrated under his eye enabled him to get revenue from all the ports and to hold the provinces in check his sea power and his possession of the purse strings gave him a tremendous advantage he imported germans swiss and irish with a view to forming a corps of janissaries all brazil seemed submissive and the enthusiasm which had flamed out among the brazilians in eighteen twenty one and eighteen twenty two had died out leaving as its only permanent effect a strong sentiment against reunion with portugal externally his position seemed secure he was assured of canning's active support in securing formal recognition as an independent monarch portugal was helpless though his application for a defensive and offensive alliance had been refused by henry clay the united states was the first to recognize brazil's independence even the holy alliance had little objection to an independent american state ruled by a legitimate monarch in the summer of eighteen twenty five a treaty of peace was framed between portugal and brazil through the intermediation of england independence was formally recognized but pedro made the error of consenting that his father should take the honorary title of emperor of brazil and by a secret article he pledged brazil to assume ten millions of the portuguese debt though it had been incurred in war against herself in march eighteen twenty five a rebellion against pedro broke out in uruguay and the argentine gauchos swarmed over the border the brazilians easily held the fortified city of montevideo but the spanish americans were successful in the open field and after six months of harassing fighting caught the imperial army in a disadvantageous position and cut it to pieces in the decisive battle of sarandi the buenos aires government at once gave notice that it must recognize that uruguay had reunited itself to the argentine and pedro responded with a declaration of war and a blockade the preparations for war involved him in unprecedented expenditures which piled up the debt already accumulated in his father's time and added to by the war of independence and the suppression of the confederation of the equator he decided to call together the representatives of the people and insist that they bear a share of the responsibility so little interest was taken that it was hard to hold the elections and the members had to be urged to present themselves on the third of may eighteen twenty six the first brazilian congress met intended as a mere instrument to furnish supplies for the war and meeting with the fear of the fate of the constituent assembly before its eyes it hesitatingly began the work of parliamentary government except for the revolution of eighteen eighty nine the sessions have never since been interrupted a week before the assembling of congress the news reached brazil that king john was dead pedro was the eldest son but his brother miguel was a candidate for the vacant throne pedro had to make an immediate choice between the two crowns he decided to keep that of brazil and to transfer that of portugal to his daughter maria gloria then a child seven years old he tried to head off miguel by making the latter regent and promising that maria should marry him as soon as she was old enough while he tied his brother's hands by promulgating a constitution for portugal the scheme failed to preserve the peace and the portuguese absolutists supporting miguel and the constitutionalists maria gloria almost immediately became involved in a civil war during the latter part of pedro's reign he was continually preoccupied with portuguese affairs and trying to promote his daughter's fortunes in europe the war on the plate turned out difficult and disastrous notwithstanding that great land forces were sent no progress was made toward reducing uruguay to obedience and the overwhelming naval force blockading buenos aires was harassed by a small fleet improvised by an able irishman admiral brown in the argentine service fast sailing baltimore clippers fitted out as privateers infested the whole brazilian coast often venturing in sight of rio and soon sweeping the coasting trade out of existence fruitless attempts to enforce the blockade involved pedro in difficulties with neutral powers brazilian merchants were disgusted with the war 
and communication between the provinces became nearly impossible. The Brazilian land forces in Uruguay were increased to 20,000, but the Argentines, under General Carlos Alvear, audaciously averted the danger of an invasion of their territory by planning and effecting an inroad into Rio Grande itself. The Brazilian general allowed Alvear to slip between his main body and Montevideo, and the latter penetrated to the east, sacked the important town of Bajet, and was off to the north with the whole Brazilian army in hot pursuit. On the 20th of February 1827, the Argentines turned and attacked the Brazilians at a disadvantage, defeating them with great loss. In this battle of Ituzaingo, 16,000 men took part, and the armies were nearly equal in numbers. The Brazilians escaped without serious pursuit, while the Argentines retired at their leisure, assured that no aggressive operations would soon be undertaken against them. Pedro's hope of dominance on the south shore of the plate was ended. Naval disasters suffered at the hands of the indefatigable Brown made him still more anxious for peace. Negotiations were begun with the Argentine government, which was only prevented by lack of money and internal factional quarrels from undertaking an aggressive war against Brazilian territory. Operations were kept up languidly on both sides for a year, and finally Pedro in 1825 consented to a preliminary treaty by which he relinquished his sovereignty over Uruguay, obtaining in return Argentine consent that it be erected into an independent country. The first session of the Brazilian Congress had been very timid and voted as the emperor desired. The session of 1827 was not so respectful. The news of Ituzaingo had made him seem less formidable. For the first time the chamber became a forum for the discussion of governmental theories, and the voice of Vasconcelos, the great champion of parliamentary government, was heard. In the fall of 1827, independent newspapers began to make their appearance, and Pedro dared not interfere with them. The tone of most of them was exaggerated, but in December the Aurora Fluminense, with Evaristo da Vega as editor, issued its first number. By universal consent he is recognized as the most influential journalist who ever wielded a pen in Brazil. His profound and temperate discussion of public affairs gave him an ascendancy over opinion which can hardly be understood in countries where party conventions and set speeches give opportunities for authoritatively outlining policies. When Congress met in May 1828, the Emperor and his government had completely lost prestige. The public's and chamber's consciousness of their rights and their power had made a distinct advance. Vasconcelos infused into the debates an independent and statesmanlike spirit, not unworthy the great popular assemblies of the most advanced countries. The youth of this remarkable man had been passed in pleasure-seeking, but his election to Congress gave him an object in life commensurate with his great abilities, and he applied himself with unquenchable ardor to the study of political science. Corrupt in morals, inordinate in ambition, his veniality notorious, his constitution ruined by disease, his skin withered, his hair grey, and his appearance that of men of sixty, though he was but thirty, the spirit within rose superior to all physical and moral defects. His role was peculiarly that of champion of the prerogatives of Congress. By his side was Pedro Feijo, afterwards regent, incorruptible in morals and unyielding in will, the champion of federation and democracy, and the earliest Brazilian positivist. This chamber of 1828 made a real beginning toward making ministers responsible to Congress, and started legal and administrative reforms. But the emperor insisted that its sole attention be given to increasing taxes, when the chamber definitely refused in 1829, he dissolved it in the hope that the next might prove more tractable. This act destroyed the last remnants of Pedro's popularity. From that moment his abdication or expulsion was inevitable. His friends tried to create a reaction by organizing societies in favor of absolutism, and governors of retrograde principles were appointed. 
but the popular irritation against him because he was a portuguese by birth and sympathy constantly grew brazil divided into two parts all the brazilians belonged to one and only the resident portuguese to the other the new chamber was harder to manage than the old one the andradas had returned from exile and most of the new members were bitterly prejudiced against pedro in the midst of the discontent came the news of the july revolution in paris giving the liberal propaganda a tremendous impetus the assassination of a newspaper man named badaro in november eighteen thirty aroused popular indignation to a fearful pitch pedro made a last effort to regain his popularity by making a journey through the province of minas his cold reception convinced him that the disaffection was not merely local and he returned to rio sick at heart in march eighteen thirty one disturbances broke out in the rio streets between the radicals and the portuguese vasconcelos and feijo were absent but evaristo drew up a manifesto demanding immediate reparation for the outrage committed by the rioting portuguese the emperor tried to still the rising storm by dismissing his ministry but the rioting continued and he suddenly again changed front and appointed a ministry of known reactionary principles the announcement was followed on the seventh of april by the assembling of a mob among whose members were professional men public employees and even soldiers and deputies pedro's proclamation was torn from the messenger's hands and trampled under foot beneath the windows of his palace the troops were all on the popular side a committee crowded its way into the emperor's presence but he would yield nothing to compulsion saying with dignity quote, i will do everything for the people but nothing by the people end quote. the news of the desertion of the very troops guarding his person he received with equanimity but the populace showed equal stubbornness throughout the night the crowd stuck to their posts and about two o'clock in the morning he suddenly drew up to a table and without consulting anyone wrote out an unconditional abdication in favour of his infant son the ministers of france and great britain had remained with him during this night of anxiety and when the morning came they were reluctant to accept his abdication as final all the foreign diplomats except the representatives of the united states and colombia followed him on board the british warship where he took refuge they wished to give him their moral support in case a counter-revolution were attempted the most potent cause for pedro's loss of popularity was that he was a portuguese he offended the self-love of a jealous people in a hundred ways by favouring his portuguese friends almost as fatal was his treatment of his blameless wife one mistress after another succeeded to his favours and he acknowledged and emboldened his illegitimate children most of his concubines did not hold him long but the last who was said to be of english descent acquired a complete ascendancy over him he publicly installed her as his mistress created her a marchioness forced the empress to accept her as a lady-in-waiting and submit to ride in the same carriage with her the court attended in a body the baptism of her child and some of his love-letters to her are indescribable they could have been written only by a degenerate in the fall of eighteen twenty six the poor empress was enceinte with her seventh son in nine years and while in this condition pedro brutally abused her she never recovered and died in the most fearful agony pedro was absent looking after the war in the plate but the marchioness had the heartless effrontery to demand admittance to the sick-room and pedro on his return dismissed the ministers who had dared to approve the action of the official who refused to let his mistress gloat over the tortured deathbed of his wife pedro was too boyish talkative and familiar to maintain an ascendancy over such a people as the brazilians at all hours of the day and night he was to be seen driving furiously about the streets and he constantly showed himself in the theatres he liked to drill his troops himself and frequently beat the soldiers with his own imperial hand 
Once he nearly maimed himself, striking at a stupid recruit with his sword, and missing the blow, catching his own foot. On another occasion he almost killed himself and two members of his family by overturning his carriage. He was always ready to explain to any mob at hand his reasons for his official policy, and was too fond of excitement and applause to refrain from making a speech whenever he had a chance. The inmost emotions of his heart were too cheaply exhibited on the Rio streets for the populace to have much respect for them. He was a belated knight-errant with a decided touch of the demagogue. End of section 38「Section 39 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 16. The Regency. After Pedro's expulsion, the country was left in a very insecure situation. In Rio, the Portuguese were as numerous as the native Brazilians. A great part of the population was under arms, and radicalism and revolution were in the air, but for the moment fear of the Portuguese and of Pedro's restoration enabled cool-headed, conservative leaders to maintain peace. The members of Congress in the city selected a provisional regency. The ministry, whose dismissal had been the occasion of the outbreak against Pedro, returned to power, and, so far as Rio was concerned, government proceeded without interruption. Within a few weeks, Congress met in regular session, and a permanent regency was elected. Bahia had revolted and expelled the pro-Portuguese military commander even before Pedro's deposition by Rio. When the news of the events of the 7th of April reached Pernambuco and Pará, the troops promptly renounced their commanders. In Congress, grave differences of opinion appeared. The Brazilian party quickly divided into two factions, the conservatives, who were faithful to the dynasty and wanted the fewest possible changes, and the radicals. The former had stepped into control ahead of the latter, but they had not the real force of the country behind them. There was a growing demand for a larger measure of self-government by the provinces and for a sweeping democratic reforms. The regency had no real prestige. The military soon became jealous and dissatisfied, and the party, in favor of the emperor's restoration, began to assume a formidably menacing attitude. In July, Rio seemed on the point of plunging into a bloody and desperate civil war. The regency called upon Padre Feijó, the great patriot priest and leader of democratic opinion, and gave him absolute power as minister of justice. His firm measures soon suppressed the disorders in Rio, and the National Guard, which he organized among the better classes of the people, held the revolting regiments in check. In the provinces, however, the local authorities often ignored the commands of the governors appointed by the regency. Ambitious local leaders plotted to turn the situation to their personal advantage, and the soldiers and disorderly elements were inflammable material ready to their hands. In nearly every province civil war broke out. The typical process was for a military officer, a National Guard colonel, or any other person who had acquired local prestige, to issue a pronunciamento and announce the establishment of a liberal government whose scope was only limited by the imagination and knowledge of constitutional law possessed by the writer of the pronunciamento. If the municipal authorities resisted, they were expelled, and creatures of the head of the insurrection put in their place. This overturning of legally existing authority would usually be resented by some neighboring official or some rival of the petty dictator, and a confused conflict would ensue in which the rank and file of neither side would have a very clear conception of what they were fighting about, although the words of liberty and local rights, constitutionalism and union were overworked in speeches and proclamations. It is not worth while to give the detailed history of these monotonous and tedious uprisings, massacres, encounters, and usurpations, though the operations often rose to the dignity of campaigns and pitched battles. Hardly a province escaped. In Pernambuco, in 1831, the soldiery sacked the city, and the people avenged themselves by killing three hundred and banishing the rest. 
Next year another military revolt broke out in the same city, which soon became an insurrection whose nominal purpose was to restore the Emperor, and which lasted four years. Two hundred persons were killed in Pará in 1831 during a single night of street fighting. A bitter little civil war in Marañao lasted all through the winter of 1831-1832, and was only put down by a general sent from Rio. In Ceará, the partisans of the emperor kept the province in a state of anarchy for several months. In Minas Gerais, the friends of Pedro obtained possession of the capital, and the patriots had to fight hard to get the better of them. Though most of these insurrections were suppressed by the people of the state concerned, disrespect for the central government was increasing, and a blind and jealous hatred of the Portuguese and everything foreign grew continuously. During the four stormy years which succeeded Pedro's expulsion, Congress discussed violently the terms of the constitutional revision, which all saw to be inevitable. Though the radical element predominated, the Conservatives and the Senate succeeded in bringing about a compromise. A single regent was substituted for the triple system. He was to be elected by universal, though indirect, suffrage, and, most important of all, each province was given its own assembly with power to levy taxes and conduct most of the affairs of local government. The Conservatives managed to preserve the life senates and the nomination of the provincial governors by the central government. The party in favor of Pedro's restoration had been gaining ground. The Andradas, always in the most extreme opposition when out of power, went over to it, and the Conservatives were gravitating in the same direction when Pedro's own death in 1834 put an end to the movement. He died at a happy moment for his fame, covered with the laurels he had just won by driving out his usurping and absolutist brother Miguel, and by using that opportunity to endow Brazil with a constitution. By a curious irony of fate, this reckless soldier and descendant of a hundred absolute kings was the instrument through which constitutional government was given to both branches of the Portuguese race. The statesman who had proved himself most nearly master of the situation during these stormy years was Padre Feijó. He represented the average Brazilian, the disinterested and honest public. He had energy and intrepidity. His eloquence was peculiar and commanding. His advocacy of his beliefs was uncompromising. He had been a leader in sustaining liberal ideas, and he had proven his practical courage and capacity in putting down the counter-revolution in Rio. He naturally became a candidate for sole regent after the passage of the Acto Adicional, or amendment to the Constitution. It seemed appropriate that to him should be entrusted the putting into force of the law which was expected to change Brazil into a federation of democracies united under a constitutional monarchy. Elected after a close contest, he took office in the latter part of 1835, sincerely anxious to rule well and sustained by a popular love and confidence such as few Brazilian statesmen have enjoyed. However, from the beginning, he was unable to count on the support of a majority of the chamber. He was not the man to manage by adroit manipulation and skillful distribution of patronage, but his own work and that of Vasconcelos had borne fruit, and the popular branch of the legislature had become the dominating political force in the Brazilian system. The tide was now setting towards conservatism, the heroic impulse that had brought about the revolution of 1831 had lost their force. The nation's temper was cooled. The politicians had forgotten their fine enthusiasm and were busily engaged in personal intrigues. Feijó inherited from the former regency the two most formidable revolutions which so far had broken out, that of Vinagre and Malcher in Pará and the great rebellion in Rio Grande do Sul. He was hardly fitted to deal with such a complicated situation as that of Brazil in 1836. He himself said, quote, I am a man to break, never to bend, end quote. Though he gave the office holders of Brazil an object lesson in unblemished integrity, his actions were often harsh and, and arbitrary. When on the floor of the chamber he had been the chief exponent of democracy, 
but as chief executive he rode rough shod over his inferiors, refused to be guided by others even in the matters where no principle was involved, and proved that he had the true Latin tendency to centralize administration. Vasconcelos soon outgeneraled Feijó. A dread of innovation was spreading among the landholding classes. The merchants and Portuguese of the cities naturally gravitated away from the radical regent. The opposition majority in the chamber, compactly organized by Vasconcelos's skillful management, was encouraged, feeling that it was backed by the mercantile and office-holding classes, and by the persons of highest intelligence and best social position. It clung together with a cohesion unusual in South America, and was the foundation upon which the historical parties were built, whose names are constantly encountered in Brazilian political history for the next fifty years. For two years Feijó struggled against the adverse conditions. For the Pará revolution, he found a clever and faithful general in Andrea, and managed to keep him well supplied with money and troops, so that a vigorous pursuit of the guerilla chiefs resulted in their capture and the pacification of the province. But in Rio Grande, the people were too strong and too independent to be reduced by troops sent from without, and Congress hampered him by refusing votes of credit. The revolution which had broken out there three months before he assumed the regency had been occasioned by anti-Portuguese feeling and by the unpopularity of the governor. The latter was obliged to flee from Porto Alegre with hardly a semblance of resistance. At first Feijó wisely limited his interference to the nomination of a new governor. It was not safe to irritate the half-feudal chiefs, backed by their bands of gauchos trained in constant raids over the Uruguayan border, and who were too accustomed to seeing revolutions on the Spanish side to hesitate much about undertaking one on their own account. But the new governor was ambitious and tried to take advantage of the jealousies among the gaucho leaders to make himself supreme. He got some of the ablest of them on his side, but the others were stimulated into more determined fighting. The rebels kept the field in formidable numbers, and among their able partisan chiefs was Giuseppe Garibaldi, who here took part in his first war for freedom. At first evil fortune followed the patriots, and they were badly defeated in the Battle of Fanfa, where their greatest leader, Bento Gonsalves, was captured and carried to Rio. His lieutenants rallied again and declared Rio Grande an independent republic. Feijó dispatched a new governor, whose oppressive measures soon brought about a wholesale desertion of the Rio Grandenses, who had hitherto supported the Union side. By the middle of 1837, Rio Grande seemed hopelessly lost to Brazil, and the government only held the coast towns. His bad management of affairs in Rio Grande was the immediate occasion of Feijó's resignation in September 1837. The victorious conservative majority immediately stepped into power. Bernardo de Vasconcelos reaped at length a personal reward for his years of labor and intrigue, and became the ruling force in the chamber, and prime minister, though a wealthy senator, Araujo Lima by name, had been elected regent. But Vasconcelos was merely the first among equals, and held his power only so long as he could command the support of the conservative majority. A sort of oligarchy grew up, which directed the work of reaction without much more regard for outside opinion than Pedro himself had shown. However, Brazil had finally entered upon a stage of government which in form was parliamentary, and in substance was partly so. It was rather the parliamentarism of Walpole than of Gladstone. The members owed their seats to the administration. They were a sort of self-nominating and self-renewing body, and departmental and judicial administration continued in much the same old way. The great task before the conservative regency was to undo most of the work which had been wrought by the federalist and democratic movements of the early thirties. The amendments to the Constitution, known as the Acto Adicional, had apparently established the autonomy of the provinces in their local affairs. If these amendments had been put into effect, Brazil would have become a federated state like Switzerland or the United States. 
the Conservatives were alarmed at the length to which the Provincial Assemblies were already going in managing their own affairs, and succeeded in turning the country back on the road towards centralization and unification. A law was passed which interpreted the Acto Adicional so as nearly to destroy provincial autonomy. The provincial assemblies were forbidden to interfere with the magistracy. Their resolutions could be vetoed by the governors or the National Congress. Their power of controlling the administration of justice was taken away. They became little more than advisory bodies completely under the dominance of governors appointed from Rio, and who rarely were citizens of the state they ruled. At first there was little opposition, and the regency easily suppressed a separatist movement in Baia which proposed to establish a republic until the boy emperor should come of age. The reorganized regency was, however, weak. The attitude of the nation was merely tolerant and expectant. The war in Rio Grande continued, and the attacks of the liberals in the chamber increased in force in effectiveness. Ministers began to change and shift. The conviction grew that the conservative oligarchy would not long rule the country. Liberals and conservatives alike inclined to the idea that the best thing was to return to a ruler selected from the legitimate royal family. According to the constitution, the boy emperor would not become of age until he reached 18, in 1843. If the constitution were strictly followed, the country would have to be governed for years by a hybrid executive, a regent who was neither a ruler by popular choice, nor yet a monarch by blood and succession. Many advocated declaring the emperor's eldest sister, Januaria, regent, though the young lady protested tearfully against being turned into such a thing as she imagined a regent to be. More insisted that the emperor, in spite of his tender years, immediately assumed the functions of supreme ruler. The politicians in opposition, with the two surviving Andradas at their head, took advantage of this feeling. Bills were introduced in Congress, authorizing the emperor to take the reins at once. The regent's ministers did not dare directly oppose these measures. They only tried to compromise as long as possible. But difficulties and dissatisfaction increased. A formidable revolution broke out in Maranhão. The Rio Grandenses invaded Santa Catarina. It was evident that the regency could not continue to hold the clashing provinces together. While the intellectual conviction had never been stronger that union between the provinces was an advantage, circumstances were increasing dissatisfaction and insubordination in every part of the empire. The contest in Congress over the emperor's majority assumed an acute phase as soon as the session of 1840 began. The ministry in desperation sought to prevent immediate action by calling Vasconcelos back to power and proroguing the session. The announcement of this step was followed by an outburst that left no recourse but a submission to the matter in dispute to the boy emperor itself. The opposition deputies went out in a body to see him and begged him to consent to assume his imperial functions at once. Though entirely unauthorized by the Constitution, no one made serious objection to such a revolutionary way of proceeding. The young Pedro accepted with dignity and confidence. The city and country went wild with delight, and on the 23rd of July, 1840, Congress assembled in a sort of extraordinary constituent assembly, and without a dissenting voice proclaimed him of age. Although the ten years of the Regency were the stormiest in Brazilian history, they were in many respects the most fruitful. The nation was serving an apprenticeship in governing itself. Its public men were being trained. The value of self-restraint and of peace were being learned. The freedom of the press and of the parliament was definitely established. The production of literature began. Professional schools were put on a footing not unworthy of any civilized country. Learned societies were organized. The study of the resources of the country was continued. Social intercourse developed. Communication between the provinces increased. The study of foreign languages became general among the polite classes. Industrially, too, the period was one of germination of those seeds from which subsequently grew the prosperity of the country. 
Though foreign commerce increased little during the civil wars, the cultivation of coffee assumed large proportions, and while sugar and cotton, food crops and tobacco, suffered much from foreign competition and civil disturbances, nevertheless they held up pretty well. The confusion of the times and the weakness of the central government prevented any great improvement in the public finances, but neither taxes nor debt were piled up as they had been under Pedro I though the efficiency and honesty of the administration left much to be desired the small resources of which the central government disposed brought about an era of comparative economy in the departments End of section thirty nine section forty of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 17. Pedro II. The so-called liberals went into power on the declaration of the emperor's majority, and proved to be more tyrannical and centralizing than the conservatives whom they had replaced. Provincial governments were dismissed wholesale solely for factional advantage. The Chamber of Deputies was dissolved and a new one elected in the fall of 1840, and in the choice of deputies the Andradas interfered, securing an overwhelming liberal majority. In reality, however, the Andradas had not won the confidence of the ruling coteries, nor of the boy emperor. When they quarrelled with Aureliano, one of their colleagues, the matter was submitted to Pedro, who was then only fifteen and a half years old. His decision was against the Andradas. They resigned, and from that moment, until his mental powers began to fail, Pedro II was the supreme authority in the state. He governed parliamentarily as far as he deemed it possible, left most matters to his cabinets, kept out of view, and was careful to ascertain public opinion. Nonetheless, he was the final arbiter in matters of the first importance. In the politics of the next fifty years he was incomparably the most potent Brazilian. Happily for his country, he resembled his mother rather than his father. Studious and laborious, books were his great occupation. He was an indefatigable and omnivorous reader, and though especially fond of history and sociology, few subjects and few literatures escaped him. No fact ever failed to interest him, but his mind was too discursive and his studies too widespread and too superficial to give him a store of sound and well-digested knowledge. Morally, he was a complete contrast to his dissipated father. He was a monarch of the conscientious nineteenth-century type. He, as a little boy, had been obedient to the priests and ladies to whom his rearing had been entrusted, but they retained no great influence over him. Though thoroughly respectful toward religion, he was not especially devout, and his political ideas were gathered rather from his own reading than from direct teaching. As a father and husband he was good and kind, and conscientiously devoted all his energies to the performance of his duties, public and private. His first act on assuming power was to forbid the people of his household to ask any favors of him in regard to public affairs. His manners were democratic. Though tall and handsome, he cared little for his personal appearance. His clothing was ill-fitting and ill-cared for. He drove about in rickety old carriage, with absurd-looking horses. He kept no court properly so called. He would gobble through his state dinners in a hurry to get back to his books. He would call cabinet meetings at inconvenient hours of the night if an idea struck him. Though his subjects loved and trusted him, the general tendency was rather to laugh at his peculiarities. It could hardly be said that people personally stood much in awe of him. At the same time, when action was to be taken in a crisis, he could be as arbitrary as any czar. He took no pride in imposing his will over that of others, and his manners and methods were always mild and gentle. Some believe that he deliberately assumed careless, democratic ways, thinking them best adapted to maintaining himself in power, and it is certain that he showed little anxiety about his position and seemed to value it slightly. 
Intellectually restless though he was, his judgment was sound enough to enable him soon to foresee that the inevitable tendency was toward a republic, and in the latter part of his life he often said that he was the best republican in the empire, and that his main function was to prepare the way for it. At bottom he was not a man of strong passions or intense will, but was rather a mild-mannered and philosophic opportunist, whose greatest merit was that he loved peace, and whose greatest achievement was that Brazil remained internally quiet during his long reign. With the fall of the Andradas, the Conservative Party returned to power, and a reactionary parliamentary government, with the Emperor as a sort of regulating and controlling Deus Ex Machina, was definitely installed. Great things were hoped for from the new regime, and loyalty to the young Emperor was enthusiastic, sincere, and universal. However, the internal disturbances were too serious to be calmed in a day. The revolution in Maranhão, which had been bequeathed by the regency, was formidable. In pacifying it, a general named Luis Lima e Silva first came to the front, and was named Baron of Cassias for his services. This officer was less than forty years of age, and came of a family of soldiers, one of whom had been the military member of the first regency. He had served in all the wars and most of the insurrections since 1822, and had always shown solid, though not especially brilliant qualities. He was a good manager of men, and a steady, pertinacious, and shrewd negotiator. His detractors accuse him of unscrupulous bribery, and it is certain that he was extraordinarily successful in sowing discord among his opponents. He obeyed the orders of his superiors, and was faithful to the emperor. Probably the limitations of his character were as important as his affirmative abilities in enabling him to grow into the great military consolidator of the distracted empire. His work in the first years of the forties was hardly inferior in importance to that of the emperor himself. The return to power of the conservatives in 1841 caused great dissatisfaction among the displaced liberals and the advocates of provincial autonomy. The conservatives seemed to have captured the young emperor, and the liberals began to insist on the application to Brazil of the English maxim, quote, the king reigns but does not govern, end quote. In 1842, a revolution broke out in Sorocaba, the home of Padre Feijo, in the state of Sao Paulo. The trouble was aggravated by the harsh measures taken by the conservative governor to suppress it, and soon spread to various points in the provinces and thence to Minas Gerais. The revolutionists announced that their objects were to free the emperor from the coercion of the conservative oligarchy, to maintain the autonomy of the provinces, and to preserve the constitution, whose guarantees were being rendered nugatory. Fighting only lasted two months, but there were fifteen important fights in Minas and five in Sao Paulo. The government forces under Cassias were completely victorious, and in the final and decisive battle of Santa Luisa, he overwhelmed and dispersed three thousand men and captured all the principal leaders. The emperor and Cassias adopted a magnanimous and conciliatory policy toward the defeated rebels, though the conservative ministers persisted in advocating harsh measures. Only Rio Grande do Sul remained under arms, and even there the rebels were not averse to accepting the emperor's authority. As soon as Cassius had finished the pacification of Minas, he was ordered south. The campaign began by his winning two important victories, and he followed them up by promises of amnesty, which detached some of the most formidable rebel chiefs. Finally, in the spring of 1845, Rio Grande returned to the Brazilian Union on the concession of a full and complete amnesty. That province has ever since enjoyed a larger measure of autonomy than any other part of Brazil. By the beginning of 1844, the disintegrating effects of a long continuance in power showed itself among the conservatives. The cabinet came to an issue with an emperor over a question of an appointment, and he called the liberals to power. The new government was ready to carry out the emperor's policy of full and free amnesty and pacification by concession. 
With the collapse of the revolution in Rio Grande, the central government seemed at length to have passed all danger. The demands for a juster interpretation of the Acto Adicional and for a larger measure of autonomy to the provinces and municipalities died out altogether, or took a peaceful form. The liberals in power turned out to be as conservative as the conservatives themselves, and the work of consolidation and centralization proceeded uninterruptedly. The liberal ministry was, however, in a false situation. The very name they bore was an implied promise to effect reforms. Their majority soon split up into warring factions. Congress spent the session of 1848 in quarrelsome debates. The fall of Louis Philippe had diffused a spirit of revolution in the air. The municipal elections were accompanied by riots, and the ministry itself deliberately encouraged a renewal of the anti-Portuguese agitation. The emperor thought himself obliged to intervene, and appointed a conservative cabinet. In Pernambuco, the new conservative governor displaced the liberal officials who had been holding office for the last three years. The latter were anti-Rio and anti-Portuguese, and they and their partisans started an insurrection known as that of the Praeiros. It quickly assumed a formidable character, and as many as 2,000 revolutionists took part in a single battle, but after three months of fighting they were completely defeated. Little difficulty was experienced in restoring public order. The movement had been rather a partisan uprising than a general popular revolution. This was the last attempt for more than 40 years to establish a federal system. The necessities of the stormy period from 1827 to 1848 had led, step by step, to a form of government which was centralized and yet not absolute. The imperial system had been the result of a natural growth. When the fabric reached stability, the professional ruling classes feared to disturb it, and the people were too inert and indifferent to afford support to agitators and reformers. Agriculture, commerce, and industry advanced only slowly during the first eight years of Pedro's rule. The country was getting ready for the activity which followed. Great Britain's efforts to induce the Brazilian government to carry out its treaty obligations for the suppression of the slave trade had been futile. In 1845, the British Parliament passed the Aberdeen Bill, which authorized British men-of-war to capture slaves even in territorial waters. This measure was especially directed at Brazil, whose coast had become practically the sole market for the horrible traffic. The bill did not immediately effect its purpose, and the slavers made the most of the opportunity. In 1848, over 60,000 Negroes were imported into Brazil. Immigration from Europe had practically ceased with the expulsion of Pedro I and the anti-foreign demonstrations of the Regency, but it now slowly began again. In 1843, Dom Pedro, being then not quite 18 years old, was married by proxy to Teresina Cristina, daughter of Francis, King of Naples. There is a tradition that the emperor turned his back when he saw his bride's face. Nevertheless, he made her a good husband. Their two boys died in infancy, but in 1846 Isabel was born, who still survives and lives in Paris with her husband, a grandson of Louis Philippe, and with her three sons, the eldest of whom is named for his grandfather and was 27 years old in 1902. End of section 40section forty one of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain part four brazil chapter eighteen events of eighteen forty nine to eighteen sixty four after the final pacification of the country prosperity came with a rush in the six years from eighteen forty nine to eighteen fifty six foreign commerce more than doubled the circulating medium was brought to a sound basis. Coffee had doubled in value by 1850, and its culture was rapidly extended. The profits of sugar raising had not risen in the same proportion, and Rio, São Paulo, and Minas drew slaves from the northern provinces. 
the decline of mining in the late years of the eighteenth century and the profitableness of sugar and tobacco during the great wars had made marañao pernambuco and bahia overshadow the south for a time but now the tide turned the other way brazil's drift has ever since been to the south the emperor and government followed an enlightened and vigorous progressive commercial policy the subjects of internal communication of colonization of better steamship facilities of the opening of public lands to settlement of public instruction of liberal treatment of foreigners and of administrative and financial reforms were taken up intelligently so far as the government was concerned the suspicion and jealous exclusive policy was abundant and large amounts of foreign capital began to be invested in commercial houses preparing the way for the great government loans and railroad building soon to come the british had the lion's share of the importing and the americans of the carrying trade the history of brazil for the next few decades contains examples of devotion of high-mindedness and of great capacities worthily employed of which any country might well be proud the higher officials as a rule left office poorer than they had entered it however in the lower ranks of the magistracy and the government departments there was much to be desired the public service became more and more the one career sought by young men of ability the mercantile and property-owning classes in general kept out of politics only the land-owning and slave-holding aristocracy owed a nominal allegiance to the two parties whose active members were the office-holders or those who hoped to become office-holders the most promising and prominent young men were selected from the graduates of the universities placed in the magistracy thence to be promoted to the chamber of deputies and to be governors of provinces the final goal was a nomination to the senate where from the dignified security of a life position the successful brazilian politician watched the struggles of those below him the bright young magistrates were preoccupied with their own ambitions and were not responsible for the people of the localities they happened to be governing for the moment real local interests were not studied those who reached the highest positions applied their well-trained minds to larger problems but their work was too much from above down they produced admirable reports and framed admirable laws but among the lazy magistracy and indifferent people the energy to put them into effect was too often wanting but the level of political well-being rose noticeably though fitfully the brazil of eighteen fifty had progressed far beyond the brazil of colonial times liberty of speech was unquestioned and unquestionable arbitrary imprisonment had died out the grosser forms of tyranny had vanished property rights and the administration of civil justice had much improved judges no longer openly received presents from litigants though the nation had not risen to the conception of a judiciary independent from the executive in eighteen fifty the emperor chose a new conservative cabinet which proved the most efficient the country had known its first great act was to abolish the slave trade the year eighteen fifty is also memorable as that in which the yellow fever began those terrible ravages on the brazilian coast which have never since entirely ceased the first epidemic is said to have been the worst which ever visited rio two hundred persons fell sick daily and the wealthier classes were especially attacked among the victims was the great statesman bernardo de vasconcelos and many deputies senators and diplomatic representatives congress adjourned in terror in the earlier epidemics the citizens of rio were just as susceptible as foreigners later however they acquired a relative immunity an immunity which is not shared by brazilians who have lived in non-infected districts brazil and argentina had agreed in eighteen twenty eight that uruguay should be an independent and neutral buffer state between them but the buenos aireans never forgot that for geographical and historical reasons uruguay naturally belonged to them rosas the argentine dictator assisted the oribe faction which openly advocated entering the confederation while the rio grande brazilians who owned much property on the uruguayan side of the border aided the rivera faction 
to protect the property interests of its citizens and prevent Rosas from conquering Uruguay, the Brazilian government quietly made military preparations and formed an alliance with the Rivera party and with Urquiza, the ruler of the province of Entre Rios, to which the dictator of Paraguay and the president of Bolivia gave a passive adhesion. It amounted to a coalition to forestall Rosas's plan of uniting the whole of the old viceroyalty and the Plate Valley under his rule. Brazil was virtually the instigator of a combination of the weaker Spanish-American states against the strongest one. Urquiza crossed the Uruguay, and with the aid of the Brazilian troops made short work of Oribe's army, which was besieging Rivera in Montevideo. Rosas responded with a declaration of war, and began collecting a formidable army. Urquiza resolved to carry the war to the gates of Buenos Aires. The Allies gathered in camp on the left bank of the Paraná, a hundred miles above Rosario. A great army which numbered 4,000 Brazilians, 18,000 Argentines, mostly from the half-Indian provinces of Entre Rios and Corrientes, and the contingent of Uruguayans. A Brazilian fleet under Admiral Grenfell had penetrated up the Paraná and protected their crossing of the Great River. On the 17th of December they got safely over the Paraná and out of the low country of Entre Rios onto the dry pampas of the right bank. Thence they marched down on Buenos Aires, where Rosas was awaiting them. On the 3rd of February, 1852, he gave them battle in the suburbs of that city. He was completely defeated and fled to England. Brazil found herself in a peculiarly advantageous position. The war had cost her little in money or men. Buenos Aires might no longer hope to dominate the other Argentine provinces and seemed likely to offer small resistance to the unified and centralized empire. Uruguay's independence of Buenos Aires and Brazil's preponderance in Montevideo were assured. The Rio Grandenses flocked over the border, bought large amounts of property, and enjoyed peculiar privileges, while the Uruguayan government accepted subsidies from that of Brazil. The country's commercial development continued even more rapidly after the war. In 1853, the Bank of Brazil was authorized to issue circulating notes, and the expansion of credit stimulated business. The same year, the Conservative Ministry, which had so brilliantly governed the nation since 1848, was forced to resign on account of the constant interference by the Emperor. It was replaced by the, quote, Conciliation Cabinet, end quote, whose chief, the Marquis of Paraná, adopted the policy of admitting liberals to administrative positions. He remained in power until 1858, and his name will always be associated with one of the most prosperous epochs in Brazilian history. The first railway systems were inaugurated. The receipts of the treasury grew 50%. European immigration amounted to 20,000 a year. Private wealth and luxury increased, and numerous theatres, balls and social reunions furnished an indication of the rise of the level of culture. One of Brazil's reasons for entering on the war against Rosas was to open up the navigation of the Paraguay, Paraná, and Uruguay, upon which she depended for access to a large part of her territory. The treaties made at the conclusion of the war assured, against her protest, free navigation to all nations. Brazil has intermittently attempted to confine the navigation of the international rivers of South America to the nations having territory on their banks. Paraná's conciliation policy seems to have suited the emperor very well, although it tended to hamper the development of two great parties in clearly defined opposition to each other. The elections came more and more under the control of the bureaucracy and were mere ratifications of the selections made by the ministers. Congress lost rather than gained in influence, and the whole system became steadily more centripetal. From 1849, the country had been having prosperous times, but in 1856 the inevitable commercial crisis came. Prosperity had brought about extravagances in governmental administration. The budgets showed deficits. Foreign loans were resorted to. The currency fluctuated violently. 
Brazil entered upon seven lean years, during which foreign trade remained stationary, the revenues increased only at the cost of heavy impositions, and the public debt grew. With the death of the Marquis of Paraná in 1858, the regular conservatives returned to power. He had been the dominant figure in politics since the Regency, and his personal prestige and the confidence the Emperor reposed in him had had much to do with holding the government together during the panic. But the new ministry could not make headway against the difficulties. A new currency law was necessary, but the mercantile and speculating classes bitterly opposed the rigid measures proposed by successive cabinets. Paraná's neutral policy had given the opposition a hold in some of the most important provinces, and the following elections showed a vast increase in the number of liberals and of dissident conservatives. Conservative cabinets succeeded each other rapidly from 1858 to 1862. The opposition to a contraction of the currency grew in force, and the dissidents and liberals finally obtained a majority. The emperor at last called upon the leaders of the dissident conservatives, Zacharias, to form a government. But he was as powerless as his predecessors, and, as a last resort, the emperor temporarily gave up the effort to govern after the English system and selected a cabinet outside of the Chamber of Deputies. The elections of 1863 resulted in a complete defeat of the conservatives but the victorious liberals did not need to pass any radical currency legislation hard times had disappeared by the operation of natural law the banknotes approached par and the budgets nearly balanced with eighteen sixty four the country entered upon a new era of prosperity the production of coffee had doubled from eighteen forty to eighteen fifty one and then had remained stationary but with the cessation of the civil war in the united states an era of high prices was inaugurated which coincided with brazil's financial rehabilitation and stimulated planting although real activity in the building of railroads did not begin until after the paraguayan war four short lines had been started before eighteen sixty two the years of peace and order had disaccustomed the people to the thought of violence and a steady advance had been made toward the government of by law. The highly educated statesmen, placed by the emperor at the head of affairs, understood the most important principles of good government and tried conscientiously to put them in practice. In transportation, banking, posts and telegraphs, commercial methods, etc., the improvements of modern civilization were easily introduced, though in agriculture, the indolence of proprietors and the apathetic ignorance of the slaves prevented any rapid advance on the whole brazil had made greater political and industrial progress when the paraguayan war broke out than any other south american country though grave vices remained to hamper her further development the mass of the people were apathetic and ignorant slavery tended to discredit industrious habits at best so difficult to maintain in the tropics the upper classes showed little interest in or aptitude for commercial matters commerce banking railroads mining and engineering prospered only when foreigners personally engaged in them the people themselves in spite of the enlightenment of the educated classes showed little initiative or energy End of section 41。section 42 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 19. The Paraguayan War. Brazilian statesmen might well have been pardoned if, in 1865, they had claimed for their country the hegemony of South America. The result of the war against Rosas had been brilliant. The Argentine had only just emerged from half a century of civil war. Uruguay was almost a Brazilian protectorate. Brazil's internal condition was settled. In concentration of power, as well as in wealth, population, and extent, she was at the head of the continent with the republics on the west she maintained good relations while all the time she was firmly pressing her territorial claims on toward the foot of the andes 
she even attempted to control the navigation of the great waterways of South America. In 1863, Flores, a defeated chief, returned from Buenos Aires and set up the standard of revolt in Uruguay. Penetrating as far as the Brazilian border, he received assistance, and Aguirre, the Montevidian president, protested. At the same time, the latter ruler refused to settle certain claims on behalf of Brazilian citizens, which the Rio government had been pressing. The emperor decided to intervene and help Flores, and thereupon sent a man of war up the Uruguay River, which blockaded a port and destroyed Uruguayan public property. Aguirre declared war, and Brazil and Flores, in alliance, besieged and took the principal towns in western Uruguay. The Argentine received satisfactory assurances and remained neutral. This high-handed adjustment of Uruguayan affairs furnished a pretext to the Paraguayan dictator, Francisco López, to intervene in his turn. Under a line of vigorous dictators who concentrated all the forces of the nation into their own hands, that country had become menacing to the loosely organized Argentine Republic. López even thought he was strong enough to bid defiance to Brazil. The tyrant was, in fact, an impossible neighbor for the two more progressive and civilized powers. For years he had been preparing for war, and at the moment was stronger in the military way than either of his bulky neighbors. He hated both Argentines and Brazilians, and his people had been taught to despise the courage of the latter. Though Brazil's intervention in Uruguay was a matter in which he had an interest, a dignified protest would have obtained ample assurances that the latter's independence would be respected, for there is no evidence that the imperial government intended to do anything more than to replace its enemy Aguirre with the friendly Flores. But the arrogant tyrant wanted to draw the world's attention to himself. He appreciated how difficult it would be for Brazil to send an army against him, and how much more difficult it would be to maintain one and he also knew that she was unprepared to take a serious war on foreign soil. Without any declaration of war, in the fall of 1864, he seized a Brazilian steamer, which was making its regular trip up the Paraguay River to Mato Grosso. The crew were imprisoned, and only the intervention of the American minister saved the lives of the Brazilian minister and his family. This outrage left Brazil no alternative. López followed up the seizure of the boat by an expedition up the Paraguay River against Mato Grosso, and easily conquered the principal southern settlements in that province. The geographical position of the Argentine made her attitude of decisive importance to both belligerents. Uruguay and the southern provinces of Brazil were separated from Paraguay by the Argentine provinces of Corrientes and the Misiones. Argentina had favored Flores's pretensions, and López was so obnoxious that the secret sympathies of Buenos Aires were with Brazil. Further than neutrality, Mitre, then president of Argentina, would not go. He declared that no permission would be given either belligerent to cross Argentine territory with troops. López was made desperately angry at this refusal. He thought he could count on the alliance and support of Urquiza, the virtually independent ruler of the province of Entre Rios and Mitre's enemy, and seems to have believed that he might as well finish up with both Argentina and Brazil at one sitting. In March 1865, he deliberately declared war on the Argentine, and 18,000 Paraguayan troops crossed the Paraná and began offensive operations against Corrientes, Uruguay, and Brazil. Instead of rising against Mitre, Urquiza declared himself against the Paraguayan dictator, and as his province of Entre Rios controlled access to Paraguay by water, López found that the only result of his rash act was to open up the way by which his enemies could most conveniently reach him. On the 1st of May, 1865, a formal alliance was made between Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. Mitre was agreed upon as commander-in-chief, the Allies promised not to lay down their arms until López should be overthrown and expelled from Paraguay, and pledges were given to respect Paraguay's independence. Of the three Allies, Brazil was the only one which could be expected to give its whole force. Flores could only answer for the Colorado faction of Uruguay. Argentina did not represent much more than Buenos Aires. Entre Rios was Urquiza's, 
and the other outside provinces had no great interest in the result. Nevertheless, the alliance was very advantageous to Brazil. It would have been well-nigh impossible to wage a successful war against an enemy shut up in the middle of the continent, and accessible only by a three-month's march across nearly impassable country, or by tedious navigation up a single river running through a third country, and where an army would have to be disembarked direct from ships on the enemy's soil. The adhesion of Argentina made an aggressive war possible, and the event proved how hopeless would have been a campaign by Brazil alone. The story of the military operations belongs to the history of Paraguay, and only those events which bore a direct relation to internal affairs in Brazil will be mentioned here. The successful naval battle of Riachuelo on the Paraná, just below the southern end of the Paraguayan territory, in June 1865, aroused great enthusiasm in Brazil. National feeling was hardly cooled by the news which soon followed of a Paraguayan invasion of Rio Grande, and rose again with the defeat of that invasion. Brazil's regular army numbered less than 15,000 men before the war, but at the Emperor's call 57 battalions of volunteers were organized in the fall of 1865. A loan of five million pounds was arranged in London, and no expense was spared in fitting out the army and in strengthening the fleet. By the end of the war, Brazil had 85 ships, not counting transports, of which 13 were ironclads. The voyage from Rio de Janeiro to Paraguay takes a month, and the transportation of men and material was tedious and extremely expensive. The government resorted to the issue of paper money and outraged the feelings of the financial world by compelling the Bank of Brazil to give up the reserve it was maintaining for the redemption of its note issue. The premium on gold rose and the currency fluctuated wildly, although general trade continued to boom. In September 1865, the Paraguayan army, which had invaded Rio Grande, was captured in a body, and peace was confidently expected. Lopez, however, decided to fight it out to the bitter end, and it was April 1866 before the Allies could gain a foothold on Paraguayan soil. For the next six months, Brazil was sickened with accounts of desperately bloody and indecisive battles, of which the last was an awful repulse before Curupaiti. For more than a year thereafter, the Allies lay motionless in their camps in the southwestern corner of Paraguay, while the cholera carried off thousands. Though his favorite general, Marshal Cassias, was a conservative, and not on good terms with the liberal cabinet, the emperor insisted that he be sent to take command. Reinforcements were vigorously recruited from all over the empire, and in July 1867, the cautious Cassias began a slow advance. The expenses were mounting up to sixty millions a year. The country chafed at the delays. Cassius quarrelled with the ministers. In July 1868, the emperor dismissed them on his own responsibility, and, though the liberals had still a large majority in the chamber, called in a conservative cabinet. On this occasion, the emperor's pressure was not influential enough to change a minority into a majority, and the chamber preferred dissolution to submission. Meanwhile, Cassius had at last begun to win victories. The very month of the fall of the Liberals, he took the great fortress of Umaita, which guarded the passage up the Paraguay, and Lopez retreated to the neighborhood of his capital, accompanied by almost all the surviving Paraguayans. In November, Cassius cleverly outflanked him, and taking him in the rear, compelled him to fight outside of his trenches until hardly any Paraguayans were left. By the beginning of 1869, Lopez was a fugitive, the Brazilians were in possession of Asuncion, and the war was over, except for pursuing Lopez and the few starving soldiers who followed him through the woods. Elections were held in March, but it was not worthwhile for the liberals to make even the show of a contest. The liberal leaders issued a manifesto declining to take any part, and censuring the emperor for calling the conservatives to power against the known wishes of the majority of a legally elected chamber, announced that they would respect the laws and would confine themselves to non-parliamentary propagation of the doctrines of anti-absolutism, liberalism, and emancipation. From this time dates the systematic propaganda for the republic. 
The war ended with the Emperor's son-in-law hunting down the Paraguayan bands. In March 1870, Lopez was caught with the last few hundred men who remained faithful and speared by a common soldier as he tried to escape through the woods. The war had cost Brazil $300 million and over 50,000 lives. She had gained no substantial result except assuring the safety of Mato Grosso and securing the free navigation of the Paraguay. The emperor did not attempt to use his victory by establishing a hegemony over South America. Rather did the end of the Paraguayan War mark the beginning of a policy of systematic abstention from intermeddling with outside matters. Paraguay and Uruguay were left in full enjoyment of their independence, and the Argentine then began her marvellous industrial progress and political consolidation. The plate republics reaped the benefits of the war, while Brazil bore its heaviest burdens. Most of the Argentine provinces had taken little part except to furnish provisions and horses at high prices, and the opening up of Paraguay redounded to the benefit of Buenos Aires and Montevideo, not to that of Rio. No spirit of imperialism spread among the Brazilian people, though they are still proud of the record their soldiers and sailors then made. Their bravery in field fighting and the assault of fortified places was proved beyond question, no matter how poorly they may have been commanded, and how deficient their organization. The history of no war contains more examples of heroic and hopeless charges, or stories of more desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting. But a successful battle was followed by torpor. Brazilian tenacity was shown in the patience with which defeats were sustained, and in holding on month after month in camp, rotting in the miasmatic swamps, rather than in pursuing advantages obtained in the field. End of section 42《セクション43 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 20. Republicanism and Emancipation. From 1808 to 1837, the tendency had been in the direction of democracy and decentralization. Then the tide turned, and from 1837 to the Paraguayan War, the central government grew stronger and federalism weaker. The power of the emperor reached its apogee in 1870. The senators had been personally selected by him, and he could count on their gratitude and friendship. Deputies were elected indirectly by electors chosen by a suffrage nominally universal, but the elections, primary and secondary, were mere farces, absolutely controlled by the ministry which happened to be in power. The local governors and magistrates, the officers of the National Guard and the police, all depended on the central government for their positions, formed a machine against which opposition was useless. If intimidation was not sufficient, the boldest frauds were shamelessly resorted to, false polling lists, manufactured returns, and the seating of contestants by the majority in the chamber or the returning boards. Of this system the emperor was the real beneficiary, for the cabinets held at his pleasure, and if the majority of a chamber did not sustain a ministry, which he desired to keep in power, all he had to do was to order a dissolution. But this hybrid system contained in itself the elements of sure decay. The emperor was no arbitrary despot, and neither wished nor would he have been able to govern in complete defiance of public opinion. On the other hand, the system afforded no sure method of ascertaining public opinion, nor of throwing a proper responsibility upon well-organized political parties. With the close of the Paraguayan War, a series of movements began, which ended twenty years later with the overthrow of the empire. Brazil's history during those twenty years is an account of the republican propaganda, the abolition movement, the attempt to reform the elections, the religious agitation, the growth of positivist doctrines, the demand for economic independence by the great provinces, and finally the infiltration of liberalism and insubordination into the army. This evolution, however, affected principally the educated classes. The masses of the people were, and still remain, largely indifferent to the march of public events. Commerce and industry continued to expand throughout the Paraguayan War. 
From 1864 to 1872 the annual revenues doubled, and though in 1868 the emission of paper money had reduced its value one half, it steadily rose thereafter until in 1873 it again reached par. Just after the war the budget balanced, and the production of coffee rose one half. But with relief from financial pressure, the conservative ministers became extravagant, and when the great world panic of 1873 came, both governments and country were badly caught. A foreign loan of five million sterling made in 1875 was not enough to meet the mounting deficits. In 1878, new issues of paper money were resorted to, and exchange dropped, remaining below par for ten years in spite of a subsequent doubling of coffee production and a great increase in the value of exports. Population, however, which had increased from five to ten millions from 1840 to 1870, in the next twenty years mounted to fifteen millions. The suppression of the slave trade by the Aberdeen Act and the Cairos Law made it probable that the institution itself would ultimately disappear. Brazilian character and customs had always stimulated voluntary emancipation, and in Brazil the Negro does not reproduce as rapidly as the white. In 1856 the slaves numbered two millions and a half, being nearly forty per cent of the population, but in 1873 their number had fallen to one million five hundred and eighty four thousand, or only sixteen per cent. The institution was, however, socially and politically very strong. Slaves furnished nearly all the labor employed in the production of staple exports, and it was believed that emancipation would be followed by agricultural collapse. But the emperor was too enlightened a Christian, and too susceptible to the good opinion of the civilized world, not to be at heart an abolitionist. However, it was only at the height of his influence that he deemed it wise to force the consideration of abolition on the reluctant nation. Agitation had begun modestly in 1864. In 1866, gradual emancipation was seriously proposed, but the breaking out of the war caused the matter to be adjourned. In 1869, Joachim Nabucco, father of the present Brazilian minister to Great Britain, succeeded in virtually committing the Liberal Party to emancipation. With the return of peace, the question was taken up vigorously. The reactionary conservative cabinet resigned rather than be an instrument of the emperor's wishes as to emancipation, and Pimenta Bueno was appointed prime minister for the especial purpose of getting a law through Congress declaring all children born thereafter free. This statesman failed, but Rio Branco, father of the present minister for foreign affairs, was more successful. After a bitter and prolonged parliamentary struggle, in which Rio Branco used every weapon that his position gave him in gaining and holding doubtful congressional votes, the law was passed in 1871. Thereafter, all children born of slave mothers were free, though they remained bound to service until 21. The proprietors were also required to register all their slaves. Under the influence of these measures, the number of slaves decreased with astonishing rapidity, falling from 1,584,000 in 1873 to 743,000 in 1887. Rio Branco's victory disrupted the Conservative Party, and after achieving it, he was unable to hold his majority together. The chamber was dissolved, and though the new one supported him half-heartedly, the old-line conservatives had become deeply dissatisfied with the radical tendencies of the governments and the emperor. Public men of all parties awoke to realization of the inconsistency between the constitution and the emperor's personal power. Not much was said in the chamber, but outside the republican propaganda assumed an active form, and the conviction fast crystallized that the empire could not last for many years. A republican press came into existence, and a Republican Party was organized under the leadership of Saldania Marino, an able lawyer of Rio. Republican societies were formed in all the centers of population, but there was no thought of armed revolution. There is indeed no evidence that the Emperor ever opposed the Republican propaganda, though occasionally he detached some of its abled members by promotions to office. 
In 1873, 1874, and 1875, the question which most absorbed public attention was the imprisonment of the bishops of Pará and Pernambuco by the civil authorities. The lower ranks of the priesthood were uneducated, and real interest in religion had largely been confined to women and the lower classes. With the growth of liberal ideas among the laity, the church awoke to the necessity of a reformation. These two bishops were leaders in this counter-movement, and they selected the Masonic lodges as a point of attack. In spite of the nominal prohibition of the church, Freemasonry had been permitted in Brazil since 1821, and the lodges had become mere social clubs and philanthropic societies. Freemasons were members of those semi-religious brotherhoods which take charge of local church feasts and constitute the most important link between the lay and spiritual worlds in Brazilian communities. The two militant bishops ordered that the brotherhoods should expel their Masonic members or suffer the penalty of losing their rights to use the church edifices. Where these orders were not obeyed, interdicts were laid. The progressive elements and the magistracy took the side of the Masons, but the bishops were not without their supporters. The government insisted that the obnoxious interdicts be withdrawn. The bishops refused to yield and were prosecuted in the civil courts and sent to prison. The Princess Isabel was believed to be on the priest's side, and while the excitement gradually died out and things went on as before, a wider breach than ever had been created between the progressive and conservative classes. Like the slave owners, devout Catholics now felt that they could no longer depend on the imperial system to protect them against the rising tide of radicalism. The financial difficulties growing out of the Great Panic drove Rio Branco from power in 1875, and a succession of conservative cabinets struggled along until 1878. The question of electoral reform came to the front, for everyone was sick of the absurd system in vogue, and the leaders of both the historic parties hoped for great things from a radical change. The emperor was opposed to giving up the indirect method of voting, but was anxious to try some lesser reforms. On his return from the United States and Europe in 1877, he virtually instructed the cabinet to put through a bill, drawn after his suggestions, but the prime minister resigned because the emperor insisted that the change could not be made by an ordinary statute, but must go through the tedious process of an amendment to the constitution. The emperor called in a liberal cabinet, and a new chamber was elected. The liberal ministry continued in power until 1880, and then fell, partly because it had lost its hold with the liberal majority, and partly because of the riots in Rio over the streetcar tax. A law had been passed compelling each passenger to pay a cent in addition to the regular fare. The people refused, burned the cars, cut the harness in pieces, threw the conductors off, and fought the police until the business of the city was brought to a standstill. The emperor called upon a cool and experienced politician, José Antonio Saraiva, but the latter refused to take office until he should be allowed to push through the election bill in the form of an ordinary law. Right here the emperor suffered a great defeat. He thought himself obliged to yield, and the vigorous minister at once secured the passage of a radical law which completely transformed the electoral system. Suffrage was confined to the educated and property-holding classes, but the electors voted directly for deputies, and the country was divided into districts, each of which chose a single deputy. The electoral body was now permanent, and each deputy was responsible to a definite constituency. Saraiva resigned the moment his bill was enacted into law, and every precaution was taken to ensure that the election of 1881 should be free from any suspicion of official pressure. The result was a revelation to a small bore politicians of the old regime. 150,000 voters registered out of an adult male population of about 3 millions, and 96,000 voted. The new members were divided nearly equally between the two historical parties, the Liberals getting 68 and the Conservatives 54. The ministers were defeated for re-election, and many of the contests were decided by small majorities. In subsequent elections the Saraiva law proved not to be so effective, 
and since it is not in the latin nature to be satisfied with gradual improvement the liberal movement of which the electoral law was a symptom swept on with increasing violence until the beneficent law was uprooted along with the mistaken system on which it had been painfully grafted as soon as electoral reform was out of the way abolition became once more the dominant question in brazilian politics though the majority of liberals were abolitionists and the doctrine was one of the official principles of the party the various liberal cabinets which succeeded each other from eighteen eighty one to eighteen eighty four managed to dodge the dangerous issue finally the dantas ministry faced it squarely a bill was introduced prohibiting the sale of slaves establishing an emancipation fund and freeing slaves as fast as they reached the age of sixty a terrific parliamentary battle followed and the project was defeated by only seven votes forty-eight liberals and four conservatives voting for it and seventeen liberals and forty-two conservatives against the emperor dissolved the chamber and the excitement over abolition became national the abolitionists subsidized newspapers held public meetings and marched through the streets in processions carrying pictures representing the torturing of slaves no means were spared which might aid to rouse the national conscience the negroes were advised to revolt and assistance was openly promised to them the elections of eighteen eighty four were violently contested instead of being free from fraud and protest like those of eighteen eighty one nor did the government so conscientiously abstain from interference nevertheless the chamber elected did not differ materially in its composition from that which had preceded it sixty-five of the one hundred and twenty members of the new house were liberals but of these fifteen were opposed to abolition for the first time avowed republican members were elected three being returned and two of them came from sao paulo prudente morais and campus salis the first two brazilians to hold office avowedly as republicans who reaped their reward by becoming two decades later the first two civil presidents of the republic no election was ever held in brazil which was so earnestly contested and which constituted so genuine an expression of the wishes of the people nevertheless on the main question that of abolition the result was apparently a drawn battle with the meeting of the chamber in eighteen eighty five the agitation broke out afresh the crowds on the rio streets hissed anti-emancipation deputies and there was a bitter fight for the control of the organization of the chamber it was soon evident that the dantas ministry could not force abolition through and it resigned saraiva was called in and he skilfully arranged a compromise with the aid of conservative votes he passed a bill for gradual and compensated emancipation this done he resigned the liberal party was disorganized and dissatisfied with him and he did not deem it worth his while to try and hold it together the quarrelling liberal majority was aghast when it was announced that a conservative cabinet would take the reins of the government the emperor had begun to show decided symptoms of a failure of his mental powers and was ceasing to be a controlling factor in parliamentary affairs saraiva's resignation further exacerbated the liberal leaders against the imperial system and at the same time continued to lose ground with the slaveholders in the election the liberals had no chance and largely refrained from voting the governing classes shrank from the probable consequences of abolition the temper of the country seemed to have cooled the election reform of eighteen eighty one had not proven in practice to be of much value though not so absolute as before the provincial governors resumed their control of the result and returns were made according to the wishes of the ministry in power one hundred and three conservatives received certificates and only twenty-two liberals and most of the latter came from the interior where official pressure could least easily be applied not a republican was returned and the declared abolitionists had almost disappeared although every one knew that the final blow to slavery could not long be deferred the new administration devoted itself to the finances since eighteen seventy one the deficits had been continuous one sarcastic statesman said amid applause that quote, the empire is the deficit. End quote. 
The issue of paper money had been excessive. Better times began in 1886. A loan of six millions sterling was contracted for on favourable terms. From 40% below par, the currency rose to par in the succeeding three years. Imports and exports increased by leaps and bounds, and the revenue grew 75% in a single year. The production of coffee in São Paulo and of rubber in Pará and Amazonas reached unprecedented figures. Foreign immigration was subsidized, and a systematic propaganda to secure it undertaken. From 30,000 it ran up to 100,000 a year, and the apprehensions that emancipation would cause a dearth of labor were largely quieted. Government subsidies had kept up the building of railroads during the years when the treasury was most embarrassed, and naturally went on more rapidly when prosperity came. When the Paraguayan War ended, there were only 450 miles of railroad in the country. In the decade that followed, 1,450 were built, while from 180 to 189, 500 miles a year were constructed. The conservative prime minister, Baran Kotejipi, struggled hard through 1886 and 1887 to save the remnants of slavery, but intelligent and unprejudiced opinion was nearly unanimous for the entire abolition of the disgraceful and barbarous institution. Project after project was presented, each one more radical than the last. The slaves began to flee from the plantations. The army refused to aid the police in capturing them. The poor old emperor had gone abroad, sick and failing, leaving Isabel as regent. Her advisers, mostly priests and foreigners, told her that the delay was endangering the dynasty. Kotejipi resigned and John Alfredo was made Prime Minister for the especial purpose of passing an emancipation law. When Congress met in May 1888, the speech from the throne announced that the imperial program was absolute, immediate, and uncompensated emancipation. The prestige of the crown was sufficient to hush nearly all opposition. Within eight days, the law had passed both houses and been signed by the princess, the votes against it were hardly numerous enough to be worth counting. Only Kotejipi and a few devoted monarchists stood in their places and read aloud the handwriting on the wall, prophesizing the sure and speedy overthrow of a monarchy which had thus cast off its surest and most natural supporters. End of section 43《Section 44 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Part 4. Brazil. Chapter 21. The Revolution, the Dictatorship, the Establishment of the Republic. Every intelligent man in Brazil had long recognized the force of the permanently working causes which were undermining the empire. Afonso Celso, in 1902 considered the ablest advocate of restoration, and the son of the last prime minister of the empire, said in 1886, from his place as national deputy, that the empire maintained itself only through the tolerance of its enemies. Neither one of the two great parties of officeholders was really monarchical, although the members of both cooperated with the emperor for the sake of the patronage. But the Brazilian masses were too apathetic to take any violent measures for the overthrow of the worn-out institution without some definite stimulus. This was furnished by the quote-unquote military question in 1889. The teachings of Benjamin Constant, a professor of the military school at Rio, had thoroughly impregnated the younger officers of the army with republican doctrine. The officers were extremely sensitive about their professional rights, and a spirit of disaffection and insubordination was rife among them. In 1886 there was great indignation in the army, because an officer who had engaged in an undignified newspaper controversy with a deputy was reprimanded by the Secretary of War. A little later another officer insisted on attacking through the press a pension law advocated by the War Department, and his cause was taken up by the highest generals with the Marshal Deodoro de Fonseca at their head. This general was transferred from his post to a less desirable one, and a new outburst of indignation among the officers agitated army circles. The ministry thought it best not to push the matter. 
In 1888 the bad feeling was further exacerbated by the police arresting some officers for disorderly conduct in the streets. Again the army demanded satisfaction, and again it was given. The favorite champion of military dignity, Deodoro, was sent off to Matu Grosso in the spring of 1889, and this was taken as equivalent to a punishment for his activity in maintaining the privileges of his profession. Again the government thought it prudent to yield, and he was allowed to return. In the meantime, the emperor's health had grown more feeble, and the princess Isabel was in power. Herself unpopular, her parsimonious husband, the Comte Deu, was bitterly disliked by most Brazilians. The rumor gained credence that there was a plan to have the sick emperor resign in her favor, though the general feeling was that, so long as the old man lived and reigned he ought not to be disturbed, the hot-headed republican officers were in no humor to allow the princess to succeed to the throne. The conservative cabinet had been met with a flat refusal from the army when they ordered it to assist in capturing fugitive slaves. The government's hand was thus forced on the slavery question. John Alfredo's cabinet succeeded to Cotagipis, but was no happier in its dealings with the military question. The princess determined to call in the liberals, and their hard-headed leader, Urupretu, was made prime minister. By many this was believed to be a part of the plot for an abdication, that the princess's friends wanted a strong man at the head of affairs when the coup d'etat came. Urupretu took charge of the government in June 1889, and shortly dissolved the chamber after some bitter debates, in which, for the first time in Brazil, the cry of, quote-unquote, Viva a República, was heard on the floor of Parliament. The new ministry had no trouble in controlling the elections, and the new chamber that met in August was liberal. Urupretu felt strong enough to undertake to reduce the malcontents to submission. He began by strengthening the police force and the National Guard, and removing certain regiments from the capital. But in September, Deodoro returned from the remote wilds of Matu Grosso and was received with great demonstrations by his comrades. Secret meetings of officers were held, and they pledged themselves to sustain at all hazards the prestige of the military class. Professor Constant, whose influence with the younger officers was predominant, openly threatened the ministry. Early in November, still another battalion was ordered off from the capital to the north of Brazil, and this was the immediate occasion for the formation of a military conspiracy in which Professor Constant and Diodoro were the original chiefs. They determined to make an alliance with the Republicans, and invited the cooperation of Quintino Bocayuva, the chief of the militant Republicans, of Aristides Lobo, a Republican editor of Rio, of Glicerio, one of the Republican chiefs in São Paulo, of Rui Barbosa, a great lawyer and editor, whose attacks on the government had been very effective, though he had not yet declared himself a Republican, and of Admiral Van den Kolk, who was expected to secure the help of the navy. Deodoro and Constant could absolutely count upon one brigade, the second, and were well assured of the sympathy of all the regular forces in Rio. Of course the plan could not be kept secret from the government police, though the public seems to have known nothing of the gravity of what was going on. On the 14th of November the rumor spread that Deodoro and Constant would be arrested. Orders had, in fact, been given for the transfer of the disaffected brigade, and the ministers were warned that it was preparing to resist. That night the members of the cabinet did not sleep, and the morning found them still in anxious council at the War Department, which faces the great square of Rio. Constant had ridden out to the quarters of the second brigade, and early in the morning led it to the square, and drew up in front of the War Department. Deodoro took command of the insurgent troops, sending an officer to demand the surrender of the ministers. Urupretu called upon the adjutant general, Floriano Peixoto, to lead against the revolters the troops which were in the general barracks. Floriano, after a little hesitation, refused, and it is doubtful whether the troops would have followed him had he consented. There was no one to raise a hand for the ministers. They surrendered and sent their resignation by telegraph to the emperor at Petropolis, twenty-five miles away in the mountains. Their impression seems to have been that the insurrection was simply a military mutiny, and that its object was solely to secure their own downfall. 
but the fact that constant bocayuva and others had been led into the insight enabled these republicans to direct the movement so that a permanent change in the form of government was possible the troops in the barracks joined the second brigade and all together marched through the centre of the city cheering for the army for deodoro and the republic amid the astonishment of the people most of whom knew nothing of any trouble until they saw the parade no resistance was offered and when the emperor reached the city at three o'clock in the afternoon the revolution was an accomplished fact the chiefs of the revolt had met and organized a provisional government naming themselves ministers they at once took possession of their different departments and the public buildings a decree was issued announcing that henceforth brazil was to be a federal republic the feeble old emperor was visited by a few friends but there was no one to raise a hand or strike a blow for him or the dynasty he himself would have shrunk from being the occasion for the shedding of the blood of any of his people when night fell the provisional government formally announced to the emperor his deposition and that he and his family would be compelled to leave the country though their lives would be guaranteed and ample pecuniary provisions be made for them the palace was guarded and no one allowed to enter though there were no indications of any counter-revolution the municipal council of the city promptly gave its adherence to the new order of things and telegrams were coming in hourly from the provinces to the effect that the latter were universally satisfied and that republican sympathizers were taking possession of the local governments without opposition during the night of the sixteenth the emperor and his family were placed on board ship and sent off to lisbon the new government was in fact a centralized military dictatorship but the names of most of its members were guarantees that the promises of the establishment of a republic would be carried out in all the provinces the new situation was accepted peacefully the rio government named new governors by telegraph and the imperial authorities turned things over to them without resistance persons known to have been advocates of republican principles were preferred and a rapid displacement of the old governing classes ensued the provincial government continued in power for fourteen months and in that time promulgated a series of laws touching almost every subject of social or political interest the provinces were organized into states after the model of the members of the north american union universal suffrage was established church and state were entirely separated a new and humane criminal code was adopted the judicial system was reorganized after the american fashion and in general monarchical characteristics were removed from the statutes and the most modern reforms enacted a project for the constitution was carefully framed and this was submitted to a congress which had been summoned to meet early in eighteen ninety one this congress was composed of two hundred and five deputies elected by states and not by the districts and of three senators from each state acting as a constituent assembly it adopted with few modifications the constitution proposed the members of the constituent congress had been almost universally selected from among those who had been prominent in connection with the new government or had given it the enthusiastic adhesion with few exceptions the new constitution is a copy of that of the united states the only important difference is that in brazil the enactment of the general and criminal law is a federal and not a state attribute the revenues of the newly created states were made much larger than those of the imperial provinces principally by transferring to them the duties on exports though the constitution of february twenty fourth eighteen ninety one nominally went into effect at once as a matter of fact the government continued military deodoro was elected president and marshal floriano peixoto vice-president and the dictatorship was effective except so far as it was managed and controlled by a few leaders who had power in the army navy or financial world the provisional government had conceded to banks in every important centre of the country the right to issue circulating notes the markets were flooded with money credit was easy an extraordinary speculative boom set in values rose tremendously the last years of the empire had been prosperous and exchange had gone to par within three years after the empire was overthrown the amount of paper money in circulation was more than tripled 
but though exchange had fallen tremendously, no ill effects were yet apparent. The nation was drunk with suddenly acquired wealth. Companies of all sorts were granted government concessions. Railroad companies, mining companies, harbour improvement companies, banks, factories, and even sugar and coffee plantations companies. The price of coffee and rubber was rising in gold, while the cost of production was falling with the depreciation of the currency. The flood of Italian immigration, which had been going to the Argentine, was largely diverted to Brazil. Rio, Pará, and São Paulo were the centres of the prosperity. Businessmen from the provinces swarmed into these cities, and the fortunate owners of plantations emigrated to Paris to spend their easy acquired wealth. During 1891 and 1892, Deodoro became involved in disputes with Republican leaders. To these political difficulties were added quarrels over the government concessions, which were expected to make everyone rich. Deodoro offended the moneyed powers by not granting such concessions as freely as was desired by many influential persons. Finally, Deodoro found that he could no longer count on a majority in Congress, so he arbitrarily dissolved it. But revolutions broke out in the different states against the governors who stood by the dictator, and he also found that he could not rely upon the unquestioning support of the army. The navy was decidedly disaffected. After some hesitation, he yielded to the signed demand of a powerful junta and resigned in favor of the vice-president, whom the speculators and promoters thought they could easily control. They were grievously disappointed in Floriano. The radical republicans found him more to their liking than did the wealthier classes and the bureaucrats. The navy had always been recruited among the aristocrats and looked down upon the army, and soon developed a dislike for the plebeian and illiterate president. An effort was made to pass and put into effect a law expelling Floriano from office before the expiration of the four years' term for which Deodoro and he had been elected but he flatly announced that he would serve out the term to which he believed himself constitutionally entitled. In the meantime, a rebellion had broke out in Rio Grande do Sul against Juliano de Castillos, the radical Republican governor. Gaspar Silveira Martins, the local leader of the old Liberal Party, had been banished, but from Montevideo he organized the insurrection. The adherents of the two historical imperial parties and the gauchos of the southern part of the state joined the movement enthusiastically. Presently the pampas were swept from one end to the other by bands of federalists under dreaded leaders like Gomercindo Saraiva, a ranchman from near the Uruguayan border. The republicans stood firm, and Pineiro Machado and other gaucho chiefs showed that they too possessed the fighting qualities which have always distinguished the hard-riding, meat-eating Rio Grandenses. With the aid of federal troops, the republicans had decidedly the upper hand, but the federalists kept the field for three years, while the country was hurried and the most frightful destruction of life and property took place. Meanwhile, the intriguers against Floriano at Rio took advantage of this formidable complication. The mercantile classes, the conservatives, the moderate republicans, and those who regretted the empire were opposed to him. The navy was ready to revolt at any time. A number of powerful men had bluffed Deodoro into resigning, and they thought that they could easily do the same with Floriano. A majority in Congress was against him, and he seemed to be almost isolated but he had no thought of yielding or withdrawing. His subsequent actions show that he certainly was not actuated by any vaulting personal ambition. His was rather the instinct of a soldier who stands where he is and fights to the last without reasoning why. The real crisis in the establishment of the Republic had in fact arrived. Floriano's overthrow would have meant anarchy and disintegration, government by pronunciamento, short-lived administrations established and overthrown by military force early in september eighteen ninety three the entire navy under the lead of admiral mayo revolted the guns of the fleet commanded the harbour and seemed to make the city untenable floriano acted with great energy the army stood by him and he recruited vigorously the fleet would not seriously bombard the city full of sympathizers with the revolt, and Floriano held the fortifications around the bay so that it was difficult for Mayo to obtain supplies. 
Though the European naval forces, which quickly assembled, sympathised with the insurgents, they could hardly give any efficient help so long as Floriano held the capital. Mayo hesitated about attempting to establish a blockade. At first the insurgents disclaimed any intention of re-establishing the empire, but soon the revolt began to take on a frankly monarchical character. The friends of the old regime, however, nowhere showed the same energy and conviction as the republicans who stood by Floriano. In Rio Harbor, matters came to a stand. Neither side could deal a decisive blow to the other, but in the end Floriano and the land forces were sure to win, because without a base of supplies the fleet could not maintain itself indefinitely. It was necessary for Mayo to start a fire in the rear and to open communication with the Rio Grande Federalists. He escaped through the harbour entrance with one of his ironclads and went to Santa Catarina, where he established the seat of the revolutionary government. Gumercindo Saraiva, the able Federalist chief, eluded the superior Republican forces in the north of Rio Grande and attempted an invasion of Santa Catarina, Paraná, and São Paulo, where it was hoped that the monarchical plantation owners would rise. But he was vigorously pursued, and his forces defeated and scattered. The failure of this daring expedition was the death knell of the revolt. Mayo returned to Rio, and there his position fast became untenable. The final crisis came with the refusal of the American admiral to permit him to establish commercial blockade. This took away his last hope of being able to coerce Floriano to terms. The naval revolt collapsed in March, 1894. Some of the ironclads escaped from Rio Harbor and fled to Santa Catarina, where they were captured by the Republicans. The Rio Grande Federalists kept up a partisan warfare for a few months longer, but by 1895 they were completely stamped out. Floriano was supreme, but instead of establishing a permanent military dictatorship, he declined to be a candidate for re-election, and selected Prudente Morais as his successor for the term beginning in 1894. Prudente had been one of the two Republican deputies elected from São Paulo in 1886, and had acted as president of the Constitutional Assembly, which framed the new constitution. Moderate and conservative in his opinions and methods, his selection was a recognition of the advisability of civil government and an abandonment of the system of military dictatorship. With his assumption of office, the Republic may be said to have been at last definitely established. The state governments were now functioning regularly, and their governors soon began to assume a great importance in the political system. These executives are selected by local cliques instead of by central government, as in the imperial times. Their command of the police and state patronage enables them to control elections, name their own successors, and exercise a predominant influence in the choice of deputies and senators to the National Congress. They are the chief instruments through which the president's control of politics is exercised. The majority in Congress, composed of the leaders of the Republican movements and known as the Federal Republican Party, supported Prudente in the early part of his administration, but he was too liberal to suit the radicals in throwing into participation in public affairs capable Brazilians of other antecedents. This policy and the jealousies that always arise in a dominant party brought about a rupture between them and the leader of the House majority. In the trial of strength which followed, the Federal Republican Party was split, and though the President was victorious by a small margin, his position became very precarious. The Republic had started out on a scale of unprecedented extravagance. The old provincial governments had been given only the fragments from the imperial table, but the Republican Constitution multiplied the revenues of the new states manifold. The issues of paper money, the high prices of coffee and rubber, and the speculative boom gave both state and federal government, for a while, plenty of money to spend. The Union and the states vied with each other in multiplying employees, in making loans, in spending money on public edifices, and in building and guaranteeing railroads. The larger the deficits grew, the more paper money was issued, and exchange fell with sickening rapidity. A larger and larger proportion of the paper revenue had to be devoted to the purchase of gold bills for the payment of the interest on the foreign debt. The deficits increased in geometrical progression. 
By 1895 signs of the coming trouble were apparent, though the business of the country was still prosperous. In 1896 came an outbreak of religious fanaticism in the interior of Bahia, which grew into an armed revolt, small, it is true, but which cost much money to suppress. The necessity for retrenchment was evident, railroad building was interrupted, schemes to rehabilitate the currency were brought forward and discussed. The governments of the poorer states looked for help to the impoverished federal treasury, and some of the stronger states showed impatience at being hampered by an unprofitable connection with their weak sisters. The president was not on sympathetic terms with the victorious radicals in Rio Grande, and the uncompromising republicans all over the Union felt that they were not sufficiently favored. In the fall of 1897, an attempt was made in broad daylight to assassinate Prudente, and prominent opposition politicians were strongly suspected of complicity in the plot. A state of siege was declared, but the country remained quiet, and no serious opposition was apparent when Prudente announced that his support would be given to Campus Salis as his successor in office and presumably the continuer of his policies. A great drop in the prices of coffee began, and the financial situation of the government grew worse and worse. Brazil grows about two-thirds of the world's coffee, and her crop was enormously increasing. Consequently, the production of coffee was outrunning the world's consuming capacity. The enormous profits of preceding years, and the abundant supply of good Italian labor, had stimulated planting beyond all reason. New and fertile districts were opened up in the interior of São Paulo, with which the older plantations of Rio and the coast regions could not compete. The poorer districts were reduced to poverty, while even the more fertile could not hold their own. In government finances, the lowest point was reached in 1898. The paper money had fallen to 79% below par, and it had become clearly impossible to continue payments on the foreign debt. The last act of Prudence's administration was to make an agreement by which the foreign creditors consented to waive the receipt of their interest for three years, and the government pledged itself to reduce the volume of paper currency and to accumulate a fund for the resumption of interest payments. No contest was made against Campus Say's election in the spring of 1898. He took office finding an empty treasury, a government without financial credit, and the country in the midst of a severe commercial crisis. He showed great shrewdness in maintaining an ascendancy over the politicians and controlling a majority in both branches of Congress, and through his ministers of finance relentlessly followed the policy of contracting the currency and increasing taxes. In 1901 the payment of interest on the foreign debt was resumed, and though that debt had been increased fifty million dollars, the currency had doubled in value and become relatively stable. The state governments are more dependent on the Union than in the days of their wealth. There is little present danger of disintegration. No real sentiment for the re-establishment of the empire exists. The same habits of political subordination, which have kept Brazil together so long, are increasing rather than diminishing in force. The commercial crisis and the high taxes have created great discontent among merchants. Coffee planters and rubber gatherers have still further suffered by the rise of the currency. Immigration has practically ceased, and there is little water left in speculative enterprises. The great bank of the Republic failed in 1900, dragging down many industrial concerns and ruining thousands of small investors, and the government's connection with the bank caused much scandal. Other banks, which had too much extended their agricultural and industrial credits, have also failed, and there is great want of confidence among investors. However, capital is slowly accumulating, and a healthful tendency towards industrious habits and the employment of reasonable and moderate methods in exploiting the great untouched natural resources of the country is evident. Rodriguez Alves, the third civil president of the Republic, was peaceably elected in the spring of 1902, and took his seat on the November the 15th, the 13th anniversary of the Republic. Like both his predecessors, he is from São Paulo, and was virtually named by his immediate predecessor. His policy is expected to be the same as Campos says, that is, to keep expenses within revenue, 
and to maintain the political status quo. Leaving out immigration, the Brazilian people have shown a steady natural increase of nearly 2% per annum during this century. The total population has multiplied from less than 3 to more than 18 millions. Not a fiftieth part of the territory is cultivated. Its resources have never been studied, much less developed. The positive checks hardly exist. The preventive checks are yet indefinitely remote. Modern altruism makes wars of extermination unthinkable. The colonial experiences of the last century have demonstrated that races possessing a reasonably efficient industrial organization do not tend to disappear, even though nations whose physical force is greater may reduce them to political subordination. The Brazilians have the additional advantage of inheriting directly a European civilization. They are too firmly established, too numerous and prolific and possess a too highly organized and deeply rooted civilization to be in danger of expulsion or political absorption. Immense immigration into South America is inevitable as soon as the pressure of population is strongly felt in Western Europe and North America. This may transform Brazil economically, but the new conditions will have to fit themselves into the political and social framework already in existence. End of section 44 End of The South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson.